Okay. Yeah. How's mine look? Is it looking okay? Yeah, almost. Okay. A little bit? A little bit more? Okay. That's oh, hey. Uh, <laughs> hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the uh, Microsoft Virtual Academy. And behind this Behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. And this jump start is going to be about scripting and tool making. And actually, we, we call it advanced tools and scripting. And we'll talk more about what this jump start is going to be. My name is Jason Helmick, and to my left, the inventor of PowerShell, most of you already know, the distinguished engineer Jeffrey Snover. Jeffrey, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great, thanks. Oh, Having awesome. We had such a great feedback from the first one yeah. of this that we did. Now, the first one we did... Almost universally great. Uh, almost universally great? Yeah, highest numbers, highest attendance. Right. Um, what were the other things? It, it was the highest attendance... Um, there was a whole bunch of, th of records that we but broke with Rick that. Rick Kloss beat us on two points on satisfaction. So there was some unsatisfied people out there that so, hopefully they have not dialed in today. When, when we get to the end, we need, we need, we need to beat Rick Claus by two points. Two. So, yeah. Well, he beat us by two, he so beat we us beat him by, by four. If we beat him by four, then we own it. So yeah. do us a favor. And, and, and Rick's make a sure friend. You... He'll, he'll appreciate it. Yeah, I don't care if he appreciates it or not. Anyways. <laughs> Guys, if you joined us for the first one, we were using PowerShell interactively. We were using it to get real work done and taking you through how PowerShell in the console works, how to use Get Help, and how to figure out how the pipeline works. In this one, and we'll get into some more details here, this one we're going to shift a little bit. Instead of spending our time in the console doing things in real time, we're going to move to scripting. Ooh, ah. And we're going to show you how to start getting started. Make start me getting started. When you say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, using uh, scripting. And we're going to show you some of the scripting language, how to put the scripting language together. But most importantly, what we're going to be doing today is showing you how to take solutions that you're making with PowerShell and turn them into actual tools. Yeah. Um, and to build tools and make like a toolbox and so that they can share them with other people and things like that. Um, before we get started, let's get started with some introductions. First of all, Jeffrey, um, let me bring up the slide here. Why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? So I'm Jeffrey Snover, a distinguished engineer, and um, there you go. So now I'm also <laughs> the... <laughs> there you go. Says it all. No, I'm, a, I'm the uh, lead architect for Windows Server 2000. Or, well, I was the, I was the window, lead architect for Windows Server 2012. I'm now the lead architect for Windows Server and for the System Center Data Center products because we kind of have a unified organization now. We're all very excited about that, by the way. Yeah, have you seen the recent blog posts? We've been rolling out the blogs about Windows Server 2012 R2, and uh, they're really good, really clear about, hey, here's what we delivered in 2012, here's what you told us, and here's how we responded in terms of uh, the next set of features. So uh, really exciting stuff. Yeah, very excited about it. And uh, let me go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, I'm Jason Helmick. Uh, the Jason Helmick. The, the Jason Helmick, if you notice the Twitter. Uh, <laughs> there's a long story behind that. No, we're not going to go there. Uh, I'm a senior technologist for Concentrated Technology, and um, I'm just a PowerShell aficionado. I just love PowerShell. So that's all you need to know about me. So here's what we're going to be doing. First of all, if you want to play along and follow along today with Ooh. us, you might want to grab hold of the scripts. Now, I've put together a package of scripts that there's the URL, and you're probably going, oh, crap, man, did you really expect us to type in that URL? No. Hang on. Just watch. Oh. Oops. Wait a minute. Hang on. Hang on. Let me get my... Need some help there? I think I did. <laughs> I'm going to take you out to... And you're going to be learning from this guy all day. How, what do you think about that? Oh, here we go. Oh, wow. That just went so wrong in so many ways. I don't even know what happened there. <clears throat> it's Bing all over the place. Let me just see if I can get one of these up. Guys, the slides are right here. They're, go out to PowerShell.org, www.PowerShell.org, and I put them into a blog post. It's a couple of posts down because I put them up a couple of days ago. So, and it's that thing. Don Jones. You just it's can't that, shut that guy you up. Can't shut, you can't <laughs> shut Don Jones up. Uh, <laughs> Scroll past it all. So right down here is you'll see Jumpstart 2. And if you click in there, I have a download for the script so that you guys can follow along with us. And you have the scripts too. Um, I'm going to try to minimize my hand typing today because we've got a lot of scripting that we want to take a look at. So go ahead and grab those when you get a chance. And we'll be using those today. Okay. Let me... See if I can bring my slide deck back up. For some reason, things are moving a little bit slow, but we'll figure this out. Come on. You can do it. You're a big computer now. <laughs> <laughs> 
Swear to God, I'll get a slide here. So <laughs> here's what we're going to do today. <laughs> um, if you take a look at our, uh, at, uh, at our agenda, what we're going to do is we're going to get you started with scripting. Now, there's going to be some review. If you were with us in the, the uh, first jump start, one of the things uh, we uh, towards the end is we got you kind of started on the direction that we were using for this one. So this might be a little bit of review for some of yep. you, but I know we've got a lot of new people that have joined. A lot of new people. Yeah, lots. Have joined us today. So this will be cool. Even higher attendance than the last time, or at least registered attendance. So Yeah, as a matter of fact, guys, they're really concerned that you might overload the circuits if everybody keeps joining in. So keep yeah. joining in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that'll be great. That's the goal. Crash the servers. <laughs> that'll be great, yeah. <laughs> uh, and we're, then we're going to go into PowerShell scripting language. Now, we're going to take you through the basics of the scripting language and some important constructs that you'll need and that you'll start working with right away. And then we're going to go into starting to build scripts and functions. Now, let me just tell you that our focus today is taking a solution that you've already created at the console and turning it into a script, but more importantly, starting to turn it into a useful tool that you can share with other people and a tool that you can use. So we're going to be taking you into what's called advanced functions. And don't let the word advanced scare you. It's just kind of a fun word to let you know that you're going to do something really cool now. And you're going to be able to create awesome tools that look and feel, well, just like commandlets, right? I, I yeah, mean, absolutely. It, That's the whole point. And, and, and I have a, a, a quick question. You know, there, everybody's going to see this. We have the ability to, in PowerShell, make something that looks, smells, and tastes like a commandlet. Exactly. And I don't have to be a C-sharp developer using Visual Studio to do this. Why did you guys think of this? I mean, where did this come from? Yeah, so this is a great piece of, of uh, uh, background. By the way, uh, turns out we're not crashing the MVA, but we are crashing PowerShell.org. So oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, hold off. Try it again. Uh, <laughs> Try it again. We'll, we'll get there. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so <laughs> Thanks, background. Guys. So here's a kind of fundamental thinking around uh, 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 PowerShell and, and uh, scenarios. So at some point there was this like, why are you building this PowerShell thing? Why not just go figure out what the scenarios are and then implement the scenarios? Yeah, yeah. And so at some point we referred to this as, you know, scripting. Scripting is the anti-scenario scenario. scenario. Right, <laughs> which is to say, so here's basically the problem, right? Because I've done this a long time. I'm going to go. I'm going to. You're you're a, 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 my target audience, so I'm going to spend all day like shadowing you. That's a term, shadowing. I'm going to shadow you. I'm going to see what you do. I'm going to write it all down. I'm going to figure it out. And at the end of the day, I know exactly what your scenarios are. And so then I go back to the office and I spend the next three years implementing a solution to your scenarios. That said, half an hour after I left. All your scenarios changed. Changed, right. You, know, you got a new boss. He says, no, we're not doing it that way anymore. Or you got some new technology. Or there's just a change in philosophy or whatever. Scenarios are constantly changing. So if you had something that said, you know, do my scenario, click this button, it's not going to work. Okay? And so that's what the whole compositional management model is all about. To give you, and by the way, so everybody's scenarios are different because you have different politics, you have different philosophies, you have different technologies that you integrate in. Uh, when you add a user, do you just get to add the user? Or do you get to add a user, but then Joe over here has to add them to the has HR to. system, and oh, before they get access to this, you know, somebody else has to give authorization or okay it, etc. Everything's always different. And so the model of the philosophy around compositional management and PowerShell was to give you a toolbox, a toolbox of tools that then you can then go quickly produce a solution uh, to scenarios as they pop up. And the whole point about this was, again, what we said in the first session, was we wanted to create a world where you think about what you want, you type it, and you get it. Okay? So here's where you come in. Literally, I, I talked to uh, a website, I won't tell you which one, uh, but they're big, big, big internet presence running everything on PowerShell. And uh, at some point, the guys, they were super excited about this, and they went to their operators, and they said, okay, hey, we're going to you know, uh, manage everything with PowerShell. And they said, okay, great. And he said, how do you want to manage the system? And they said, what does that question mean? He said, well, <laughs> go up to the whiteboard and type down the things you want to be able to do. And like, okay. And they said, well, you know, every Monday we want to find all the front end servers where this is the case, and then we want to restart them. He says, great. He said, what do you mean, great? He says, well, that's what we'll do. 
Well, what do you mean that's all we'll do? He says, well, that's what you'll type. He says, look, here, all we'll do is you put a dash between the where and you put a squiggle bracket and this dollar sign underbar and, uh, and, that's, and you're going to type it like that. And they're like, really? Said, yeah, really. <laughs> so that's the point. You want to start with uh, thinking about what things you want to think, type, do. And here's the key point. Each customer is going to want to think type and do something differently. So today is all about how you take the basic components of PowerShell, you use the scripting language to produce your specific things to think, type, and do. And so, what's, yeah, and what's really cool about this is that um, the idea of you already doing something and then turning that into a tool that somebody else can use. So we're going to show you the scripting how to make the tool and build the tool and all the options you have with making a tool. And you're gonna find that because this is built into the language and because this is written using PowerShell and PowerShell's part of the scripting language, it's pretty straightforward and it's pretty easy and it actually becomes fun to do this. You'll type something out in real time and then you'll just immediately turn it into a tool. It'll be that easy. So if you take a look again at, the, at our course topics, we're going to be starting with building scripts and functions and then getting into advanced functions, and you'll get to see how those work. One of the characteristics of a tool is that they have parameters, so we're going to show you some of the options this time you can do with parameters, and we're going to go back and talk about making help because help is one of the most important things when you're making a tool. And we'll also get into things like error handling, and tools that make changes, how to get the dash confirm and what if options. And then at the very end, we're going to show you how to bundle all of this properly so that you too can have your own modules of your own tools, your own little toolbox, if you will. By the way, stay in the slide a second. So it's very interesting to note, what we're talking about here is what we call the admin development model. Right? And we we're very explicit about this. And the idea is, I think I mentioned in the first session, you know, Bruce Payat, superstar mm -hmm. Bruce Payat, said, hey, the average lifetime or the lifetime of 99% of scripts uh, start at the command prompt and terminate with carriage return. Right. Okay? So that is to say a lot of things are done very ad hoc. Now then, you say, well, geez, I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I do this a lot, and I'm getting a repetitive stress injury. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want a repetitive stress injury because Muffy and Buffy need to go to college, so I need this job. So what you do is you say, okay, well, hey, put that in a file, and instead of typing it out each time, you run the file. Oh, great. And then you say, well, but it's almost right, except it's not quite, because sometimes I have to go and I open up that file and I change the, the, the name of the computer or the name right. of something over and over again. Well, then you parameterize it. And, oh, okay, well, that's great, so now it's parameterized. And then you might have it more and more levels of parameterization to make it wider and wider useful. And then at some point you say, hey, J you know, Jason, uh, I heard about the script you're working on, and uh, can I see it? And you say, oh, oh no, it's embarrassing. <laughs> you know, uh, just give me, a, give me a couple minutes and I'll give it to you. And at that point, you're going to share it with somebody, so you make it a little bit more formal. You know, kind of clean it up, use proper verbs, maybe even document something. And then you share it with somebody. And you're like, hey, that's pretty cool. And then we decide, hey, well, we're going to run this on our production server. So this is no longer just this little private thing. You're going to run it on a production server. So at that point, you want to say, well, okay, wait, I need a little bit more formal. Formal, I need to have documentation, right. I need to have help. And they say, hey, this is quite useful. We're going to make it available to other people uh, in forms of modules. So if you think about it, that's what we're doing here. We're going to walk you through step by step this progression of, of formality. You know, it's perfectly fine to have, like, I'll tell you what, the, uh, the number of times that I write scripts called T, because they're all called T, T. Temp, temp, temp. It's just T. It's really easy to type. Just T. And I go. And then at some point, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to do something with it. And you just walk through each one of those steps. And so that's what we're going to do t with you today. And then along these lines, just to set some expectations for you, if you take a look at our expectation slide, look, this is designed for the IT Pro, but if you're a developer, thanks for joining us because this is a great opportunity to see the cool things that you can do with PowerShell, and there's all kinds of interesting ways that you might find fascinating with PowerShell as well. This is kind of high speed, but today is going to be scripting, and you, you've got all the, the examples that we're going to be using. I just want to point out a couple of things for you as um, some supporting material. First of all, I've mentioned this in the last one, and I'll mention it again now. PowerShell.org, as long as it doesn't crash today, uh, <laughs> has a great forum <laughs> site where you can go out and ask questions at the forums. There's wonderful people that are answering questions there. And you can do this at any time. 
Also coming soon to the uh, Microsoft Marketplace, there is a Microsoft course called 55038 that is a full five-day version of going through this step by step by step, plus more than what we're um, able to do today, all on tool making, which also ties into, some of you may already have this, Learn PowerShell Tool Making in a Month of Lunches by Don Jones and Jeff Hicks, which is a great book that also goes through all of this on making tools. Yeah, by the <clears> way, that's a, that is a great book. It really it captures that spirit of translating things from, instead of just focusing in on doing getting the job done. So here's the thing. Each of us, you know, every, everybody's got a job. In reality, you don't. You have two jobs. You have two jobs. So the j first job is the one that you know about. You're supposed to get something done. Oh, the server has to have this installed on it. I need to do this. I need to do that. We all have that job. But there's a second job. And that second job is to do the first job in a way that maximizes your integrated lifetime earnings, which is to say we all took calculus, right? most of us took calculus, you know, earnings over time, <laughs> you know, maximize that uh, area under the curve, which is to say that there are some ways of doing your job, which fine, they get you through the year, but then next year, what are you going to get paid? Or if you need another job, what kind of job are you going to get and what are you going to get paid? And there's some that minimize that. <laughs> okay, that minimizes your pay. And then there's those that maximize your pay, which is to say, hey, uh, I'm going to do this job and I'm going to accomplish it, but I'm going to do it with a script. And I'm going to do it with a script that means I can do it across a large set of systems and I can do this and I can be more productive. Guess what? If you're more productive, you get more money. It's pretty simple. Okay, and then, by the way, and if your employer doesn't get that, like, hello, McFly, I'm being more productive than these guys. <laughs> I, I should get this year's big bonus, you know, big chunk of the bonus queue. Like, if they don't get that, you can put your paper out on the street, and other people will say, oh, this guy's really productive. We'll hire him and we'll pay him that much more. So, anyway, so those are your two jobs get the job done and get the job done in a way that maximizes your integrated lifetime earnings. Don Jones' book, it's like super clear on this point. It's all about that. Become a tool maker, not just a solve your today's problem. Yeah, and your job role has definitely changed in this respect, is we're not just doing real-time administration now. Now you're the one solving real business problems and turning them into tools for others. And so that's what our focus is going to be today. Um, so join the MVA community. Those of you that are watching this, uh, either you're live or you're, <clears throat> excuse me, you're watching the recording, you've already started to join the MVA community. By the way, if you notice towards the bottom here, here's the special code if you want to get some extra points um, for this event. It expires 9-2, so make sure you tell all your friends about this as the video comes up online. Questions or comments, you guys are, have access to the chat room, and we are very fortunate to have wonderful MVPs sharing their time again to help answer questions in the chat room. So please feel free to ask your questions, and hopefully we'll get answers out there for you. Now, let's get started into our first module. Dun, da, da, da. Get started scripting. Yeah, I know. It's, I was trying to make music out of it. So here's what we're going to do. That almost worked. It almost worked. <laughs> here's, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the purpose of PowerShell. And the purpose, uh, wait a minute, I missed a slide. The purpose of PowerShell, we'll take a look at um, some reminders on getting PowerShell v3 installed, launching PowerShell, and some of the security aspects so that we can run scripts in here. So let's get started with... And this might be familiar if you saw the previous show, The Purpose to PowerShell. And actually, we've already been talking about this. Its, it's purpose is so that you can do quick real-time management in large scale. And its purpose also is so that once you've done it, well, then automate it. Stop typing it. You know, I type in something once. That's going to be the last time I type that thing in. Because if I, I know if I'm going to need to do it again, I'm going to want to automate it. So I'm going to want to put it into a script. And if I want to help my, my fellow admins out, I'm going to want to make a tool out of it. So um, we're going to be the tool makers this time. And by the way, that, that picture there, that is me with hair. No, it's not me with hair. Um, On the just, right or the left? Well, see, that's just it. Everybody gets confused between the right or the left is which one is. So using PowerShell, we're going to make our lives much easier in tool making. So some notes on installing PowerShell. We went through this in the previous episode, but it's worth talking about again. PowerShell v3 currently runs on Windows 8 and Server 2012, and also on Windows 7 SP1 and Server 2008 SP2 or Server 2000 R2 SP1. Boy, that's a mouthful. That's why I had to write it all out. 
Now you can download this. This is version three is referred to as the Windows Management Framework and I have a, a link there for you where you can download it. Now guys, take a moment and read the instructions for this. Couple of things for you. First of all, you're gonna need the full version of the .NET 4.0 framework, not the client install. So make sure you install the full version of it so that um, the update can run and you can get PowerShell installed. And something else I wanna point out to you is, is that if you're installing V3, understand that we're working on Windows 8 boxes and working with Server 2012. Because Windows 8 and Server 2012 comes with more modules and more commandlets, there are some commandlets that we have that if you're on a Windows 7 box, they just weren't available then. Just Sorry, they're not there. Today, you're gonna to see that we're gonna be focused on scripting and it's gonna be the same across all your different versions of Windows. Even if you are, and you should not be, but if you are running Windows XP and you have PowerShell V2, it's all gonna be pretty much the same there too. So you're, you're gonna be fine, but, well, you're not fine. You need to get off of XP, but besides that, well, okay, so. Yeah. McFly. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> Please get off of XP for crying out loud. Um, so launching PowerShell. Now, guys, um, let me just do a quick demonstration here with the Magic Computer. And launching PowerShell, if you're on Windows 8, hit that cool little Windows key and start typing the word PowerShell and you'll find, da -da -da -da, there's PowerShell. Now, I always pin it to the taskbar, so right click and pin that bad boy to the taskbar. Once it's pinned, let me get back out of here. Don't do this. Don't, and I, I left click on it. We had this conversation in the first one. If it comes up and says Windows PowerShell, you got the wrong thing. What you want is, let me close this, right click, and say run as administrator. There's your PowerShell console for you. And that'll bring it up. Notice it says administrator up here. That gives me all the authority that I need to be able to work with PowerShell. Something else to keep in mind is we're going to be working with the ISE, and we're going to talk about the ISE in just a few minutes, but I just want to point out, if you right-click here, you can also say run the ISE as administrator, and so we'll be spending a lot of time in that tool today. Now, I have to show you in the slide, if you're using an older OS, then you may have to click on Start and go navigate to Accessories, and then you'll find Windows PowerShell in there, but if you're hip and cool, and on hip Windows and 8, cool. hip and cool, then you get to hit the Windows key and get the tile and life is all good. Now, security. Jeffrey. Yeah. We need to be able to run scripts. And we talked about this in the last show, but we need to talk about this again. Um, yep. We need to be able to run scripts. And there has been a lot of times in the past where some scripting languages have been very dangerous in the yes. way that they've been implemented. Yes. AV script. No, um, and bad things have happened. Yep. Now, you guys put in some additional controls. Now, they're, they're, they're not so much, you know, hardcore security goals, but they're kind of to prevent somebody from making foolish mistakes and, and things like that. So talk about a couple of these, like... Yep that um, PowerShell scripts don't run by default? Exactly. So the first thing to be aware of is that we developed, uh, started working on PowerShell after Bill Gates' famous trustworthy computing memo. Right. So we had seen uh, you know, lots of bad stuff going on, and in particular, the use of scripting languages, I love you VBS. <laughs> I love to, you too, man. No, oh, I'm no, sorry. Yeah, um, later. <laughs> and, uh, I love you VBS and uh, caused the problem. So we knew we had, we had to pay special attention to this. So uh, that's why uh, when you double click on a, a PowerShell file, it does not run the script. Uh, what it does is it brings it up in Notepad or an editor of your choice, okay? Uh, so too we have this execution policy. Now the original execution policy was restricted. What restricted meant was that you can do interactive sessions but you can't run scripts. Okay, and the whole notion, the whole philosophy around PowerShell security model is to make you aware and to make explicit decisions about things. And so whenever there's something that, that has a security ramification, in general, we tell you about it, what the ramification is, and then ask you to confirm. Like, are you sure you want to do that? So when you change the security policy to say, oh, I'd actually like to run scripts, um, we tell you, okay, here is the risks uh, associated with that. And we have different ways you can run scripts. One is to say, 
free for all. Wherever it comes from, just <laughs> run it. You know, drunken sailor mode. We should have renamed that. Mine drunken is- sailor mode. Matter of fact, I'm going to bring that slide up, and I, I should change it to say drunken sailor mode. And the one he's talking about here is. Uh, is, is unrestricted. unrestricted. Exactly. <laughs> Brought out the ether and having some fun. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the mezcal. Yeah, the, the mezcal. That. <laughs> we had a conversation last night about mezcal. Anyway, so um, so that's that. Or uh, remote signed. And it was associated with each one. In the help, the help's actually quite good on this topic. We tell you what it does and what the risks are and what the benefits are. And then you make the uh, the appropriate decision. Now, the interesting thing about this is uh, um, <clears throat> we've been changing things. So right. a- as we have more and more coverage and it becomes more and more an integral part of managing Windows Server, um, what we first did was, turned out remoting was off by default. We turned it on by default for a server because when you manage lots of servers, we wanted to minimize the effort to do what we now consider to be a mainstream scenario, right. which is to script and automate lots of computers. The second thing we did, uh, and this is in Windows Server 2012 R2, is we changed the uh, execution policy. So now the default execution policy is remote signed. Which I think is, is spectacular. Um, and so, and guys, let me show you why this is kind of spectacular. First of all, keep in mind that if when you make a script, it's just a text file. And what's going to happen is you double-click it, it launches in Notepad. Could you change that file association? Could you make it launch in something else? Or could you make it actually just run PowerShell and run the script? You can, but you shouldn't. You should just leave that alone. That protects you in case you or one of your friends in the office accidentally downloads a script that could be bad. So yeah, if you ever see somebody change that association and run it with double click, give yeah. them a dope slap. Like oh, shun them. Major because it's stupid, stupid, stupid. Yeah. So by default, you're not even allowed to run scripts. Well, and that's what we have these execution policies for. And I'm going to show you setting my execution policy here in just a second. But as Jeffrey mentioned, restricted is what's on by default on everything but the new server 2012 R2 because, quite honestly, when you're managing servers, one of the first things you have to do is turn on an execution policy for scripting. And to have the new default changed for server 2012 R2 makes life a lot easier. You know what it is? Basically, we're just constantly evaluating that uh, risk-reward ratio. And there are so many things... PowerShell is becoming such a mainstream way of doing things. Uh, the benefit is very high. And frankly, we just have now years and years and years of experience with PowerShell. Um, and uh, basically, we haven't been having any security issues. So the, we're getting more and more comfortable uh, with the risks associated well, with it. Well, when you so. announced it at TechEd, I just was beside myself because that's one of the first things that you, you okay, you want to manage your environment? Okay, first of all, we have to turn on the execution policy on your servers. Yep. So now, guys, if you're not at 2012 R2 yet, and you're not, so no. you're going you're gonna to need to set this policy. Let's take a look yep. at a couple of these. Unrestricted, we've already talked about bad, 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 bad. This means you can run anything that you write or that you download from the Internet. <laughs> Folks, be really careful about what you download from the internet. It can be dangerous. In fact, um, it could be quite dangerous. So it's good to always know what you're going to run before you run it. However, they put in some helpful things, such as all signed and remote signed. And what the signed means, and we actually talked about this in the last episode, signed means that the script has been signed with a digital signature. In other words, there was a certificate that was used to sign it. This certificate identifies who this person is when they made this script. And so what happens is, is if, if they wrote bad stuff in there, we know who you are and we can hunt you down. So a signed script gives you a better level of confidence with where the script's coming from. Now, in this case, the execution policy is stating for remote signed, you can write anything you want and it doesn't have to be signed. But if you download it, if it gets tagged from the internet, and as we said in the last one, you do know that we know everything you download, right? We do. We've been there a long time. Even UXP people, we know. It gets tagged. And we, yeah, I know, I know. You're, now you're scared. Um, remote sign means anything you download. We're not going to let you run just automatically. You're going to get prompted. You're going to say, hey, look, this has not been signed. This is no, no. So that's probably the best policy for you today. Hey, Jason, you know what? That was, a, that was an awesome explanation. Yeah. But it was wrong. 
Uh, don't, what do you mean it was wrong? <laughs> it was wrong. <laughs> you just described the uh, VB script uh, execution policy. So VB script says, VB script has a mode, they don't have the notion of remoting or not, but they have this mode that says you can only run signed scripts. And you can set that, and it'll only run signed scripts. And so what it does is it says, hey, is this script signed? PowerShell is not that. PowerShell's remote execution script signed mode says, I'll only run scripts that are signed by people I trust. Right. Now there's a oh, huge difference there, yeah, between there is, those there two. Is, so yeah, you're absolutely <laughs> right. You're absolutely right. So by people that you trust means what? That means that uh, not just someone did it. So in VB script, you, know, you can run some evil thing, but you can find the evil person that destroyed all your systems and, and say, oh, some VeriSign knows who it is. What we say is, no, no, no. The, first, it has to be someone that you can identify. And then it comes up and says, hey, currently you don't trust things from evil corp, like evilcorp.com evil <laughs> can be known by VeriSign. That doesn't mean you don't want to be running their code, right? right? So you say, hey, no, I want to trust everything from Microsoft, and I want to trust everything from my internal IT department. They'll sign things. But then if I see some script coming from evilcore.com, even though it's signed, don't run it. Which is an important distinction because you have a much better control over this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me show you. Now, guys, you can set an execution policy by using a group policy. Let me show you how to do it on a standalone. We have a couple of commandlets for this. <clears throat> Mine's already been set for today, but let me just kind of show you. I'm going to go out here to run as administrator, and I'm going to type get execution policy. Mine is now set for, is currently set at remote sign, so I can run some scripts. If you check yours and yours says restricted, well, you can change that with set execution policy and put in remote sign. Now, when you make a script, you too will be able to use it. Now, it's going to come up and ask you to make sure, because it is a security change, to go ahead and say yes, and then you're ready to rock and roll, and we can start scripting now and actually running them. So... Now that we have an execution policy and we can run some scripts, let's talk about running scripts. There's all kinds of ways to run scripts. And what's funny is, is I don't have a test script, so I'm gonna make a quick test script and show you a couple of ways to run them. Um, and we did this also in the first show, but let's uh, see here. I'm gonna do, um, let's do this, uh, let's see, notepad, because we'll talk about the ISC in a second, and I'm gonna make a simple script called get service dash name bits It'll get and I'm going to do file, save as, and I'm going to go out here to, I've got this scripts folder, and I'm going to save it as test dot, and the extension for scripts is PS1, hit save. Now I'd sure like to run this. Well, again, PowerShell has some built-in security around this, and, and, and Jeffrey, help me out with this. It's for, um, I have to do one of two things. I have to either type the full path, Yep. to the script, and note tab completion will help me with this. Why is it again that I have to type this full path? Even though you're in script? that directory. Even though I'm there. All right. But we have shortcuts for this, but why do I have to put in this full path? Uh, we don't have to put in the full path, but you have to put in an explicit path. In an explicit path. Yes, okay. so concretely you cannot execute things in your current directory um, by just giving their name. And this prevents what's called a lurking attack. This has been known in Unix forever, where an evil person would put like a, a, direct, a, a file, an executable file in a directory called print working directory or CD. And if you went to that directory and then you tried to say, where am I, print working directory or CD, you would first run their executable. So this is called a lurking attack. And uh, so we fix that lurking attack. You can't do that. And so here's what's going to happen, guys. If you try to run the script like I just made, see, it's, it's sitting out here. See, I just made test PS1. If you try to run that script by typing test PS1, um, sorry, uh, no, the term test PS1 is not recognized as the name of a commandlet, a function, or a script file. And this is confusing to a lot of folks. A lot of people kind of go, well, wait a minute, I just typed it in and it's, it's not running. Well, they tell you here at the bottom how to fix your problem. They also give you a reference um, uh, uh, for your, your get help with the about underscore help. But let me show you. There's two ways you can do this. You can type the full path. If you're not currently sitting in the uh, folder of the script, you can type the full path and it's scraps and run it this way. Ta-da! Or if you are in that location, there you go, and tab completion again will help you out and you can run the script this way. 
But you should remember to move your uh, screen down so the video oh, doesn't clip yeah, you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. i got to make sure that I have my screen down see, far so you can see my from the last shiny time. head and all this. So I'll no, it's to see the text. I'll make sure I'm not typing over here so you guys don't, don't freak out. Okay. Now, guys, I don't have a function in here yet, but we will do this later on. We also have a way of running scripts that we'll, you'll see today that will keep the functions as we build them, keep them loaded into memory so that we can work with them. We don't have to do this this much today because we're going to be using the ISE. And the ISE, well, let's talk about the ISE because that's next on our agenda anyways. We're not going to use Notepad to write our scripts in. Now, if you want to use Notepad, I feel sorry for you. But um, we want to use something better than Notepad. And something better than Notepad, hmm, I wonder if the PowerShell team helped us out with this too. And yes, they did. Watch. I'm going to right-click and say, run ISE as administrator. So, Jeffrey, we got, we've got we got four easy payments of absolutely free scripting tool here. Yep. And this scripting tool is, this is more than Notepad. Yes. This is a lot more than Notepad. So, let's talk about this a little bit and some of the features that we have here. Now, it, it, when it comes up by default, it shows, um, I've got a scripting pane up here where I can start typing. And I've got a console down here that I can test stuff in. And what's all this over here for the commands? What so this is a new feature called Show Command. And it allows you to explore the commands. And you can type in things, look for things, look by things yeah. by module, look for name, like. Well, let's look for one of my favorite ones, Get Service. Right, and then when oh. you click on it, we show you these parameters, right? Like and this. so notice that their tabs, those are the parameter sets. And by the way, this is just a wonderful tool to really go explore things. Now go to the second one, this, display uh, name. Display okay, name. You notice the star next to display name. That yeah. says it's mandatory. And if you hover over it, it tells, it, you, it's it tells you it's mandatory. So then you can start uh, uh, filling things in. And then it, when you do that, uh, let's do this because I I, um, I don't I don't can I put a star in there? Yeah, can I put absolutely. a star in there yep, and yep. and then you can either run it, insert it, or copy it. Well, I like this. Let's try running it. Oh, looky, looky, looky! And I didn't get a result because guys, I don't remember what the name of the service is, but that's or what the beginning of it. Oh, I think it's background or something like background. that. Background. Back. Let me do that. And we'll run it, and you can see it run in the console. Oh, looky! It ran the A. <laughs> but it, here, insert. Oops, let me click up here. You can copy this and paste it or just insert it. Watch, I'm going to hit Control-V. Look at that. It took, it built, it took, made my commandlet for me and put it right up here. So actually, this is pretty cool to explore it really and define things. You know, I've, you obviously know I've been working with PowerShell for a while now. <laughs> just a while. <laughs> and, and yet, I use this thing all the time to go explore, and, and I'm constantly finding new things. Well, and so guys, go ahead and use this today, but for, for uh, screen size and stuff, I'm going to close this pane today, but I want to show you some other things. First of all, you probably noticed, now watch this, I'm going to go up here and I'm going to start typing. Get dash, this is really cool. This is much better than Notepad at this point, because look, I'm getting this IntelliSense that's helping me find this, and I can tab complete, and do you see what started happening there? It's helping me remember what the parameters are, how to use them, I can go in and start typing, and you'll also notice that with the IntelliSense, we also get color syntax. Now, one of the things that has just really impressed me, and I remember you had made mention of this, just as uh, it, the, the beta had just come out, and I hadn't played with the ISE yet, and you had made mention, we were talking about the console at some conference, and I said, you know, I just, I love the console, but the console, you know, it, it feels, it's old, it, you can't modify it, you can't use control C and control V to copy stuff out of it. Wouldn't it be cool to have a... Can't put Unicode characters in it? Can't put Unicode. Wouldn't it be cool to have a cooler console yeah. than, than, than the current console? And you said, well, have you launched the ISE? And this was for uh, version uh, three, or version two, I'm trying to remember now. And... Some version. Some version, and guys, you, you've noticed this. Watch it, this console that's here. Looking, I love this. It also has the, the 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 IntelliSense and it has the color syntaxing, and it's beautiful. And you can test things here and then go, oh, this is awesome. I want this. Watch. Control C, and then Control V, cut and paste. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. So. 
do you think that most admins will be using this console more than the older one? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely more than the older one. I mean, the, the, the cases where you still use the older one is either if you've are, you know, you're sitting at a, a server core box and it has the console. Um, although, frankly, the better way to do that is to get on a client box and use remote uh, PowerShell to, to access it. Um, yeah, that's probably the only case you'll use it. By the way, I should note that uh, PowerShell ISC is just one of a number of great uh, ISCs out there. Uh, a number of the third-party products have fantastic uh, tools that go well beyond the capabilities of that which we ship in PowerShell ISA. And what I like to tell a lot of admins is there are some great third-party tools. Um, I'm a huge propo proponent of Sapien's tools, their Primal Script and their PowerShell Studio, because um, they also solve particular business problems. Um, but when you're just getting started, this is the tool to start with, and then when you start to run into those business problems that these great IDEs and these great ISEs solve, that's a great time to move to those. And there's plenty of information out there yeah. on when and why you'd want to move to them. You know, think of it as the ISE is, is you know, much better than Notepad, but think of some of these third-party tools as the visual studios of... Of, of PowerShell exactly. as well. There's quite a few out there, and if you just go to uh, the PowerShell.org. PowerShell.org has, so, has a bunch of them listed. You can also just ask questions, and people can help you check out and find all the different ones that are available to you. Yep. Now, a couple of other things about the ISC um, before we uh, uh, take a break. Um, there's a couple of options up here I want to I want to show you guys. This gives you your script pane and a console, and this is probably the view that I'm going to be in most of today. However, you can also have it go side by side, and a lot of people like this because if you have two monitors, you put that line right in between them, and then you get PowerShell on one side and a script pane on the other, which is really cool because as you're going to see, the best thing to do is you're going to use your PowerShell Kung Fu skills, and you're going to get event log. You're going to solve the problem first. Log name, system, give me newest three, and when you've solved the problem, now you're going to, oops, let me grab this, you're going to copy this over, and you're going to paste it in here, and you're going to save it as a script, so that you don't have to type it all again, and we're going to do that, and show you how to make that even cooler by turning it into a tool. Now, the other one that I usually use on my desktop is, is uh, where they're maximized, this is where you get a full screen for it. And I also like this view um, to have the command pane up because it gives me a nice view and I can explore with the command pane um, up. Uh, the other cool thing that I like about this is control R. And I'm gonna use control R. There's also a button over here that will do it as well, but control R will flip between the two. And this makes it so that you can have a full-size console, you can work here, you can cut and paste from here, and then paste back over into your full-size scripting pane. However, I'm going to go back to this one. Anything else we should show them before uh, we uh, take a break and get into the no, uh, hardcore this, stuff? No, I think this is the good stuff. This is good? Yeah, it? the basics. Yep. Yeah, it's you'll a, see more. We'll get into debugging, I'm sure, at some point. That's cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so basically PowerShell ISE is your kind of uh, bare bones uh, environment. They're uh, third party ones with much richer capabilities, but it's a great environment to do your own uh, you know, scripting and debugging and Absolutely. exploration of the environment. That's really what it was meant for is to just you know increase the volume of things, get people off Notepad. We found just a shocking number of people <laughs> writing scripts in Notepad. And on Honestly, we were just embarrassed. Yeah, Notepad is, is not the way to go. And since this is four easy payments of free, get started with this. And this is all you'll need um, today as we work through getting with uh, uh, starting all of our scripting stuff. So what we're going to do here is in a moment we're going to take a break. But when we come back, when we come back, we're going to start getting into the scripting language itself. And so we're going to take you through some of the basic parts of the scripting language that you're going to need. These are also some of the most powerful parts. And you can see us use it all day long. If statements and loops and for each and all kinds of stuff as we start building tools. So take 10 and come back and see us in 10. Yeah, because we'll... when we come back, we're going to get right into the, into the meat of it. So make sure you download those scripts. Because you're going to need them. It'll be helpful.
I don't know who's funny. Are these guys back in production or what? They, they just did this. We're going to start in three, two. Oops, wait a minute. It's like, oh, all right. So <laughs> now we're going to get started with the scripting language and taking people through the basics that they need to know, the scripting language and PowerShell. Yep, yep, yep. yep. But... but Okay, so we just told everybody, hey, go to PowerShell.org, crash that server, and when it comes <laughs> back up, downline load the scripts because you're going to use these scripts. And we talked about the execution policy and said best practices remote signed. So let's put those pieces together. You just downloaded a bunch of scripts, and your execution policy is remote signed, and so you've gotten a demonstration of how it works. Just to say <laughs> you're not allowed to run any of those scripts. We now, intended that. Yes, yes. So Make a point. And thank you for pointing it out in the, in the chat room. Now, there's two things you can do. First is you can change your execution policy. You can change it to um, unrestricted. For just this, though. For just this. Bad idea. Here's a better idea. So let's go. Let me show you how this works. So here in, on ISC, um, I can say II dot. II is short for invoke item, and dot brings it up. And so what you can do is you can right-click things, go to properties, and there's something I've already fixed this. So, uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, it's right it, there. It, it'll show you if it was blocked. Yep. And then you can unblock it. However, I already fixed this, um, there is a version of a new commandlet called unblock file. And so what you do is, uh, I'll cd here, you see I'm in jumpstart, I, I put everything there. And what you can do is you can say unblock file star slash star, and I do verbose, and what it does is it unblocks all those files. You know, okay, I, so here's the model for unblock. Unblock is for when you have looked at the file, you, you brought it down low, downloaded it from somewhere, and you trust it now. And so what you do then is to say, I, I trust it, I unblock it. And uh, we're telling you, by the way, is it safe? Well, I... Marathon man, I, is it I, safe? Yeah, it's safe. It's, okay. I it's didn't safe. put anything nasty in there, guys. Yeah, so you get, we're telling you. Uh, Jason is telling you. Yeah, that <laughs> makes me clear yeah. about that. That there's nothing evil in those files. I'm not telling you that, Jason is. <laughs> and that, that it's safe to unblock. So go ahead and unblock those files, and then we'll use them for today's sessions. And, um, by the way, thanks for showing me the unblock, because I didn't even know that that existed. See, I'm telling you, it's this exploration it's, and community, right? You try yeah. something, and other people say, well, why didn't you do it this way? Yeah, I'd love that. So, boys and girls, here's where we go. We're going to start off with talking about variables, how you make variables, how you can use variables, um, some fun tricks with quotation marks, and how they work with variables. And also, if you watched the first episode, this might be a little bit of a review, but we want to talk about object members and using them with variables. In other words, everything's an object in this in PowerShell, and we're going to send it to get member, and there's all kinds of interesting things that we can do, um, both with methods and properties, um, when we have them in variables. Also, I want to review how to utilize parentheses in PowerShell to call up some files, like if you have a server list and a text file or a CSV or something like that is one of the things that people were asking us about in the last episode. So we'll show you some more on that. Then we're going to dive into what you're going to be using quite a bit. Some logical constructs, which means if statements and how they work. And then some looping constructs, which are the loops that we can use in PowerShell. I'm going to show you several different loops, but there's really one or two that we're going to be focused on today that are the most useful ones that we'll be using um, throughout this. So let's get started with variables. Now, I've got all this on the slide for you, but I'm going to open up my scripting pane here. And I'm, if you've noticed, uh, guys, let me just show you. In, this is module two. I put in a startup script that will just launch the ISE and put all of the demo scripts in this module already as tabs right across the top in the ISE. So I'm going to be using these. I'm going to try to minimize my hand typing because, as you can tell, I can't type very well. First of all, variables. Place in memory to store stuff. Now, variables in PowerShell um, can store anything. I mean, they can store strings, integers, they can store objects. Objects. And we don't really have to think about that as administrators. We just do it and it just happens. And that's, it's very fascinating about variables that we don't have to think about it most of the time when we're interactive at the console. But now, when we start working with variables, we're probably going to want to start thinking about what type of data we want in those variables mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. So, guys, let's take a look at a couple of examples here. First of all, one of my favorite examples 
setting a, a value to a variable. And guys, um, one of the neat things about the ISE is, is if I want this line to execute, I just press F8 and you'll see it in the screen down here. So that line executed. I want to show you, this is one of Jeffrey's favorites. He loved to show this one in the last one. I want you to notice the use of the squigglies. You can put spaces in your variables. You're crazy, but you can do it. Um, and I'll show you that. Um, uh, I'll execute this one as well by pressing F8. When you want to get the output of a variable, there's a couple ways you can do it. You guys, uh, if you've worked at the console, you know you can just type the variable and you see there's the value that's in there. I'm going to hand type this down here though. I want you to see what IntelliSense does with this guy for me because here's the problem you run into. You, you put a space in there and you kind of forget that you need squigglies around it. Look at the IntelliSense. See how it found my space var? Well, when I hit tab, it put the squigglies in for me. So if you if you do have to have a space in your bar, which you shouldn't, at least IntelliSense will help you use it and you can get the value out of it. Now, By the, way, the key there yeah. was he did dollar sign and then M and did IntelliSense. If you did dollar sign squiggly, it's not going to work. That's interesting. Yeah. I would have had to hand type it all out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're on your own. I'm on my own. Now, guys. This is how you can work with variables in the console interactively. But when we start to script, we want to be a little bit more structured about how we do things. So the correct way, at least for now, to output a variable is to use the commandlet write output. Now we're going to have several different versions of write where we can do warnings and all kinds of things. But write output my var says, take this var and put it out to whatever it is I want it to go out to. Later you'll see that this could be the pipeline or something like that. By default, it's going to go out to the host or to the screen for us. Also in scripting, we want to start to be specific about our variables. And we want to start to tell our variables what kind of data they're going to hold. Rather than just letting the variable figure it out, we're going to start to want to control this. First of all, it's much better script documentation. In other words, you have specified exactly what you want. Take a look at the example here I have in line 12. Notice I'm going to say string, my name is Jason, and I'm going to run that. And so you can imagine that, well, we'll just type it out down here, dollar sign my name. It's got my name in it because this is string data, and I have strongly typed what that variable is allowed to hold. Take a look at this, though, line 13. Here I'm saying that the variable needs to hold an integer. And look at the kind of data that I'm giving it. Ooh, let's see what happens when I try to run this. Uh-oh, I get an error message. It's telling me that I'm not, I'm trying to input the wrong data type into this var. This is why you want to start to do this in your scripts because it can get confusing sometimes what kind of data is going in. Yeah, this is a, a, so this is a benefit of types. Types allow you, you know, allows the system to do work for you, right? And it brings in a whole set of features. So let me just draw one key distinction, and that is where you use the type. So here I'll show you, I'll say dollar sign x equals uh, integer uh, one. Okay, and so we'll execute that. And indeed, dollar sign x is one. And I can see dollar sign x equals test. <laughs> That's an X. Okay, so notice when I put the uh, uh, type, that's bracket, a name, bracket. When I put that on the right side, that is what we call casting uh, the value to that type. But we didn't apply it, we applied it to the, to the value and not to the variable. And that's why we were able to reuse this and set it to a string. Okay, so now imagine I do this, imagine I say, integer dollar sign x equals one. Okay, same thing happened, but now yeah. it gives an error. So that's the distinction. If you want the variable at this point in time to have an integer, you do it this way. If you want to say this variable can only contain integers, you do it this way. 
And the, what this is, is it, let me give you another example of this as well. Here's, you're gonna see this a lot today. A lot of times we're gonna to wanna to be able to do things like store a computer name or something into a variable so that we can use it later on. Here I'm using the commandlet, oops, I don't wanna move it, uh, which I just screwed it all up. Control Z, Control Z is your friend. <laughs> Control Z is my friend. Control Z um, says undo something. Um, read dash host, this will prompt you to enter in a computer name and I wanna store that in here well, this is always going to need to be a string, so I'm going to make it a string. I don't want people, I don't want this stored as an integer. Um, and let me just go ahead and run this as an example, and you'll see what it does here. See, it prompts me for my computer name. I'll put in a computer name called DC, and then we can, of course, print it back out. Now, I know that working with variables doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but making sure that you have... Um, cast them correctly, that you've typed them correctly, is going to become very important to us as we start working with parameters. You're going to see this as we start to look at how the syntax gets built and how the parameters get built. So it's good practice to start doing this now with your VARs, which is not what you're accustomed to doing when you're interactively working in the shell because the shell just handles it all for you. Yeah, let me show one sure. more point about uh, the benefit of types and how they do work for you. So here I'm going to show you, I set a dollar sign D equal to some date, right? So this is Christmas, right? My daughter's fascinated with Christmas. She always asks me about Christmas, right? <laughs> We're all fascinated so with Christmas. Dollar sign D, you know, there's the string, okay? So at this point, it's a string. And if I say dollar sign D dot, you'll see I can do string things to it, right? Copy, uh, things like uh, normalize, pad left, pad right. So that's pretty useful stuff, right? I don't know if you've seen that. Pad, pad left, pad right, let's see, pad left. 100. Oh, oh cool. there you go. Yeah, okay, yeah. so things like that. Okay, however, notice none of those things were anything to do date. with the date. Yeah. So what I can do here is I can say, hey, let's let's do it this way. I'll say, hey, this is a date time. Okay, and now when I say dollar sign D dot, look at this. Oh, there's all the date stuff. I have now. a whole set of functions. Okay, right. so this is the power of types. I can say, well, hey, give me the day. Oh, the 25th. Wait, day, day, what was that? Day of the week. So what, what day is Christmas going to be this year? I have no idea. Well, let's ask PowerShell. It's going to be on a Wednesday. Oh. <laughs> Part A. Oh, then really? you say, okay, well, wait a second. Day dot, you know, um, I always like to say that my, my in-laws live in, in uh, the UK. So if we wanted to send them gifts, you want to do that uh. like a couple weeks before. So what you can do is you can add days. And if you use a negative number, so let's say, uh, well, let's see, six, seven days times, uh, let's say, six weeks, a negative number, that tells you I have to ship them Wednesday, November the 13th, <laughs> to get there. So types are your friend. Types allow you to do really crazy powerful stuff. Like if you just had a string and you tried to do that in, in C Sharp or in Python or Ruby or whatever, it's like, Best of luck, my friend. You're in for some heavy lifting. Some heavy lifting. So, and let me just show you guys, since you have the slides, I just want to point out in the slides that I've listed some of the uh, uh, types for you over here. We're going to be spending most of our times with int and string and date time, that kind of stuff. But I did list them all for you in the slides. And also as a reminder, you do have commandlets to work with variables. We're just not going to use them that often. In our scripting, we're going to be writing it all out. And as you'll see, it's pretty straightforward the way that we're doing it. So. And just to be clear, this type, this uh, list here, is a small representative sample. Small, yes. Turns out you have the full uh, .NET access. You can do anything with .NET. And that's one of the interesting things is that people ask me all the time, and, and, and correct me if I'm, I'm sure you will correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> is that um, there's no help file that lists the types, right? Correct. It's, it is, oh, correct. Oh, okay, good. Because it's all of these types come from .NET, so this is something you could find on MSDN. MSDN, yep. Is a great example of where you can find all the different types that you can have and explanations of what they are. Yep. So, awesome. Okay, back to the did I close it? Oh, goody, I didn't. By the way, can we do a short little uh, trip? Can I just say, types are, like, variables, like, these look like your regular old variables. Like, anybody who's done any kind of programming or any scripting, they're, they're variables, right? And you, you think you know what they are, but trust me, they aren't. This is PowerShell, okay? So it's different, <laughs> right? These are PowerShell. So, uh, concretely, let me show you something here. 
So, so imagine I say, well, I'm going to have some variable. By the way, I'm kind of foreshadowing something you're going to see when we get into scripting. In scripting, you can define parameters, and then you can put certain what we call validation attributes, yeah. right? which is to say, hey, uh, this value, it's a string, but it can only contain these values. Okay. So imagine I say, I am here, and I say, I'm going to have some string, dollar sign x equals a. Okay, I run that. Happiness dollar sign x is a. And if I wanted to say dollar sign x equals test, yeah, that works too. Now it's a dollar sign x is equal to test. Okay, but what I can do here is I can go and I can use one of the things you're going to see a lot of later in the day called the validation string. And what I can say is I can say validate set, and I can say, hey, this thing can only contain values a. B or C. This is awesome. Okay, so now I run this. It works. Dollar sign X is that. Like dollar sign X equals B. Happy, happy. That's an X. But then if I say dollar sign X equals test, <laughs> error. Okay, so this is a power show, my friends. So it's very, very powerful. So the point is, just because something looks familiar doesn't mean you've explored it. So you want to explore this. There's a very rich set of things. Now, again, that's just kind of a foreshadow. You're going to see more of it uh, later on in the day. Um, but but I think that's an important demonstration that it's not just what it's not your 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 daddy's programming language. They put a lot of stuff in here to make your life easier and better. And so the validation is actually awesomely cool. You're going to see us use it with parameters, but as you just showed, you, there's a lot of useful ways you can use it anywhere in yeah. your script. So totally awesome. And guys, I'm going to go to um, this, this fun with quotes, which is example number two. And I want to show you this. Um, and you saw Jeffrey just now, uh, he was putting values in quotes and sometimes double quotes and sometimes mm. single quotes. Let's talk about this a little bit. The quotes do matter in PowerShell, and, and something kind of happens depending upon your quotes. Take a look at line four here. I've got a variable, and I'm just going to set it to PowerShell. So I'm going to run this. It, not a big deal. Take a look at my first line here. Notice that it's between double quotes, and it says, well, this is the variable dollar sign $i and dollar sign $i rocks. Well, here's the interesting thing. Between double quotes, the variables get resolved, right? Yes. And this is this is actually kind of cool. So I'm going to run this, and take a look at what my screen says. This is the variable PowerShell, and PowerShell rocks. Well, PowerShell does rock, but it resolved this one too. Hmm. Well, when you use single quotes, the variables don't get resolved. Oh, so single quotes, the variables won't get resolved. So let's try this one and see what it prints to the screen. Ah, this is the variable dollar sign i and, well, dollar sign i rocks. Well, that's not exactly what I want. But first of all, the important distinction. When you put a variable between double quotes, you're turning on a special feature that PowerShell then resolves it. When you use single quotes, PowerShell ignores that and doesn't turn on that special feature. So you will see us use very distinctly sometimes single quotes when we don't expect a variable there or we don't want the variable result and double quotes when we do and you'll see that throughout today now in this case let me show you how to solve this particular problem because you can see my problem is is that i want it to say this is the variable dollar sign i and powershell rocks well there's an interesting little character here notice you have to put it in double quotes because i want a variable to resolve and let me take it away and add it back in to the left of your number one key is a back tick. That's an escape character. And watch what happens when I have escaped that. Now PowerShell will ink. This is the variable dollar sign i and PowerShell rocks. So the escape character lets me control that inside of the double quotes. Like I said, we're going to be using lots of quotes today. And you, everybody keeps asking, what's the difference? Well, that's what the difference is. And it's an important difference when we start to script. Um, an example is uh, right here. Um, I'm going to set a computer name of client, and then I'd like to use get service name bits, and for computer name, I want to use that variable. Notice I've put it inside of double quotes because I want that variable to get resolved when this executes. Now I'm going to select this so you can see this, and it works. 
Now, I want you to notice, hey, Jeffrey, how come I can take out the quotes and it still works? I was going to say, why are you putting the quotes? Well, I know, because it, it, and, 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 and this is the thing. You're going to see us use quotes a lot and, and with variables, but sometimes you see us use commandlets, and we've got a variable there, but we don't, have, we don't put quotes there usually. Yeah, so, um, okay, you ready for the... Oh, God, here we go. The real answer. Yeah. The real answer, back to the trustworthy computing memo. Okay, trustworthy computing memo. We did design this for security by default. And there's a classic thing called a SQL injection attack. SQL injection attack says, oh, um, I get some input from the user, and I place it here, and I run the SQL query. And what happens is that the SQL injection attack says, oh, I get the value. You might say, you know, uh, select star from table where name equals grab this value, put it in here, right? And then you say Jeffrey Snover and it says, <laughs> get you that. But instead of putting Jeffrey Snover, what they do is they'll say, you know, Jeffrey Snover, you know, uh, statement terminator, and then something else, like a completely different right. table, like go gather this information. Credit cards or something. Credit cards or delete the database or something. And because you take that string and you just concatenate it and then execute it, all sorts of bad things happen. I cannot tell you how expensive SQL injection attacks have been. Well, PowerShell has no such thing. Our parser was designed specifically to address these SQL injection type attacks, and so it's a completely safe parser. And so what you're doing is you're not uh, concatenating a bunch of strings together. When you give an object, that object's going directly to that parameter. And so we don't have to put the quotes because it knows how to handle it. And particularly and because you're not creating, the command line isn't a big string. Isn't one big string, yep. absolutely. So guys, you'll see this a couple of different ways. Sometimes you'll see people using the quotes um, in their scripts, but most of the time with commandlets, when you're putting in values, you won't see it. You'll see me not use it a lot today as well. But yep. at least now you know the difference between the two different types. By the way, so let me show them a trick, because yeah. I don't think you showed this later. Okay, so uh, show them my screen. So imagine this. Okay, so imagine I'm gonna get process. So let's show you what that gives you. So if I get process, right? And so then what I'm gonna wanna do is I'm gonna wanna say, hey, I wanna get the you know, process ID equals and then show the value, right? I wanna show this 800 and 828. 20, yeah. okay? So I assign it to a variable, yeah, and then I just go ahead and execute this. And notice that didn't quite work it out the way out I wanted. It didn't work out so well, yeah. So but look here, I got System Diagnostics <laughs> Process LSASS dot ID. Okay, so by the way, so this is interesting, right? So you might have guessed this, and if you did, you'd write dollar sign P dot two string. Ah, okay, so that is that. So what's happening is, is when you do this, it's turning, it's evolving that to a string. It's evaluating right. that, and then it's concatenating data ID. So that's clearly what you not, you don't want to do, right? So, so at this point, you just throw it away and pick up Python it's all or broke. C sharp. Yeah, because it's broke and it doesn't work. Oh no. wait, no, we oh. didn't do that. That's turns right. Out, That's right. Turns out this guy Bruce is actually a pretty smart it's a pretty guy. Pretty smart guy. <laughs> so here's the deal. And this is it, important, guys. This is actually really cool. I'm saying it, aren't I? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Confused me there for a second. Yeah, really. So here's the deal. In, when you do the string expansion, one of the things you can do is you just put things in parentheses, okay? So you say dollar sign parentheses, and what happens is we will execute anything in that, in that and we'll take, we'll execute it, and we'll run it. So here, what we're going to execute is dollar sign pid. Yes. Okay, so we do this. Oh, what did Oops, I do wrong? Wait a minute. Dollar sign pid. Oh, sorry. Uh, what did I do? Yeah. Oh wait a minute. Is it is it id? Dollar sign. Dollar sign p dot id. Oh yeah yeah. There. Oh, there it goes. Yeah. Okay, so voila. Now notice I said anything you want is, is in here, right? So you can run anything. Okay, so concretely I said read host minus prompt. What should I give them? Okay, so again, what we do when we expand the string is we, we see this dollar sign parentheses. We execute anything, anything 
anything, anything. <laughs> can be can be a simple expression. It can be a multi-line script. It can be a ten-page script. Uh, anything you want. We execute it and we take the value and we plug it in here. So when we run this, it's asking me what value should I give them? Uh, give them a uh, eight 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 eight. And it just takes that value and expresses it. So that's one of the key things you want to do about, learn about it. By the way, and if I had done single quotes, single quotes, of course it would say, does no, right. no expression evaluation. Now that's actually for that, that, that dollar sign parentheses and then I'll do whatever you want is, is so very important because it's confusing sometimes when you're putting things into strings and you're getting back you know, the type name and all that stuff. That has a particular name. It's, it's called a sub-expression, right? Exactly. Like, like a periscope. Um, a, that's my sub-expression joke. Is a... It's going to be a long day. Yep. All right. So oh, wait, wait, can, we, can we party? Can we, have a, can, can we just... Yeah. Show? Okay. So here's the thing. You might say, oh, why am I ever going to do with that stuff? Like this distinction, like when am I ever going to want to have a dollar sign in stuff? Like that makes no sense. Well, let me show you a cool thing. So first off... We showed you before this notion of snippets. Okay, so let's hear. So, snippets. Okay, cool stuff. Okay, now, did you realize I now show you commands and I say snip? Oh, I already did this. Snip. Oh, yeah, let me clean that out. <laughs> Pay no attention to this. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Okay, so notice you can get snippets, you can import snippets, and you can create new snippets. snippets. You can create new snippets, okay? So here is the description. Uh, I can say underbar my var test, right? And the, the title, I don't know what the title is, so I'm going to test, test title. Author, of course, Jeffrey. And text. Now, this is the text that you're going to replace. And obviously, you don't want to type that all here. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, what, I don't know if you knew this, in show command, I'm going to say dollar sign script. Okay, and before I run it, now I have to put a script into dollar sign script. And my script is going to be this whole thing here. This is, I'm going to put the whole thing. Now, the problem is I've got all these dollar signs in here, and I've got to preserve it exactly as is. So, if you haven't seen this, there's something called here strings. Here strings. Here, here strings, strings are awesome. So, here string is an WYSIWYG. at and then a quote. Okay, notice everything is there. Here string is a multi line string. Okay, so it can contain carriage returns. And if I do the quote, it's going to take all those dollar signs and expand them. And so I don't do that. I use a single quote. I come down here to the end. Do it again. Sorry, I did that wrong. What am I doing? Oh. Am I doing this wrong? Uh, it, um, is it oh, uh, quote, quote, at? quote, at. there we go. Given enough time and resources. So now <laughs> that, that is a string. Okay, notice it's exactly what's up there because that's the whole point. And now what I do is I say, okay, I'm going to assign that to a variable. Dollar sign. Oh. Remember I mentioned the first thing, PowerShell is a powerful language because I'm deeply flawed? <laughs> script equals. So now I run this, and so now I have this dollar sign script. And so that's here. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run new ISC scriptlet. I give it a description. Oh, that's the description. I want that. That's its name. That's its title. This is a test which shows stuff. <laughs> anyway, so we run it here. Okay, great. So now I've created a new snip snippet. I come here and I hit control J and somewhere here. Up oh, there it is. There it is. There's my commandlet. And when I type it in, voila, I get exactly what I got before. So you can make your own snippets. And when you create your own snippets, you want to have exactly, you're going to have dollar signs and all this all funky stuff, stuff yeah. and you don't want any of that stuff expanded, otherwise it's going to come out all wonky. So what you do is you use a here string, which is a multi-line comment, and you use the single quotes so you don't expand any of it. So We're tying it all together, baby. So it ties together. So back you, to that you start tool that, making. Back to that whole tool making Learn thing. the concepts, put the concepts together, party. Now, PowerShell, 
does everything as objects. And so another concept we have to add in here before we start making scripts is take a look at my screen. I'm looking at the uh, uh, third example here is if you joined us in the last presentation, this will look familiar. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put an object into a variable. And you can see I'm just going to do get service name bits. And the interesting thing that happens is I'm going to pipe this to get member. Now, pipe GM is, is, is the short way of saying I'm going to pipe it to get member. So we can take a look at what's in there. Well, what's in there is the actual service object. And we can go up here and look at the name. It's a service controller object, whoops, for bits. And look at all the methods and the properties. Well, this is kind of cool, because now that I have that object stored in that variable, I can now call or work with those properties and those methods. One of those is down here called status. It will give me the status of the service. So look what I'm doing. Dollar sign service dot status. So you can see that it's stopped. And if I go back up here, you'll see that there's a method, which is something that the object can do, called, where is it, start. Doo -doo, doo -doo. Well, since the service is currently stopped, let me change this to, to execute the method as start. And guys, if this is really unfamiliar, we did this in the first episode, this is kind of a reminder. And as you can see, when I execute this, it's actually going to start the service. Notice here, see how Jeffrey showed us the sub-expression up Periscope? Um, the sub, by the way, I got that from Ed Wilson, so blame him. Um, uh, up Periscope? Look, I've got a message that I want to print out to screen. Service name is, if I didn't put it inside of the sub-expression that Jeffrey showed us, this would come out with a weird name, you know, dot service controller, and just it's not what you want to see. So inside the sub-expression, I'm saying, show me dollar sign service dot name, and I'm using another method to upper to make it all uppercase. So I just wanted you to be able to see this. I'm going to put it in there and I'll print the message out. Ta da! Service name is bets. So again, putting objects into variables, you can then pipe it to GM to see what methods and properties are available. You can execute and look at those methods and properties. Um, and you can also then start using them in messages. And, uh, and again, that uh, uh, sub expression becomes very important that dollar sign parenthetical now working with multiple objects variables are very variable uh, come on that was okay and so it wasn't even the guys in back are going please so just look at this instead of doing a single object I'm going to execute and do notice that I'm using get service that's going to be multiple objects well the beautiful thing about this is and I'm going to do this down here in the, the lower pane is that variables are arrays. And if I want the first element in that array, and again, we talked about this in the first episode, I can put in the element number and we start counting from zero. And so the very first service in this list, da, 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 I can also go through and look, because we're going to use this quite a bit. I want that first service, but I want to see its status. So I'm going to dot status. And notice the ISE is helping me. And that'll get the status of the service. So you can call individual objects in a collection and then check their properties and execute their methods as well. And so then you can uh, dash one, get you the last one. And here's a couple more examples that I just put in here for, for you to be able to play with of using a sub expression with a particular object in a collection where I'm doing dash display name or changing the name to upper. So you can see that working with variables, especially a collection of variables, is very important to us for our, our, our scripting. One last thing before we get into the actual script language itself. Well, this is the script language, but parentheses. Everybody's been asking about these parentheses. Um, how can I, you know, get, you know, uh, a list of computers out of a text, or, or and how do I work with that? So I wanted to make hey, sure you guys... Before you do that, can yeah. I show them something? Sure. Okay. So notice, we're going to have fun with arrays, okay? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Do we talk about that later? Well, will you go ahead and talk about okay. that. Okay. So you notice he, he did this. We did, you know, service equals this, and you have dollar sign services and you see them all okay happy happy but are you aware of the range operator R Ooh, range operator the range operator okay. Great so example. the range operator is dot dot so one dot dot three four okay it generates things right so you can say you know uh uh ten dot dot fifteen 
Okay, now check this out. Services, or oh, sorry, uh, dollar sign services, one dot dot five. Oh, I like that. I is like that, that awesome? a lot. That By is way, awesome. So you think that's cool? Yeah. You think that's cool? Well, yeah, I think that's totally cool. Five dot dot one. Backwards. Oh, so it did backwards. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And if you want to, there's minus one, right? So you can go, you know, uh, one, let's see, I think there's dot count. Yeah. Anyway, so you can, you, minus one goes to the end of the array. Goes to the end of the array. Yeah. So we're going to be working a lot with these arrays and the looping functions that'll, uh, the looping constructs that'll let us work with them. Let's take a look at these parentheses here real quick. And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples here. I'm just going to make a couple of text files real quick. I'm going to make a text file and I'm going to make a CSV so that you can see how I'm going to use these parentheses. And all I'm doing is putting in some computer names and sending them out file. The first one will just make a text file of two computer names for me. Da -da -da -da. And now take a look at the next one. Now, you guys know that CSVs, they have a column header separated by commas. So I want to put in computer name, comma, IP address. So I'm going to do that, and that'll create the file, computers.csv. But I want to add some things to it. So I've got DC and its IP address, and I'll just append it. And I'm going to add client to it. Now, here's the cool part. Yes, I could call these up in Notepad, and you could see them real quick. You know, So if I, whoops, not, that, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, so I could go out here and, and, and show you that they exist, uh, DIR, so you see computers text and computer CSV, and I can um, notepad on the computers text, oops, wrong one, there we go, and you can see there it is, nice little text file, and um, PowerShell, we have an import CSV, and I'm going to import that uh, CSV so you can see that it's well-formed the way it's supposed to be. So notice I got my columns on my headers. So whatever file type you have, you can now use that with your commandlets. And look at the examples here that I have for you on the using it with the commandlets. Get service computer name. See the parentheses? The parentheses mean do whatever inside there first. What's going to happen is, is that this result, and I'm moving it again, stop doing that. This result, and I'm moving it again, so I'll stop doing it. <laughs> Deja vu. <laughs> Deja vu. All over again. This result will be added as the arguments on the parameter computer name. So if I hit F8 here, it's going to read the text file. Get content will open up and bring out those, those, those values. And notice it just ran get service, and it ran it twice on both those computers. And the same thing if you wanted to import it from a CSV. So here's an example of Actually, get you know service. Actually, what shows clearer is just give like bits. Get service bits and you yeah, you know what? It, as a matter of fact, what a great idea. So name bits and boop. See, I got two of them. And here's an example of working with the CSV. Now, now, guys, this was from our first lesson when we were talking about um, understanding the pipeline. It was we had a four-step process, and this was part of step number uh, three and part of step four, actually. When I import so it's sort of like 3.7. So it's like 3.7, yeah. So when I import this CSV, and this confuses a lot of folks. So, yes, because it has two Ps. It's confusing oh, everyone. Oh, well, right there, that's not even going to look like it works. So I import this. <laughs> this isn't exactly what you think this is. Well, it is exactly what you think it is. I'm going to pipe it to get it's member. It's one of those two. It's one of those two, kind of, sort of, maybe. <laughs> I'm going to pipe it to get member, and I want you to see that this is actually an object. This is coming across as an object. Well, this parameter has an argument called string. It yeah. wants a string. It doesn't want this object. So notice, I can't just import CSV like I did with the text file. I have to extract out the column or property that I want, which if you look down here, looky, I've got... <laughs> I've got computer name is the column that I want. I have to extract the values out of that and make sure that they're strings. So watch, I'm going to do this again. And we'll do select object. And if I just did dash property and said computer name, it almost looks like it worked. Except it doesn't. Except it doesn't. Let me pipe it to get member again. This is still an object. I need to turn it into a string. I need to yeah. extract, extract, extract. No, it's expand. 
property. And when I pipe it to GM, you'll see that now I have a string. So, and this is how it normally would look. That's the data that I'm going to uh, put in there. So notice that this, it's a little bit more complicated, but when I run it, oh, and, and this, I should do dash name bits. Yeah, bits. Just to make it easy. When I run it, lo and behold, ta-da, it ta -da. works. This is the hard part to it, and so go back and check that uh, our first video series on, on working with that, but it's an important concept for and, those parentheses. And that's what you had to do if you had PowerShell version 2. And that's what you had to do if you had PowerShell version 2, but... But, go for it. Well, no, you... It's next, isn't it? I don't have this. I don't have it. Show them how to do it in PowerShell version 3. How do I do it? Uh, what do you want me to show them in PowerShell version 3? Dude. What? Dude. Oh, well, just dot, dot, computer name. Parentheses dot, computer name. Oh, so yeah. Um, up arrow. <laughs> up arrow. Yeah, and just no, no, no. Which one? Oh, because you, you did F eight. Oh, because anyway. I did F eight. Oh, yeah. this guy. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so, so do the you know, parentheses import CSV dot computer name, the dot operator. This is like one of the most oh, important things. Oh, wait a minute, things. man. This is the, 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 yeah, so being, what, what, what like, did you have coffee this morning? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. So, so no, no, dot no import CSV. The okay. computer name. Oh, man. Oh, and, and, and... Yeah, the file name. Okay, so... Um, oh, it's C colon computer. Okay. Uh, CSV. Yeah. And paren dot computer name. No, no, end. End parentheses. End parentheses. Oh. Oh, I'm name. an idiot. I see what you're doing. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is another way that you can... Computer name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me get, rid, get of the, rid of this. Yes. Because we don't need this. Yes. And show see, you, and see, look at what's happening. We're going to import that CSV and then grab the computer name from it. So I think you need a dollar sign in front of this. As a, uh, I think. I think. You might not be able no, to. Let's, let's, let's find let's out. Try. Yeah, this is how this you is run PowerShell, man. This is how, just oh, try yeah, it. that's perfect. It worked. Work, 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 perfect. I learned something. <laughs> That's the best part when, when when the inventor is sitting here learning something that is that oh, is great. constantly. I told you, flawed human, flawed great human product. Being. I can't so, remember any of this. So, guys, this might be a little bit easier to remember um, than doing the select. However, I want to point out that that select and that expand property you see that a lot on the internet. So yes. keep them both in mind as you're working with it. And as a last example, I just wanted to show you that uh, so that you had a copy of it. Um, a lot of people ask about this. What if I wanted to grab a certain computers um, from Active Directory? Well, if you have the Active Directory module, um, here's where I'm going to use invoke command. So I'm going to use PowerShell remoting. And inside of the parentheses, I'm going to do get ad computer. And I'm going to use the filter name like that has a C in it. So that'll get me my DC and my client computer. And I did the expand property again. And this time for the, the script block, because we're using PowerShell remoting, I just did get service. Uh, name bits, and let's see how this guy works as we'll run him. Run At least get. I think the computers are up. Oh, there we go. We had to load the module, and lo and behold, it worked just fine. So, oh, wait, so did, did, we should explain that. Why did that take so long? Oh, that's a great... It, actually, a lot of you guys that saw the other show should know the answer to this. Why did that take so long? You may have even noticed it on my screen. One of the coolest features in PowerShell v3, in my opinion. Notice I didn't have to do any kind of import of an Active Directory module. I just had the command and PowerShell dynamically imported it for me. So the first time it took a few seconds, and you probably saw the screen flash, but every time I use it now, it's already there. So. You know what I just think? We should call that virtual modules. Virtual modules. Right, because you got virtual memory. Virtual memory, you get, looks like you have the memory, and when you use it, page faults it in. This is like a virtual module. By the way, I'm making this up right now. Yeah, I didn't. Never had this thought in my life. So don't write this down that they're called virtual modules yet, because <laughs> well, that's, that's a good idea. That's <laughs> a great a cool idea. idea. We no, should have called cool. it that. It is a it, good you, idea. When you use it, it's not there, and then the system brings it in and uses it. It's just like virtual memory. And, and virtual <laughs> modules. <laughs> Go change the documentation. <laughs> yeah, we'll go back and change it. But the moral of that story also that's important is, is that when you're scripting, if you're version 3 and up, you don't have to worry about importing all these modules of all these commandlets. You just use what you need in the script when you need it, and it'll work. Because um, which, of virtual modules. Because <laughs> 
Okay, Twitter right now is alive with the new definition of virtual modules. I like that. I, I like that too. I like that too. All right, folks. Let's go on to a couple of other magical tools that you're going to need. First of all, my fifth example, the if statement. Yeah. If. It's kind of iffy. It's kind of iffy, isn't it? If this equals that. Notice we're using comparison operators that we talked about in the first version. So I'm comparing, in this case, two variables. And this is just kind of pseudocode. If this equals that, then do some stuff. In other words, if the condition is true, I want you to do some stuff. We use this all the time. So we can check for files. We can check for a path. We can check. You'll see us do it with error handling later on. Also, the if construct has um, some additional things to it. You can also do else. So take a look. If this and that, do some commands. However, if that's not the case, else, do these. So you got if and you've got else. If this is true, do this. If not, else do that. But we also have else if. Now, else if confuses the bejeebies. Really? Well, because it's if this, do these, else if this other condition, do this, else if some other condition, I, I, get, I start getting confused with the, the, the conditions. Yeah, here's the way to think about it. If imagine you wanted to do this some other way, what you'd end up having to do is in the else, you have to move everything in a block. And then else, move else, it in. Uh, and else. so it just like goes out there. And so else if just says, yeah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're, we're not going to make it complicated. Now, guys, I do want to show you that. And I have an example down here for you to check out if you want to check out the, the if and else. You're going to see us use it a ton today, so you can run that example, but I want you to kind of notice, since I'm one of these guys that get confused by this, there is another um, way of doing an if statement. Now, it's okay to do multiple ifs. If this, do this. If this, then do that. If the else if starts to kind of confuse you, there's also something called a switch. And, and actually, if I have to do multiple ifs, I kind of am a switch kind of guy. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a happy switch kind of guy. So take a look at this. This Calling Dr. Freud. <laughs> hey, you know, whatever it takes. You know, 110, 220. So um, here's the, uh, the uh, 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 keyword for it. It's called switch. And I'm going to switch on a variable. So I'm going to check this variable. This is, uh, and notice I've got multiple um, sets here that I can do. This is a little bit easier for a lot of folks mentally um, when they, they're thinking about what I'm checking. So in this case, I'm checking status. And if the status is OK, that's value 0. And value 1 would be if there's an error. So let's try this. Let me uh, uh, do, uh, I guess it would be ridiculous for me, status equals um, 3, just so we can see the switch run. So I've got multiple conditions in here, but it's a little bit easier to read. And so let me run this. Do, 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 do. And nothing happened. Wait a minute. When I, nothing happened. Why did nothing? Oh, control Z. Clear that out. Yeah, I got to clear this out. Because you said status text and you didn't show status text. So set, do, do dollar sign to status text at the bottom. Ah, I am such a bad person. You know, you should uh, dial into the advanced PowerShell you know, Jumpstart. I, I should They're do be teaching that, that at and... some point. So um, I should actually do that. Dollar. No, no, no. Status text. Status. Text. Text. Underbar text. Mm. Okay, great. I've screwed up my demo now. Yeah. So status is three, so we should get stat oh status underscore text. If you replay the tape from about thirty seconds ago. I know. It's it's <laughs> sorry guys. It, <sighs> so I'm gonna actually display this so you can see what's gonna happen. Status three, this is the one that's gonna get selected. And so let's see what happens here. Do 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 do. Yep, overheated. Whew! Overheated. <laughs> Now, there's two notes on this. If you're just getting started with scripting, there is an about underscore to help explain switch. And I do have to say, for people that are just getting started, sometimes switch is more confusing than the if statement. So 
While I've given you an example for switch, sometimes just doing a simple if as a comparison and then doing something is going to be the easiest way to go. And you're going to see us use lots and lots of examples of this. But wait, can I show them an alternative way to do it? Show, sure. them, the, show them the status. Oh, the okay. switch. Sorry, yeah. some switch. Okay. So you notice here you see dollar sign status under bar text equals this. Dollar sign status, blah, right, blah, blah. Right. I hate stuff like that. Visually, I'm a person that likes things really clean and nice and pithy. Pithy, because too many characters pithy? confuse me. Pithy. So here's the way I do this, because not many people uh, recognize this, but many of the uh, statements in PowerShell are assignable, which is to say, oh. now show my screen. So here, I say dollar sign status equals three, yeah? But then, check this out. What I did is I changed it. I said dollar sign status text equals switch. So do you know that? So ah, you can take this whole so, thing. Oh, yeah, this, I like that. Much cleaner. This outputs something. And what you can do is you can take the output and you can assign it to a variable. So notice how clean this is. It just has the values. Just has the values. And Ooh, so then. I, I like that a lot. Uh, overheated. Yeah, so then your scripts can be cleaner, in my view. No, so, yeah. and actually, that's but a really good But we can do the same tip. thing with ifs. With the if statements? Yeah. I think, did I delete it? So, um, let's see, do you have something here? Anyway, so here, what you could have just said is, you know, um, dollar sign x equals. Oh, and you know? then get the result yeah. out of x. Yeah, so here, uh, so dollar sign x equals uh, if. Um, dollar sign false uh, one else two yeah two <laughs> so here's the deal remember I uh, I did that script right before and screwed it up well it turned out we were like what happened there right and so if you go to my monitor you'll see this is what had happened Right, so I tried to run this and said can't be validated. But my earlier demo, I had added a validation requirement. Remember, I said dollar sign x, and I could say it could only be a, b, or c. So that worked. But if I did this, it, it didn't work. So that was going was going on there. So basically, here dollar sign y, dollar sign y. Execute those, and it works. Yay, voila. Yay. Okay, so that's. So that's the case of the unexplained what the heck. Yeah, actually got explained. And somebody actually in the chat rooms also remembered that it was you because you had done the validate yeah. set. So good job. Pretty smart group out um, there. Guys, I want to catch you up in the slides because we're going to do loops and then we're going to start scripting some cool stuff. So just if you take a look at mine, we've done variables, quotation marks, uh, object members and variables, which you have all the scripts for, uh, parentheses, so you have all of that. And we've done if statements and switches. Now... I want to do something more than once, therefore I want to loop, and I'm a loopy kind of guy. So let's do a little loopy, loopy, loopiness. First of all, some of the basic loops. Jeffrey, I'm a do loop kind of guy. Yeah? Oh, good. I don't use it that often, but guys, take a look. We have a keyword called do, and what's ever inside of the brackets we're going to do while some condition is met. Now I want you to notice that I'm starting up here before the do loop, dollar sign i equals one. And then I'm going to do stuff. And then as long as dollar sign I is less than five. So this will loop through un uh, until um, dollar sign uh, is less than or equal to five. Well, now here's the thing about some of these uh, loops. You need to have a way of incrementing while you're running. Or if you don't have a way of incrementing, what will happen is the loop will run forever in this case. As a matter of fact, uh, we just you know you can just see by a fumble. Sure, sure you want to do that? Yeah. See, it's it's actually continuously running. I'm going to go up here, and this is a great time to show you the stop button. <laughs> because what's happening is it dollar sign i is set to one, and it's it's always going to be less than five. So it just keeps doing it over and over again. This is what the incrementer is for. And let me just show you what it means. Dollar sign I equals dollar sign I plus one. In other words, I'm going to increment I by one every time that it loops so that eventually it falls out of condition. Now, I do want to show you the shortened version of this, right? Because nobody's going to type dollar sign I equals dollar sign I plus one. Lots of people do. Well, yeah, but I guess lots better. of people do, yeah. So the shorter version of this 
is dollar sign i plus plus and you're going to see that a lot and that means increment by one now yes you can increment by other values as well but watch what happens now with the loop and let me clear the screen down here so you can see the do loop runs ta-da yeah you can't do that what do you mean i can't do that i just did that no the plus plus two no no what was the uh um, you do plus equals do two. Plus equals two. Thank yeah. you. Plus equals two. Thank <laughs> I thought you. Thought you were teaching me something oh, I didn't no, no. know. <laughs> Did you know? You have coffee there. I Just have coffee. Feel free yes. To sip. <laughs> Thanks. So, besides the do loop, you also have a while loop, and this is a, a similar uh, uh, setup. So dollar sign i equals five while this condition is 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 met, and notice in this case I decremented instead of incremented. So. The do and the while loops are, are good loops that you can use, and there's about underscore help files for all of these. However, the super cool loops that we use a lot are things like for each. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for each is, is the deal. So here's the thing. I want you to think about this. You're getting a list of something. In this case, I'm going to be getting a list of services. Every computer, you don't know exactly how many services are on there. The problem with the dual do in the while loop is you, you kind of have to know how many times you want to do this. Well, if I get service, I don't know if there's 200 services, if there's 50 services. So what I want is I want a loop that will go through each one of those services. And then when it runs out, the loop knows to stop. And that's one of the things that for each does. And so as a great example, we're going to use for each a lot today. So, yeah, by the way, uh, you might want to do get service B star just so you have a smaller set. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good idea. Name B star. Oops. Yeah. So and we'll so just do, we'll just do this for the services beginning with B. I'll run that. And now I want to go through that and display their name. So take a look at the, the structure for this. For each. Now, this is the tricky part. Dollar sign service in, and I like to say this in English, in the collection of services. In this case, where you're storing your collection of objects, we want just one thing at a time out of it. And this allows us to reference it. So dollar sign service, or some people like to use the word dollar sign item in whatever the collection is. Mm. And that'll give us a way to iterate through it. So dollar sign service, notice it's the one object at a time dot display name. And I'll run the loop and you'll see. Bink. There we go. Got a short little list of services. Yeah, by the way, I find that uh, that's th th that works fine, but I often find it a little bit confusing. Dollar sign service versus services. So yeah. often in these sort of things, I'll just say dollar sign. I use the first letter of the thing. So oh. I'll say dollar sign S in dollar sign services. So you, in other words, you yeah. shorten it to this, yeah. which does make a, it makes a, a lot of sense to have it. And then, you know, you see dollar S services, and that just reads a little bit a It little bit reads cleaner. a lot better. What a great yeah. point. And we're definitely about readability as we start to script. So I really like that. That's a great tip. When it gets more complex and you have a lot of things going on, it doesn't work as well. But for short little for short things, things, it works fine. That's awesome. We also have a for loop. Um, and a for loop is a nice way, a lot of times used to replace a, a do or a while loop, and it gives us a nice structure. So for a dollar sign i equals zero, notice different from when we were doing the do while loops, I had to set what i was here, and then I put an incrementer or a decrementer, and here's my condition. On a for loop, it's all in one place. Dollar sign i equals zero, here's the condition, i is less than five, and here's the incrementer. So it's easier to troubleshoot this kind of loop than a do or a while loop, and this will loop through. And Jeffrey was showing us this earlier, the range operator can be used to do some looping across the pipeline, and this is it's kind of neat. Um, the range operator, he's already done a great demonstration of it, so you know I'm not gonna be able to do one better, but here's a great thing that I would like that um, for one through five, I'm gonna pipe this to for each object, and what I'd like to happen is to start calculator. I know this is a stupid example. I'm just saying, but this is this is good. This shows you the range operator. It actually is. It, it makes a very good point, which is to say the pipeline. You pipe objects to a thing. The thing doesn't have to do anything with the objects. Yeah. I mean, often that's the thing that makes most sense, but you don't have to. So here, you're just saying start calculator. It had nothing to do with the integers. Had nothing to do with the integers, and this is a loop. So I'll run it, and I'll get. Yeah, a whole bunch of 
calculators out there. So why don't you, why, why don't we kill the um, calcs? There they go. And so those are our loops. Yeah. Folks, using this information, let's go back to the slides here so that we can be all caught up. Using this information of our looping constructs, do and while, which are a little bit more complicated, but there are more refined loops for each. We're going to use a lot. You've got for loop and you've got the range uh, uh, incrementer, which uh, Jeffrey's already done a great demonstration on. We are now in position to start to really make something. Now, I, I, I want to point out that this, the, the linguistic stuff that we've been doing is necessary, and it's something that you have to practice with and you have to play with. But now we're going to step kind of away from that, and now we're going to start making reusable tools. And we're going to be using these components inside. And everything that we've talked about this morning, whether it was as a review or you know, the stuff about variables, all of that, it's, you're going to see it all tie together. This is the exciting part where we make stuff, and he's looking at me like, well, nope. then get on with the exciting part. Yes, okay. <laughs> I just want to point out and remind you that uh, we have great uh, uh, people in the chat room that can answer any of your questions. So if you have any questions like, what did they say or what did that mean, just go to the chat room and answer them there, or ask them there, and you'll get some answers. Or you can answer them. All right, let's get started into our third module. We're going to start going, uh, making simple scripts and functions here. This is going to be totally wickedly cool because now we're going to take a, take a command, take any command you want, the ones that uh, I have in the demos or any command that you want, and we're going to start to turn it into a script for automation. We're going to start to use variables. We'll parameterize it. This will be making a parameterized script. And then and we're going to keep the parameters really simple right now, and then we're going to start to turn it into a function. And, and run it as a function and test the function. This is going to become more and more like a tool for us. So let's get started here. First of all, turning commands into scripts. Now, what I'm going to do is two things and to cut down a little bit on the typing. First of all, guys, this is uh, module three, so no, I don't want to save any of that. So I'm going to go out and launch my ooh, do, 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 do. startup Sorry. here. But here's, here's a great way to get started with this. I'm going to just start with a blank slate, first of all, so you get the concept. This concept is really simple. Get it to work at the console, and then paste it in, and there's the start to your script. So mm. if I do something like get WMI object, or, or you can get uh, sim instance uh, if you're on version 8 or server 2012, and we'll do class win32 underscore bios and computer name dc comma client hit enter yay it works so when something works if you know you're going to need it and to do it again then why not just make a script out of it now you know that right now all i have to do is save this and i can run this i can just go file save Save as, and I'll, I'll go out here into uh, my scripts folder and um, save this and do, uh, we'll T. call it T. T, T, T. I like that, T. <laughs> That's actually a great tap. <laughs> T. And if I want to run this, there's two ways I can do this. I, I can do it from within here, but a lot of times I like to run it from the console because as we start making tools, that's where the tools will be run from. So I like to check them there. So I'm going to uh, go into my scripts folder and um, t, uh, dot <laughs> slash. Dot slash t, and voila. What? I, yeah, yeah woohoo, we've made a script. <laughs> I know. I know you're not that impressed, but I want you to see what the issue is, right? We've made a script, and this is cool. This is, this is great. For, we've started the journey. We've started the journey. And this is neat, but what if I need to do different computers? And what if I need to do... And what if you wanted this? You're not going to want to look at... T. Because I already have one. Yeah, well, first, <laughs> first of all, you don't want it named T. And you're not going to want it um, using the computers DC and client. Mm. be nice if I made this a little bit nicer for you, since you're a nice guy. And so let's start making it a little bit nicer. 
So if you take a look at my first example here, I'm going to use a, a whatever example you want to use. I'm going to use um, a Win32 logical disk. And if you were joined us for the first one, this one down here looks scary, but what I'm doing with Win32 logical disk is I'm just grabbing the C drive from a computer called localhost, and uh, I'm selecting certain properties that I want to see. The scary part for a lot of people, and you need to practice this to get used to it, but definitely get used to it. I'm doing my own custom column here of size and gigabytes. In other words, there's a property called size and free space, and they're in bytes, and I don't like that long looking number. So I've decided to improve it. And just as an example, I'll run it so you can see it. And this is what uh, an example that we ran in the last one. I need to clear this. Oops, wait a minute. Sorry, I really messed that one up. Oh, stop it. There we go. I need to go down here and clear this because that's still on the screen so you can see what the results are. So I'm going to start off with a slightly more complicated command. And as you can see, it comes up and it gives the computers. And for some reason, I don't have my free space showing up. But, um, oh, it's because I forgot a comma. So let me try this. Da, 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 da. Ding. There we go. So you can see that for client in this case, there's a size and it's in gigabytes. So these are the calculated properties or custom columns. Now, when you have your own command, you might be looking at it and going, okay, well, there's a few things in here that I know somebody's going to want to change. When I, when I give this yeah. to you, you're going to want to change the computer name. You might even want to change, you know, I've got it set hard-coded for drive C and stuff like that. You know, you might want to check it for something else. So the first thing you want to do is start to identify things that you would like to replace with a variable to make your life easier. This is where we're going to start making our variables. And in an example too, here's a great, here's, well, and an example. Here's where I've done device ID and I've said, you know what? I'm thinking that maybe somebody else might want to specify a different drive letter than C. Maybe they want to do a different computer name. So I've created these variables. Now, all I've done so far is, is I, so that I could test, I went up here and I filled those variables out. I want you to notice that I did put in the type here in front of it client and C. And so I'm going to run this. I'm going to click the green arrow to run it and notice the information that I'm getting from this. So it's C, it's on the client and I'm getting, so everything's working perfectly. Okay. Now you guys, and I mean you smart guys, <laughs> if this was another language, the concept of parameterizing my script becomes a challenge and I have to start dealing with arguments and dealing with stuff that is sometimes mentally challenging, you guys made it really easy for us to make parameters. I've got a simple script where I've identified some variables and I want to make it, I want to turn them into parameters. Yes. So how simple did you make it? It's totally simple. So basically there's a couple ways to do it. Well, if you're starting from scratch, he's going to show you parameters. But if you're an old Unix guy uh -oh. uh, and you're used to dollar sign args, we support dollar That's sign right. args. If you don't know what I'm talking about, pay no attention to me. <laughs> Listen to him. <laughs> but if you're an old Unix guy and you're familiar with dollar sign args, dollar sign args of zero or dollar sign args of one, that works perfectly. Yeah, it does. <laughs> but we're not going to show you that because we're going to show you the way you should do it. Well, and I do want to point out, you will see dollar sign args used in scripts that yes. you'll see on the internet. And it is supported and it does work. And for you Unix people, here's what we're going to do is they've done this amazing job of, I'm going to put in a keyword called param, open parentheses, and then a close parentheses. Now, there's a couple of style notes I want to point out here. This is going to start to be hard to read. So what we want to do is... We want to indent this. So I'm going to indent this so Jeffrey loves me. And it makes it easier to read. Now, I also want you to notice I've got a little red squiggly up here. Because what this wants is comma separated. So I need to put a comma in here between my two variables. So, so far, I've done one thing. Param, put a comma in there. I'm going to run this. Yes, go ahead and save it. And I get the same result because these are acting as defaults. But watch this. I'm going to run this as if I was running the script from the console, and this is called uh, number two. 
Magic. Ready for magic? 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 Dash. Magic? Dash. Look Ooh. at that. Parameter. Yep. Parameter, parameter. Now, if you saw the last episode, you, you've seen us do this, but I can't get over how cool and how easy this is. You can add any variable you want. So look at what you've done as a solution, what you want to change to being variables so somebody else can use them as parameters, and then all you have to do is put them up in, in the param block. You've just started your, down the route of making a parameterized script, but this is starting to become a tool. I mean, I could give this to you, except that it, oh, it's not called T. <laughs> um, I could give this to you, and you could put in your own computer. So let's put in computer S1. Yeah. And there we go. We got it from computer S1. So we're down the road of using parameters. Now, parameters are actually, let me go to demo number three here. Um, See this thing that I've got? Uh, I, parameters are working, but what is the point to this thing called commandlet binding? Why do you always see people put that in? Yes, yeah, so this is that next click in formalization. This is where you really transform a function into a full commandlet. Now, full commandlet is the real deal. So you'll see that, uh, well, when you, when you show tab completion or uh, IntelliSense, you're going to see a ton of extra variables that aren't defined here. This, when you put this commandlet binding, you're telling the PowerShell engine, please do a whole bunch of work for me. Right. And also, it, it, it's making sure that um, it's checking that what I'm putting in are actual arguments for the parameters and not letting me go crazy and add in all kinds of stuff. So this is actually something that's very important for us to add. Now, also, as we start adding attributes for the parameters, the attributes don't work unless you have that in, right? I mean, mandatory does, but there's a lot of the attributes that we have to have in. So mm, commandlet binding I is... still work. You think they still work? Yeah. Yeah, I thought there was the ones that didn't work. Oh, I, I could be wrong. No, I could be wrong. It's one of those two things. <laughs> so here's the thing. Well, let's see. Again, we'll vote. I, I'll bet you it's me. Well, no, it's, again, <laughs> the, that's, that's the lesson here. The lesson is you don't have to know all this stuff. Just try it. And if it works, then it's supported. Absolutely. And if it doesn't work, well, maybe you're doing it wrong, but chances are it's not. Chances are it's not. Yeah. So we've got commandlet binding in here, param. That gets our parameters set up. And let me uh, go ahead and catch us up in the slides so that you, everybody knows where we're, we're actually going to be at. So we've chosen our variables that we want to parameterize, we put them in there, we added param, and now we've added commandlet binding. So far, so good. Now what we're going to do is, um, now that we've parameterized the script, is let's talk about the difference between a parameterized script and a function, though. Because all we've done right now is, yeah. I've got this script, yeah. but I'm, I'm still, oops, and I keep doing that, I need to stop doing that. CLS, when I'm running this, I'm still having to type it in like this. Yes. And I'm still, you know, this is cool. This is cool. But wouldn't it be nice if it looked, oops, wait a minute, that was the wrong one. <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if it looked more like, um, you know, a commandlet. It looked more like a commandlet. Yes. And it seemed to feel more like a commandlet. Yes. And what if you wanted to have more than one of them in a file? If you wanted to have more than one of them in a file. So I'm going to go to disk info. Because otherwise you can get a lot of files. A lot, a lot, a lot of files. A lot of them. And so very simply, just with this one, we can go keyword is function. And now we could call this anything, right? We could just yeah. call it foo. Yeah. We, and, and we could go like this, put or in an t. open squiggly. Or we could, oh, let's do, let's call it T. There's no alias for T, right? No. <laughs> I would have known that one. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Um, and down here, I notice I'm going to go to the end of my code, and we'll go here, and we'll close that. So I've got a function called t, and take this, and right now we'll just leave it, and I'm going to go yeah. ahead and run that. Yes, stop asking me, just do it. So it ran it. So I should be able to come down here and go t. Ooh. See how easy that was? Ah! <laughs> watch, watch, watch. If you're testing, when you start using functions and you're going to test, a lot of times you're going to go to the console and you're going to go, well, gee whiz. Um, oh, yes. Uh, I'm going to run my script. Oh, CD scripts. Um, and I forgot where I put it. 
Uh, there we go. Um, and it's called, I'm going to run my script. Notice this is the, the three params PS1. And I'm going to say T. Oh. Now, you explained this to me the last time, but, you know, I'm a little dense. Yes. Now, I think of it as this way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> I think of it as this way. I think of it as... I ran my script, the function got loaded, but when the script ended, everything dies. Variables, everything gets cleaned out. We clean out. up. Exactly. We clean Which up. Which is a good thing. Yeah. But how do I Unless test my function? Unless you want to. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, yeah and, so basically, we, this is what we call a stack. So basically, a stack's an important concept. It says, hey, here's where I find my stuff. And so when you execute something new, what happens is we go and we create a new stack, and anything it creates is done in there. And then when it exits, we pop that stack. Now, the interesting thing is that when you create the stack and you try and access something that's not there, we first look for it there. And if it's not there, we then look up the stack and up the stack and up the stack. That's called dynamic variables, OK? Dynamic scoping of variables. Now, um, again, so the problem you had here was you had a stack. We said, I'm going to execute something. You created a new stack. You define something, right. but then when you exited, it went away. It went away. So it turns out there's a way to execute something, but not create a new stack. And it's called dotting. And this is going to be very important. So That's I dot want you like to see, dot. Dot. And I, wanna, I want you guys to see this, because when you're testing a script that has a function in it, we haven't made a module yet. We're not going to till the end of the day, because we've got cool stuff for that. But when you're testing, you need to make sure you dot then dot and run your script, and this will keep it loaded. Now watch, T will now, woohoo! Right, so it, it, it executed the code in the current scope, and then when you exit, we don't throw it away. And one of the oh, interesting... The downside yeah. of that is that you can contaminate your environments. By the way, this is how profiles work. Somebody in the chat room asked about profiles. I don't think we're planning to talk about profiles. No, but we could always. So, okay, yeah. so basically profiles are scripts that get run at the beginning of every session. It's dollar sign profile, and there's four of them uh, mm -hmm. for each host, and whether it's for you or all users. And this is code that we dot source to set up your environment. So this is where you set up your favorites and, and functions that you're going to use all the time. You put them in this one script, and then at the beginning of every session, we dot source these files, these profiles. Now, here's where people will get confused. You're testing it, and you get used to doing dot sourcing, or you might be testing in the ISC, and I want you to notice, mm. I didn't have to do that. I didn't have to do any of that. I just ran it, and it just worked. So the ISE is great because you don't have to do the dot sourcing, but then when you go out to actually start testing, you'll forget about it. So it's, you got to keep it straight. Inside the ISE, we're good, but then when you go out to run the script, and we'll do it enough, you have to dot source it until we make a module, which will be awesome. Yeah, or more commonly, what will happen is you'll dot source it and you'll run it, and then you'll go and you'll change a bunch of things and you'll save it and you run it again, and you don't see the, the, your, your changes. The answer is because you already dot sourced it, so you're running the old version. So every time you change it, you're going to have to dot source it again. And, every and then it'll time. replace. Yeah. And, and so, guys, what I'd like to do is I'm going to show you. I've got something here called Disk Info that I've given you, which is notice I call this T. That's not very commandlet like. So on Disk Info, I wanted to make it a little bit more commandlet like. So notice I just gave it, you know, get dash disk info. Um, which now it, it has a proper verb, so we know we're going to get some information, and we know that the noun is going to be disk info. So that was easy. Now you still see that I have parameters. Notice that I've, I've added a, uh, uh, one in here, and this was because we showed it to you in the, the last one. This is a parameter attribute. We're going to talk more about other attributes, but mandatory means you're required to fill this in. And so I've got a computer name and a drive, and I have basically the same line. But what I've done is I've used my nicer one that, that formats, see, look at those ugly, it's just big numbers like that scare me. So this will make it into gigabytes, which will be much easier to read. And that's all I've done. So I, I'm going to run this, and now it's going to start to look like, and I'll clear that, I, stop doing that, because then I break things. Yes. I'm going to go over here and do get disk, oh, see, see? And Ooh. computer name's now mandatory, so I'll put in DC. 
and then I get all of the information back. Again, don't forget, if you're going to test this from the console, you got to dot source it, and now you've got the start of what looks like a commandlet. In fact, it looks so much like a commandlet at this point. Let me go over here and just run it. I'm going to call up uh, disk info ps1, get disk, inf uh, disk info, computer name, DC, and you notice anything that I put in there, I have. So I have other commandlet binding has now given me verbose and these things that we're going to be working with today. Do output variable, just so you oh, show them. Do out variable and dollar sign var? No. Oh, var, 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 var. thanks. And now that output Da -da, is in a variable. So out variable is actually really cool to use with commandlets. And so with commandlet binding, we now get all of those extra tools that we, you know, wow, right. you I didn't, didn't do pay any work. for it. I didn't, I didn't pay for this. I didn't work for this. Exactly. PowerShell does it for you. Um, oh, in the chat room, somebody asked, yeah. okay, so now that you've dot sourced us, uh, what if you want to get rid of it? My friends, that's the thing about dot sourcing. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> Actually, there's some way you can go clean it up, but maybe, like, I can show you how to go into functions and clean it up. In fact, I will because it's so cool, but, but this isn't really the, the correct solution. So here, let's, let's do it. Where, where is it? Okay, so I'm going to dot source this. Okay, so, okay, so I've just dot sourced that. Uh, now, there's something. If you know about the drives, get PS drive. Okay, PS Drive shows you all the drives on the system. Now these drives, there's the C drive and the D drive, the drives uh, you're familiar with. Yeah, I don't think we yeah. talked about this earlier, but there's other drives in PowerShell. So we have the alias drive, the certificate drive, uh, HKL, HKCU and HKLM, the registry, okay? So there's a rich set of stuff. Go have fun and explore. But in particular, there's something called function. So now I can do a dir function do the drive, and you'll see get disk info. Yeah. So what I could do is I can say, you know, basically remove <coughs> item function get disk info, and and I get rid of it. I get uh, well get disk info. You see, it's gone. Now the downside is, well. Did I get rid of everything? And the answer is maybe, maybe not. So mm -hmm. this is the downside of dot sourcing scripts, and that's why we invented modules, which are coming up later. Yeah, absolutely. I also want to show you, a, to, to also answer that question, if you're testing in the console and you want it clean of all <laughs> variables and you want it clean of all of the script functions that you've been building, just close it. Yeah. And then open up a new one. Um, <laughs> or or, or uh, control T. Do you know about that? No, it's control T. You didn't do control T? No, okay, it's so control go, go T. To mine. Okay, so here we go. You have all this stuff. Look, you remember how you had that dollar sign X equals and and I couldn't oh I, I guess I fixed that. Anyway, <laughs> so, I did it. Anyway, so uh, you have a mess here. Control T brings you up a second run space. Oh, so yeah, you get so a whole nother. I've got a whole nother environment. So you know dollar sign so dollar sign X here, and I come to here. Dollar sign X it says, "What are you talking about? Don't yeah, have a dollar sign." Know. Yeah, so it's a completely different environment using the same GUI. Now, a couple of style features for you. Notice the indentations that I've done here. This actually becomes a best practice and very important. It helps you read and therefore troubleshoot your scripts a lot better. It also makes it and you know, there's a lot of conversation about this. The maintainability of your script becomes very important because you might not be the only one that needs to work on this. So you want to make it easy to read. So notice how I've indented things here. We're going to be practicing more with indentation just to make it, you know, look pretty and make it easier to read. There's more, though, that I could do with this script. So I've got one script with one function in it, but here's the cool part. There's one tool. Maybe I want another tool. Well, I could put in another function, and we'll call it get cool or, or something like that, and another function, and get more cool. And as a matter of fact, I gave you an example. I think I called it jump tools over here, where I have just that, the initial function, and then, oh, looky. Some I called him really. I called him Get Jason Fun. I, I, what was I thinking when I did? But here's the moral of the story. So, 
First of all, I want you to notice the collapsy capabilities here to help you see things. Maybe I don't want to see the param block, so I can just collapse that and I can reopen it when I want to look at it. I don't want to look at this function right now. I want to see the other functions so I can collapse that. See how it's easy for me to take a look at it? Now, in this case, I've got a script that's got three functions in it. Well, let's run it and let's see here. Really? Did I call it get JSON fun? I certainly did. And voila. So you're now starting to create a script of parameterized functions that are kind of becoming a tool set for you. A tool set. A yes. toolbox. A very nice little toolbox. So. Wait, can I interrupt a second? Oh, absolutely. So uh, earlier, Jason showed you a script. And if you show my machine, I'll show you that. OK. And um, notice it had computer name and it defaulted to the value client. It turned out client, J on Jason's machine, he has a virtual machine whose name is, is client. So you at home, none of that worked for you. Oh yeah, yeah, you yeah. gotta change So you, to in general, you type local host. So that was what was going on there. Was that a question that was, it was going to, uh, really? Intuited. Uh, intuited that it was happening out there. So yeah, yes. guys, go ahead and use localhost um, instead of my particular machine names. Yeah, in so there. if you see things like DC1, DC, client, client, S1, S2. Those are all his VMs. Yeah. And so you'll do, do something different for your machine. Insert your own computers there or localhost if you just got um, one box. Yeah. Notice the example for disk info that I have up right now. I've removed the default values and I made computer name mandatory. So you have to type in whatever your computer is anyways. And of course you can type in localhost and in the jump tools. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's see what I did in here. I think I get in my param block. I think, yep, I got rid of it and had it mandatory in here. So hopefully you won't run into too many issues with that. Well, Jeffrey, this is a nice parameterized script, but yes, you know, is. there's this isn't really an advanced function yet. So, no. so here's what we're gonna do. Let me catch up in slides, because we're gonna go to a new module and we're gonna start to turn this into something called an advanced function. Ooh, the name is scary. So functions, creating parameters, got that. We've shown you how to run them and to work with them. Make sure you're putting in your questions. Now, on to module four, advanced functions. So before our, we're calling it a meal break, right? We're gonna get started meal with advanced break. functions before our meal break. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about the purpose to advanced functions. In other words, I'm gonna ask Jeffrey questions about it. <laughs> Show you an advanced function template and the parts of an advanced function. It's not much harder than what we've been working with. We'll show you how to create and test parameters, some more parameters, and then where your code should go. And then something really cool, getting stuff out to the pipeline. In other words, we're going to start turning this into a pretty doggone cool tool. So first of all, the purpose to advanced functions. Now, we've already talked about this a little bit, but this is, this is me being able to make something that looks like commandlets. Yes. And that's important for me to make my own little toolboxes and to make as we're going to bundle them into modules later on. Mm -hmm. So when you originally wrote the manifesto, and I got to get me one of those. I got to get me a manifesto. Um, the was was this already kind of in your mind at the time that me as an admin, I'm going to be able to create these? They, they look and feel just like commandlets? From, yeah, we from the were beginning. always super, super clear about this distinction between <clears throat> um, the experience and the implementation. Okay? And you see that everywhere, right? In the, remember I showed you in the previous session, variables is a syntax, but in fact you could store variables in the file system. Right, crazy stuff like that. Yeah. And so we knew that we were going to have commandlets, which was a high-level task-oriented experience for the user. But then how that got implemented, we un knew that there were going to be lots of different ways to implement it. And that's what you've seen. Right. So in version one, the only way you could implement it was in .NET. We had functions, but they weren't really commandlets. 
In PowerShell version 2, we made commandlets available through uh, PowerShell, and this unleashed the, the power of the masses. Oh, boy. And then in version 3, you saw that you can implement it in .NET, PowerShell, or Windows Workflow. That's right, Windows Workflow technology can be commandlets. Or you can do uh, WMI, and so that's native code. Well, and, and one of the cool things about this is, is if you take a look at my screen here, they're, they're not the same as compiled commandlets. And here's what's not the same about them. I didn't have to learn C Sharp and use Visual <laughs> Studio. That's what's not the same about them. In other words, if you wanted to make commandlets before, you had to you had to be more of a dev, and and it, there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, I'm an IT guy. I've got an, I'm learning a lot as I'm going. So this makes it a lot easier. They're not the same, but they are just perfect for us as, as IT pros because we're making great looking commandlets, and we want to respect the the best practices for that. I also want you to notice on my screen the get help, and I, I could actually run this, uh, but there's a lot of help of everything that we're going to be doing today. And I'll just do get help for you guys on function. There's a lot of help files out here that walk you through everything that we're going to be talking about. So everything that we're going to be doing with the parameters, the parameter validation. So everything we show you is written out for you. So keep that in mind when you're like, oh, what, what, what was this or what was that? It's all there in the help. Now to get started with this, we're going to show you a little bit different kind of template for this. Now, I've given you one that I started off really easily. And let me open up for uh, Module 4 here, CD Module 4, and my startup script. I want you to take a look at this simple little template that I've made up. And, and Jeffrey, I'm, I'm, I'm confused by a few things. Okay, okay. here's function. Yep. Now, we're going to talk about comment-based help. I just have it there right now. Yep, yep, um, yep. Function, verb dash noun. What I wanted to do was make a template that I could easily use to remind me of the things I needed to put in. Commandlet binding needs to be there and parameter. And so I know that I'm going to want parameter and I'm going to have some variables in here that I'm going to want to use. So I just put them into my template. But here's some other strange things that are in my template. The begin, process, and end. We, we've never seen this before. Yes. And I don't, I mean, why is this in my template? What is, what is begin, process, and end? I don't, well, again, this is on? one of the big distinctions between a function and a, and a commandlet. Commandlet's a full <coughs> commandlet, and it deals with the, <laughs> with the pipeline. So honestly, the best way to get this in focus is to just experiment. As always, the best way to get things in PowerShell in focus is to experiment. So let, let's party with that. So here, the way I do this is I'll just go and I'll, I'll take this and I'll put in some code. I'll say begin, and then I'll say process. Oh, this is awesome, yeah. And I'll say end, okay? So then I'll just execute it and see what happens, okay? Okay, so then we say uh, verb, verb dash noun. Begin, process, end. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, well, so, so let me, what's let me, up with that? So, yeah, so what we've got is these code block sections, and apparently the begin ran once, process ran once, and end ran once. Yeah. Am I with you so far? Pretty exciting. Yeah, I know, pretty exciting. <laughs> okay, so, okay, go ahead. Okay, so now let's experiment some more. So first, we've got two parameters. That's too many, right? So let's simplify. Let's just do with one, my string, right, just to be simple. Okay, and now what I'm going to do is we're going to say dollar sign my string. String. By the way, see why dollar sign T works? Yeah, <laughs> a lot less typing. Okay, and let's provide that as a variable. Verb, noun, minus my string, test. Okay, so it's available everywhere. So again, still okay. no, 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 not much of a distinction. But now, let's do this. Let's say, um, uh, parameter, what is it? Value from, uh, from pipeline. pipeline. Am I doing this right? equals dollar sign true. true. Okay, so now what that says is, I'm gonna say, 
you know, one dot dot three pipe two verb dash noun. Okay, and what I said here was, you're going to get into this in detail. Yes. Okay, but what I said was, I want to get the pipeline, this string from the pipeline. So that says I'm going to have values one, two, and three that then get sent to verb.noun, and they're going to be assigned to this. So now let's see how that works. Ah. Oops, wait a minute. Okay, my addition. Oh, oh, sorry. I did this wrong. It's not parameter. Oh, that's. There That's we go. what he didn't like. <laughs> oh, so no, now no. check this out. Yeah. So notice now begin does not. Where's my string? It's not defined. Right. Right. Why? And the answer is because my string is now coming from the pipeline. Coming from the pipeline. But now notice here, I don't get one process. I get three processes. Why did I get? Why do I get three of them here? Because it gets called process, that script gets called once for every object in the that loop. comes through the, the that comes down that pipeline, right? So every object that comes down the process code block is going to run once. once for each single object. Exactly. So now check this out. Now let's not make this a string. Let's make this an integer. And let's just call it x. Okay, and here, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, now, what the begin block? The begin block is about setting up code necessary to establish, uh, to do your processing. So imagine you say, I'm going to want to okay. total all the integers. So I'm going to say dollar sign total, dollar sign total equals zero. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a set of integers here. And so I'm going to say dollar sign total plus equals dollar sign x. Okay. So for every object that comes through. And then when I'm done, what do I want to do? And the answer is here I say total equals dollar sign total. Okay. So again, I'm going to pipeline a set of things, right? One to, you know, set of integers to this. This is going to run once, so I initialize a total. Then this is going to get called every single time where I take the value from the pipeline and I assign it here, and then I run this code. Awesome. So I increment it. And then when I'm done, when I'm fully complete, I call this. Okay, so let's run it. And then six. Cool. Do that. 15. By the way, so this begin process end, imagine that instead of totaling something, I was going to add a set of things to a SQL database. Okay? So mm -hmm. I got a bunch of objects and I'm going to add them to a SQL database. In the begin, that's where you create your connection to the SQL database. Then the process, you add row, add row, add row, add row, add row, and end is where you close, clean up. you clean up. So this is actually kind of structuring our code a little bit for us. Um, the begin, as you said, is where we could do connections to SQL. Um, we could be calling up uh, other .NET objects, instantiating those that we want to use, then process, process, process. Right. And then we close everything down with the uh, uh, end. It's like, are you, do you ho do hobbies? Hobbies? Yeah, like, uh, you know what? Well, like, I, imagine you're going to... Oh, well, there you go. If you were like a tool maker, right, do something with there. What you do, you're going to do a project. What you first do is you set up your tool bench. Okay, I got my saw, my, you know, you get all your tools there. Then you do the work. Then you clean up. Well, that's what begin process end is. Begin. Set up your toolbox. Get everything ready. Okay. Then do your work, do your work, do your work, do your work. And when you're done, you clean things up. Perfect. So let me give you a real life example of why this is so important, uh, especially about the process block. And you've seen this before. I'm going to do get service, and what I want to do is pipe to a something else, select object, which is a commandlet. And now think about this multiple services are going to go across that pipeline, and I just want to see the property name. Now, this is going to create a long list of names, but what it's doing for me is select object is supporting in the process. It's processing it for me. So the process block gets run once for everything that gets piped to it, or if nothing gets piped to it, it still runs just once. So when we start putting in our code, 
this is where we're going to start putting in our code. Now, I want to show you something else. I like to start off with this simplified, very simple kind of template. I like to have my own simple template. This makes it really easy that when you create a one line or something that you like that is solving a problem for you, you can quickly, as you'll see me do, just throw it in here and move on. And you're making tools really fast. I do want to show you that the ISC has built in these snippets in its control J. And they're right here. Commandlet, advanced function, and complete. Now, look at the simplified one. It's, it's better than mine. It's got the begin, process, and end blocks in it. It's got some parameters, and look at what they've done. We're going to talk more about all these different types you can have in here, but here's value from pipeline. And this is by, with something else that we'll talk about by property name. And so this template is all set up for you to use. So you might want to create your own. You might want to start with this one, but make sure that you have these code blocks in here, begin, process, and end in the template, because we're going to need that. Also, dun da 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 in Control-J, by the end of the day, you're going to really like this complete one. The complete one has everything. And I know some of this stuff doesn't make sense right now. It will all make sense by the end of the day. But look at all these different parameters, different parameter validations that you're going to see us uh, use and stuff like that. So this complete one may be the one that at the end of the day you want to start. So here's your mission when we get to our meal break here, which we're coming up on. Your mission is to either create your own simple template or you start to get familiar with one of the built-in templates into the ISC. Try to Wait, think through. Oh. It's a snippet. Snippet. I keep calling it template. Yes, it's a well, snippet. Yeah, snippet. <laughs> Have some more coffee. It's, it's I good. keep calling it a template. It's a snippet. Jeez, it even says snippet. Yeah. Because when you go to, the, again, you want to think. Words matter. Words right? do that's, matter. That's the whole point. You want to think, type, get. And so if you think template, you're going to look for template and you're not going to find, find it. it. So think snippet. It's a snippet. And then when you say, oh, is there any, give me some help about snippets, you're going to see import, export, get, right. or new snippet. Absolutely. So go through a snippet, take a look at it, because I mean, pick which one you want to use for today. And make sure you understand what we're doing in here. Even go ahead and start to try out maybe some of your own code in your own parameterized script during the meal break, because we're going to take our parameterized script that we've added a function to, and now we're going to start to add the begin process end blocks and more parameter validation. In other words, we're going to start to step up what our tool can actually be. So make sure that you kind of understand the components that we've covered so far. So when we get back, it's going to start getting... Step, oh, step your tool game up step for all your you iced ice tea references. Step your tool game... Is that an iced tea reference? Oh, yeah. What's the... Is it, Step your tool game up. Oh, st <laughs> step your tool game up. Anyway, so but there's two things I want to point out here. It, great question in the chat room. Somebody asked, hey, that process block, is that uh, parallel? Does that run oh, concurrently? Yeah, 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 yeah. The answer is no. And here's the reason why. In .NET, .NET, unlike Java, uh, in Java, things are thread safe. Okay, in .NET, uh, the objects themselves are not thread safe, and therefore you, as the caller, have to uh, handle all the concurrency control. By the way, if none of this makes any sense to you, don't bother. It doesn't matter. So, um, so you have to handle concurrency control. So, in the, the programmer does. So, in this case, you are the programmer. So you would have to know when and how to handle the concurrency control, where to do the locking, et cetera. Now, that's just not at all appropriate. The, for, the, look, systems programmers, the guys I hire, they have a hard time getting this right. <laughs> no way I was going to give that to the IT the admins of the world, and we they were going to get that right. Yeah. So, so the answer is no, it isn't. Um, it is not parallel. Now, this then brings up an interesting conversation around Jason showed you, uh, like, you could do invoke command minus computer uh, blah, or you could say um, for each dollar C in computer. Let me, let me just show you that to, to draw the distinction. Let's see, do I have this up here? Okay, so there's two things you can do. You could do invoke command minus computer, you know, a get uh, content servers.txt and do some function like that or you could do for each 
dollar sign S in get content servers dot using those parentheses and, and grabbing the text yeah. file yeah uh, and do something with it there okay so either way will work but there is a huge difference and the first one is far more preferable by the way so this would be uh, invoke computer name invoke invoke command command minus computer name uh, dollar sign s, s. Okay. okay huge difference between these two this says okay I get this content and then I grab the first one and I run this when it's done I get the second one and I run this it is serial Okay, and by the way, so I just had, I was telling you about the guy I met this weekend. Yeah, There's a funny story about a guy I met this weekend who was talking about this very thing. Here's what's going to happen. Imagine one of these computers is down. Okay, then what's going to happen is you're going to get it. You're going to do this, and it's going to wait. It's going to try, and it's going to try, and it's going to try, and it's going to wait, 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 before it eventually fails and then it's going to go to the next one. So one way or the other, even if you didn't have a failure, it's serial and it takes a long time, and if you've got a failure in there, it's going to take a really long time. Here, when you do it, when you do invoke command, we, now here's the deal, we handle the concurrency control, okay? So when you say minus computer name and you get this big list, what we do is we produce three lists, the to-do list, the in-progress list, and the done list. Now, say you had a thousand servers. We go and we put those thousand servers in the to-do list, and then we have this in-progress list, right? And there we have, I think it's either 32 or 64. You get to control it if you don't like our number. Uh, outstanding entries, right? So what we do is we grab the first 32, we issue the request concurrently to all 32 of them, and they're waiting. Now, when one finishes, we take it out of that list and we put it in the done, and we grab the next one. So this acts as a sliding buffer where we have that many outstanding Which requests so operating awesome. in parallel. Exactly. And if you wanted to, you could do minus throttle limit equals 1,000 and do them all at once. But this is where you get parallelism, super powerful. We handle it for you. It's safe. And if one of those machines, like, again, I get 32 of them, if one of them stalled and it's going to take a really long time before it comes back and says, you know, I tried and I tried and I tried, but it just wouldn't work, it doesn't matter. I got 31 other things that are just going to town, crankety crank crank. So really, that's, this, this technique is far preferable. Yes, and this is the power of PowerShell remoting. So you've got to make sure you have remoting enabled, as we talked about in the last episode, because that is incredibly powerful. It's time that we start to add in some parameters, test some parameters, yep. add in our own code into the processing block, and see if we can start spitting out objects. So let's go. Here we go. Boys and girls, just to if you take a look at the slides, we just got done with the advanced function template. And what we're going to do now is move on to creating and testing your own parameters. Um, and so I have a couple of examples that I'd like to work with, and we'll dive right in here. First of all, take a look. And this is my example. And we are still on Module 4, Scripts in Module 4. Yeah, Scripts in Module 4. Yes, thank you. Module module 4. 4. So take a look at my test parameter start. I've got a couple of parameters. We've already talked about this, but I want you to notice that I've got a couple of additional things. First of all, param block. Got a computer name string. Notice the brackets for string. I've got something called a switch. This, I'm going to show you how this works. There's a lot of times that parameters are just switches. They're either on or off, and this is one of them. You, as you can tell, shortly we're going to be looking at making error logs. So I also have a parameter for an error log, and I've got a default value in for the error log. What I'd like to do is, is show you some code to test your parameters to make sure they're working, but let me show you what these look like first. I'm going to run this so that it's, it's in, now it's get comp info. So I'm going to do get help and get comp info. Now what you're going to notice is that the help system is already trying to build or help me build a very nice help file. What I'd like you to focus on right now is the syntax and take a look at computer name and see how it's string right there, string. Now, I don't know if you joined us for the first one, but this is where when we were talking about uh, reading syntax, there's a special indicator that lets you know whether you can have multiple objects or not. Well, in this script that I'm working on, I don't want to take just one computer name. 
I want multiple computer names. Now, if you join us for the first one, you see dash computer name, then inside of the Chihuahuas. Chihuahuas. That's yes. Right. Chihuahuas. Um, that's where your arguments go. And you can see that it says string because I defined it as string. But what's missing is, is there's an internal set of brackets. I call them binkies. That means we can take multiple objects. So the first thing I want to do is take a look at the modification I'm going to do on my script. I'm going to go up here and I'm going to put those bing, bing, in there. Now, when I run this and take a look at the syntax again, yeah, help. of course, I could just hit the up arrow key. And we take a look at the syntax. You can see now it's properly showing that it can take multiple objects. But danger, Will Robinson, and we mentioned this in the last one, is that, yeah, that means it can take uh, multiple things now, but we now have to handle that in our script. So I want to show you a couple of things. I want to show a cool way to test for switches and a cool way to handle it, whether you're getting the multiple objects and it seems to be working correctly. And, and, and Jeffrey, you can help me out with this because mm, this is one of these weird things. Take a look at a test parameter end yep. PS1. Guys, this is the same thing. Let me go up here and put my... Look what I'm doing here in the begin block. And I put it in here just so you can see a good example of putting something in begin. Mm. And I want you to take a look at the, 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 the if statement. See this switch up here, switch error log, if error log. This means is it on or is it not on? So you can see if error log has been selected, then write verbose, error logging is turned on, else write verbose, error logging turned off. In order to use write verbose, which I think is the greatest documentation thing yeah, in the yeah, world. Yeah. So in a lot of uh, uh, older scripting that I used to do, you would you would write things out, and then you would have to go back and comment everything out or, yes. or remove stuff. But write verbose is fantastic because we can turn that feature itself on or off, right? Yep. And so here's the tricky part about testing this is that I want to test this if statement to see if error log switch is turned on or not. But I'm using write verbose, which means I also have to make sure I use dash verbose when I try this, or I'm not going to see a result. So let me do that one first, and then we'll come back to computer name. Um, so let me run this and show you how this looks. So this if statement now will let me test it. So get comp info. And what I'm testing right now is, is computer name isn't mandatory, but I'm going to put something in just so that it can run. And I want to show you, I want to see if error log as a, as a switch parameter is turned on, so I'm going to say verbose so that show write without, verbose. Show them without. Oh, oh, yeah, show them without. That's a good so, idea. So here's the deal. What happens without doing that? It just... And as a matter of fact, I have to tell you guys that when I was putting this simple example together, I sat there and ran it like three times and went, what? What, what, it's, why isn't it working? And then I had, to, I had to remember. That was the slow one. Not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but actually this happens a lot. You have to remember that, you know, write verbose, you need to use dash verbose. Now watch what happens. A, now, I'm going to do it without the dash error log. And I'll leave verbose on. And now you can see it tested that, it's, that, 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 that switch parameter is not turned on. This is a great way to test for it, but not only that, I can use this code later on, which is what I'm going to do, when we do set up and use an error log. So it's a nice way to test the switch parameter and its actual usable code for later. Now, the tricky part is this for each that we're going to have to do. If I want to take multiple computer names, I'm going to get multiple computer names in dollar sign computer name. Yep. I'm going to have to iterate through that. If I want to do a couple of WMI commands, yes. I'm going to have to iterate through that, and that's... Yes or no. Tricky. Yes or no. Yes. 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 So here's the thing. Remember, some of the commandlets take computer name as a collection, and right. they'll do the fan out. And they'll do it for me, right? Yeah, and other times you iterate through. And see, this so is the part. So you have some choices. Some people say, oh, well, in PowerShell, there's multiple ways to do things. And the answer is, yeah, it's yeah. good. <laughs> Which is good. But take a look at my screen. This is what we're talking about, is if I do get service, and I'll just do name bits, um, when I do dash computer names, see, he's going to take multiple computer names, and he's going to figure it all out. Well, now that we're the ones writing the tool, we have to write that intelligence in. And let me show you an example, because I'm going to use this code over and over and over again. So take a look here. For each, 
We can use Jeffrey's uh, suggestion for this, which is actually pretty cool. I called it dollar sign computer in that collection of computer names. So if I get multiple computers in there, I need to iterate through each one of them. And in this test for right verbose, I'm just saying, just print that individual computer out. Now, if you if you like that style of making this shorter. By the way, the other reason why you do that yeah. is because the previous example, you actually weren't following a best practice. Uh-oh. Because in, in PowerShell, it's best practice to not have any plurals. Everything's singular. So you'll notice it says computer name, not computer names. Right, right, right And right, the right. reason for that is for everybody else in the world, right? Which is to say English is particularly irregular when it comes to pluralization. Process, processes, two ES. Service, services, services with one S. Child, children. And so, you know, when do you meet one? When do you meet multiple? And so we said, hey, in PowerShell, it's always a singular name, um, uh, and then you can give it a single thing or, or multiple things. Now, I will be quick to add, yeah, somebody can do the gotcha somewhere, someplace, somebody used a plural. And so, you know, we're not, we're not perfect, but that's the rule and uh, the best practice. So and so that's why if you had, you know, computers, you know, dollar sign computer yeah, computers, computers is, doesn't, work. Is, doesn't work. So yeah. let's use Jeffrey's example here and let's shorten this because I like the readability of it. So dollar sign C in computer name and computer name can hold one or more. Um, so let's try this for each and see if it will, with verbose, print them out. So you'll need to fix your oops. verbose to dollar sign C. Ah, thank you. Um, and let's run this. So let's do this. Oh, I do that all the time. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. Well, now I really screwed it up. Control, Control Z. Z. Control Z. Control Z is my friend. Here we go. So, clear the screen and get comp info and computer name. And let's just do one. It's verbose. And so, computer DC shows up here at the last line. So, it got one of them. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> now, let's do it for multiple ones. Up arrow. There we go. So, I'm going to do DC client. If I can spell it correct, S1 and S2. That's verbose. And I forgot the verbose. Do you believe that? Yep. Verbose. And now I'm iterating through each and every one of them. Reason that this is important is this is a very common thing that you're going to need because you're all, most of the time, your command list, you're going to want to be able to hit multiple computers with, yeah. and you're going to want to be able to iterate through this. So this is almost like boilerplate code that you're going to see us use in the process block here in a yep. second. So that's pretty cool, right? Love yeah. it. Love Does it. that work? Love okay. It. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So here's the thing. I've got some testing in here. I'm going to kind of collapse this so we don't have to keep staring at it. The nice part about using something like write verbose is, is now if I don't use dash verbose, I don't see all that stuff, but I can see it when I want to see it to make sure that things are working correctly. I, I, I just love that. Now we want to start to add our code. Where should we be putting our code? Let's say I want to do just, um, I just want to get a WMI thing, maybe like logical disk or something like that. Yep. I can put it in begin, and that's going to just run once. As I, yep, as long as you're not uh, getting the output from, or getting it, you're not operating anything that you're going to pipeline to it. And that's the issue. Yes. So we really want to put it in the process, process. block. Yep. Even if we don't intend to use pipeline input, we might change that though, right? We, yeah, exactly. So we want to put it in the process block. So. Tell you what, guys, take a look. Main code four, and I'm going to oh. minimize this. And we're on to four, okay. This is the same thing that we just saw, only this time, take a look. In the process block, I've put that for each, computer in computer name. And, you know, I like, Jeffrey, what you've done so much with just making it a single, how pretty that looks, that let's just do that so it becomes really clear. See, and then you get more on the screen. And I get more on the screen. Awesome! But you do need to see there. Oh, but I do, <laughs> I do actually need to see there. So for each individual computer name that's in this collection of computer names, what do you want to do? And in this case, guys, right now, I just got a couple of WMI commands that are going for my main code. I don't even have to have them set to variables right now. As a matter of fact, let me just take the variables out for a second, just so you can see this run. What's going to happen is, is that for each one of these, I'm going to get the computer name, and I'm going to run that WMI command 
for that computer, and I'm doing Win32 operating system and, and Win32 logical disk. This will just get me some computer information, like if I wanted to retrieve some inventory information. I'm just getting some basics. And so right now, if I run this and clear the screen, and we'll do get comp info, and let's just use one computer at the moment. You'll see that it runs through. It gives me some of that basic information <clears throat> from WMI. And I can also now, let's do it for multiple computers, DC comma client. Now, this is becoming kind of a cool tool in the sense that I've got something that looks like a commandlet and... I've got, uh, I'm getting a couple of bits of information. I could actually add some more WMI, do a complete inventory of as many computers as I want. But you know what, what I, I don't like is, um, um, it's just kind of displaying stuff out here. This really isn't, it's, I don't want all of this, first of all. Okay. And second of all, you know, I have to take a look, but these are objects coming out, but I'm not in control of anything. So. I'd like to clean this up a little bit. What I would you like want, to do? I would like to only... Talk to me. Talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to only see certain properties. So ah. maybe a, a hash table? A hash table? A, a hash, hash table or a new object? Uh, well, yeah, I'm thinking that we, we should probably do both. Let's do a hash table. And then? And then do a new object. So yeah. it, it, this is... This is Hash tables are a critical uh, component of PowerShell. If we talked about that in the first session. If you didn't spend time on it, it's worth spending time on. You're going to see lots and lots and lots of hash tables. Syntax a little bit, you know, you just you got to get used to it, but they're, they're awesome. They're everywhere. And so let me give you an example of how we're going to start to control the information that we see. Take a look at my script, and this is uh, the main code end where we're starting to put this in. So for each, and I'm going to leave this right now as computer, so I don't have to change everything, but you get By the way, idea. You know, they, they pointed out in the Q&A, why don't you show them Control-H? Control-H, Control-H, yeah. Control-H. All you guys know all these keyboard shortcuts. So select dollar sign computer. Select dollar sign computer. And hit Control-H. Control-H. Search and replace, my friend. Oh! Dollar sign <laughs> Search C. and replace. Dollar sign C. And you okay. probably don't want to do, um, yeah. None. Oh, see what it's doing? Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, see, now that you don't want that one, so you want to skip that one. Well, wait a minute, it didn't change this one. Just keep going. Just keep going? You did, you did find next, I think. Oh, Not I probably replace. did. Um, so I just want to match whole word, Whole right? word, sure. Maybe. And then, home. so that one, skip that one. Yeah. So replace, replace, start over at the beginning. Oh, I'll just hand do it. Here, we'll just change it. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> What did you do? And there's a dollar, dollar. Oh, I, I screwed up. Oh, now up. I have to do it down here, too. Yeah, so we'll just do this, how, make it nice. How did you clean. do that? How did I do what? Nothing. Oh, okay. So, what, ah, so notice what I've done here is I've taken these commands and I've put them to a variable. So, what, I'm, what we're going to do is we're going to store that object or multiple objects. We're going to store them to a variable and then use the dot notation to reference the properties or the methods that we want. Like we showed you this morning that you can do with variables. So look at what I'm doing down here. First of all, I'll talk about the syntax in just a second, but this is a hash table. I'm going to use those variables and then just grab the property information that I want from it. Now, if you're saying, how do I know what properties are available? Well, you take that var and you pipe it to get member and you'll get the list of all the properties. So I'm just gonna grab from the OS one, Win32 operating system, I'm gonna grab caption and build number. And then for disk space, I want the free space, but I don't want that really long, ugly number. So I actually did the same calculation that I had done earlier. And we also had done in the last show of a custom column where I'm dividing it by one gigabyte and storing it as an integer so that it gets rounded up and it's a nice, easy to, to work with number. Now, here's the, the, the thing about the syntax is, this is a hash table, right? So I got at sign, open squiggly, and a close squiggly. And I've broken this out. Do you like the way this is broken out here? The, the, I've broken this out so that instead of putting it all on one line, making it nice and, and yeah. pretty. Did it, I did it that way. Doing it this way means it's easy for you to add additional things. Notice that I have the name that I want to call the column, and then what I want that filled with, if 
followed by a semicolon. Now, you could just keep typing like this and putting more and more in, but it makes it nicer if you line break it so that you can read it easier and add in additional things. The tricky part is, is to make sure that when you get to the last one, you don't put a semicolon. That's the closing squiggly that goes there. You know, you don't need the semicolon here. Oh, you don't? No. You need the semicolon if you're putting multiple uh, properties on the same line. So we need to I know. I can take this out? Yeah. I thought it yelled at me when I did that. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Let's see. No, well, it's not showing up as, as a problem. Yeah. So let's see what, uh, what it... No, it, it yeah. seems to be... Yeah, so the semicolon is a statement terminator, and you need that if you're going to have multiple statements on the same line. In PowerShell, the carriage return is also a statement terminator. So... And <clears throat> awesome, he's right, it worked just fine. So... <laughs> Thank you, Bruce Payette. I gotta tell <laughs> Thank you, you Bruce we Payette. Really, we really did struggle between this, how do we have a, an interactive syntax and a programmatic syntax together? Cannot tell you how many long, long hours we spent trying to get this right, so. Well, I think it also, it brings up what you also keep saying is that, you know, PowerShell, you guys are gonna see this on the internet with semicolons and obviously yes. without semicolons. And so PowerShell gives you multiple ways to do things, which is great. and. I, this say it makes it even easier to read and deal with because hunting down semicolons is not fun. Yeah. So, yep. so take a look at I've stored this as a very into a variable here because we're going to use this kind of uh, use this later. Um, <clears throat> I want you to see what this is going to do. So what I've done is I just write output dollar sign prop. I just want you to I just want it displayed on the screen so you can see what the data looks like. Notice I've got computer name, OS name, OS build, free space. By the way, in the in the chat room, people are freaking out because at the top you s used a dollar sign capital C, and then you used dollar sign lowercase C everywhere else. Is that going to work? That's going to work just fine. But you know what? I should be consistent, shouldn't I? Well, no, because it allows us to point make a point. The point is that in PowerShell, oh. we're case insensitive. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it's case insensitive. So you know, again. PowerShell is a great language because I'm a deeply flawed human. There's no way I'm going to remember, was that uppercase, lowercase? doesn't matter. We're case insensitive. Wherever we can be, we are case insensitive. And, and <laughs> we talked about this during the, the, the first jump start. Um, case insensitive, being case insensitive, a lot of guys that come from Unix, that's the first thing that they, they you know, is this going to matter? No, it doesn't. And they, some people get kind of upset by that. But for, as a Windows admin, if this had been made case sensitive, I'd, I'd, I'd done it once and gone, I have no idea, right? Yeah. And it would have killed me. So yeah, this is a great point is that for consistency's sake, I always like to try to be consistent. So I just changed it to a lowercase c. But it's a great point that um, um, case does not matter. So look at the order that I have these. And I'm going to run this. So get comp info and computer name DC. And we're just going to dump the output out to the screen. Now this is starting to look a little bit better. A little bit better for the output that I want. Notice that it's it's free. Well, wait a minute. It's free free space computer name OS. It's wait a minute. I did computer name OS name OS build and now it's doing the output is much nicer, but it's not doing it in the order that I want, Jeffrey. It's not doing it in the order that I want. It's, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. So and here's the deal about hash tables. Hash tables are guaranteed to give you unpredictable ordering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just Swear like, to God, that's, that's the whole point, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, you know, we could give you a long blah, blah, blah explanation. That, that rule's a better rule uh, in general. Ordering is going to be pretty random in that. That's why in PowerShell version three, three, we have a couple extra keywords like ordered. Ordered. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you ordered, and I just want to point now, just out. Just to be clear, ordered is a little more expensive because we order things, and dot .NET didn't do that, so it's a little more expensive. But it's not that terribly expensive, and it's quite right. quite useful because because then it is predictable. And I just want to point out that. In, in most cases, you really don't care about the order that um, uh, your stuff's being displayed. Because remember, if you were giving this as a tool to someone else, the idea is that that admin could then pipe to select and get the information that they wanted, and that order then would occur for them. Yeah. But in PowerShell v3, we have this. And let's see if I can do this without screwing it up. Ordered. 
Okay, I've screwed it up. It's order. I don't know. Ordered or is it order? Somebody's going to have to yell at me. I think maybe I have it over here. Did I put it in here? No. Yep, it's ordered. Oh. Where? With or without ordered. So let me go back to here. I am typing something horribly in wrong, incorrect. Get dollar sign. Dollar sign. Oh, so what's the error say? Oh, let's see here. The ordered attribute in a hash in literal node. What does that mean? On a literal, so show it again. The ordered attribute can only can be specified only on a hashed literal node. Oh, okay. So so here's what you do. Anytime you get something like that, I'll give you Bruce Payette's home phone number, <laughs> and I want you to call him any time of the night to ask him about any bad error messages. So you'll get that home. No, uh, I, put it on the yeah. other side. So you don't put it on oh, the property. Oh, 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 oh. I was there. thinking it may have been me and my little semicolon thingies that I was no, doing no, no, before. No, 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 no. Put it on the other side. So yes, it is not a type. Yes, <sighs> so that's it. Thank you. But again, Bruce Payette, it's 425, <laughs> I'll get that, I forget it. So it's it's dollar sign, pro, boy, you tell my brain's working Equals, slow. and then paste it after the And then there's the where it goes, yeah, there, 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 there. The literal there. hash. Now, here's also a good note. In the help file, on hash tables, this example is in there and they show you the correct place to put it. So in my case right now, in real life, me not knowing where it goes or forgetting where it goes, I'd have gone into help and looked it up. So this is this is a good deal. But I would much rather have Bruce Payett's home phone number. He wouldn't <laughs> like me very much though. Uh, <laughs> You'll be just one of the one of the many. One of the many. <laughs> That's awesome. So now watch guys, when I when I run this, I've told it that I want it to be ordered. So these guys over here are working hard to order it for me. So I'm gonna run it and we'll take a look at it here. Get comp info. Your name DC. And voila. voila. Now it's in the order that I specified. Nice. Now, here's the thing. I want my own object. Yes. I'm asking a lot here. I'm running a couple lines, I'm grabbing some data, and I want to take an object that I can then send down the pipeline that people can use select and where and... Yeah, it's worth noting. Show, show them the, the output there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here's the output. Okay, so notice you get this object, but you're not getting a table. You're not getting, you're getting a this, table. Well, you're getting a table, but you're getting a table of name value pairs. Well, that's what a hash table is. Yeah. Now, for a lot of reasons, you can treat a hash table like an object. We call it a hash table object adapter, if you want to know the details. Uh, and so it works just fine. But a lot of times, like, like if you, it was a proper object, this would be showing you a proper table with each one of those names as columns, et cetera. So here's where it really shows up. If you had two of those things, you'd get uh, a table with eight lines. And you couldn't tell where one Would object you? ended and the others. Whereas if it was a proper object, you'd have two lines, you know, one, two rows, one for each object, where the properties were the, the columns. And that's what that's what we want to do. That's we don't want, want this because right now, if you look at my screen, I pipe this to get member. Now, we set it for ordered, so it's ordered dictionary. This is not the objects that we're used to working with in PowerShell. This is not what I want. I still want the true object that I can send down the pipeline and work with. So let's make our own object. And to let you guys know, this is in the uh, sample number six, but I'm just going to hand type it in here into this example while I'm here, I think I am. Yeah, I told you guys I wasn't gonna do all this hand typing and I'm doing it. So dollar sign OBJ is kind of what I use equals and we have this command that called new object. And I'd like to put in the type of object. And this is the interesting thing is you guys gave us uh, uh, this, this, we can make an object, a PS yes, object. object. Yeah. So a PowerShell object. Guys, I'm creating an object. It's, it's empty right now, but it's an object. It's supposed to have, you know, methods and properties, but I can now assign that to it. So one way to do that is, um, whoops, wrong one. I'm going to assign it properties, and the properties that I'm going to assign it is that hash table of dollar sign prop. Now, I want you to notice something. <clears throat> this is a, a very important. We do new object, type name PS object, and I'm assigning the properties to it, and notice right output 
I'm going to send it back out to the, 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 out to the screen, out to the pipeline, that kind of thing. So let me run this and take a look at the difference. Get comp info. First of all, just look at the results. DC client. Ooh. Whoops, I didn't do something right. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you guys see what I made my mistake? Uh, I want to write that object out, not this. So let's run it again. Get comp info. DC client. Ooh. Now that's looking like the, the output that it should be looking like. I've got my column names, which are actual properties. And you, for each computer now, I'm getting a row in there. Yep. I'm getting objects. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and pipe it to get member. And look, there's my properties, and it's on this custom PS custom object. Later on, we'll show you how you can even, and your, why you would want to, create your own name for this object. But for right now, we're going to keep it pretty simple at, at making objects. Wow. You know what? I don't. I think... I think you know, this is like the bulk of, if you do this, now you've got objects you can do select, you can do where, you've actually kind of really made a tool at this point. Yeah, right? exactly. So at this point, guys, you might be saying, oh. oh, wait, 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 because, so here's the thing, because you've output it as an object, now all of a sudden you have the, you have the, you have a, a proper tool, but then it also can fit into the tool chain of other things. This, if you recall, we talked about uh, the last time we had the session, we talked about how you always want to write things to output versus the host. Oh, and yeah. the reason why is because here... Because you know, God he, kills puppies if you, write, if you use write host. Yes, he's that way. Yes. And this is now part of the tool chain. It does a distinct task in and of itself, but it does it in a way that then can combine with the other tools to form higher and higher levels of abstraction. And as a great example with that is... I'm going to do the get info, and this time let's just do select, and the uh, property that I want to select is I want property computer name. So you see, I've now made a useful tool that other admins can use. Um, so I can select out just the computer name. I can do things like, uh, if you remember from the last session, I can now, since it's a real object, I can convert it to CSV, Jason, HTML. Do Jason. Do, do JSON? Yeah, hey, it's cool. you wrote my name into the... Hey, this is awesome, dude. Yeah. I love you. I, this is, <laughs> convert it to JSON. <laughs> do you want to talk a minute real quick about JSON? Because that's becoming a real popular... Just yeah, so we uh, got full... We got, well, JSON, it's a, it's a new format. It's an object format, JavaScript object notation. And it's very, very popular. And there's a bunch of tools that can consume JSON and... Um, output JSON. So now PowerShell can take any object, WMI, ADO, Active Directory, XML, whatever you want, and convert it to JSON, or take JSON and import it to make it a PowerShell object. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> well, it's our role as a, as a glue language. Like, whatever your problem is, our job's to help you get it solved. Is to help and you so get it solved. And so some guy, and that's the problem. The world, the world always has been, the world is, and the world always will be a messy place, right? Yeah. It's a messy place in the past because everybody was doing random stuff. So right now we're trying to consolidate things and get everybody to do things one way. But then there's a whole bunch of people innovating and doing brand new things. So it's always going to be messy. And that's why PowerShell isn't too you know, dogmatic around, this is the way you will do it. No, no, that's nonsense. Our job is to make you successful. And that means helping you deal with the messy world. That's why we do XML. That's why we do all these, right. these things that other people might say are strange. Like, just pick a, just have a point of view and make it so. Well, we do that. We, we do have a point of view, and we optimize for certain cases. But the reality is, if, if, you, if, you, have to go, if you have to go parse some HTML file because that's the only way you can do it. Right. Well, the other option is to fail. So of course you're going to yeah. do that. Exactly, exactly. And so the beauty of what's happened right now is that we've managed to take some functional code and make our own object that can now be used with anything else that we want to use with down the, uh, the pipeline, whatever formats that we want, if, if XML, CSV, all of that. Yeah. This is the important piece to making the tool. And this format, by following this, all we're going to do at this point this afternoon is add on to it. In other words, 
add additional parameter validation, add some error handling to it, add some cool tricks and features, add some help to this. But this is kind of the base of the format of being a toolmaker. And notice at how, really, how simple this was. We just created some simple parameters. We used command line binding. We made it as a function. And then we put our code in the process block. This guy right here for the properties, that's really important. And we created our own object. That's really important. Those pieces right there get you started down a road of making your own tools that solve your problems for you. Because remember, the whole point to PowerShell is they can't imagine every problem that you would have, so you now have the ability to solve it yourself. For the IT pro, this is wickedly cool because it, it, I don't have to be a C-sharp developer to, to be able to, to, to make my own commandlet. So at this point, Jeffrey, you know, this is, this is the core, but now it's kind of time that we start adding enhancements. Like I know one of your fun things is parameter validation. So guys, let yeah, me catch you, let me catch you up validation. where we are in the slides. So we're finishing off module four here. So just so that everybody's aware, and you have all this code. So we showed you where to add your code and then writing objects out to the pipeline. Guys, tell you what, we're gonna take a 10 minute break and then we're going to move on and add more and more to our, our tools. Hey. See you in 10. So that takes us to module five. Ooh. Ooh. So let me load uh, them all up. <laughs> shut <laughs> down your old ISE and yeah, bring it up again. Yeah, so everybody, if you want, you can open up the, the demonstration code for this. And that's what I'm doing. And module five and dot, da, 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 da. Voila! Mm. So this is all very nice. I like this. You like this? Yeah. This is good job. Like you did all the work. Thank you. Well, no, you did all the work. I'm just talking about the work you did. You and the PowerShell well, team. <laughs> you made it very easy for people. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anyways, so I'm going to show you this first one just because we've we've already shown this in the the, the, the previous jump start and you've seen us use this before, but parameters can have attributes. And I'm going to let Jeffrey talk about that, but I want you to see mm. one of the ones that we've been using a lot. And this is a parameter attribute called mandatory, which makes the parameter, well, mandatory. If you don't fill it in... <laughs> that would explain that. That would explain that. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't fill it in, it's going to prompt you. And um, so this is actually a, 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 a good example of a parameter attribute. But you guys have created a ton of attributes. Why, yes. why create all these attributes in the first place? Because yeah. we're talking about validation, all kinds of stuff. Ooh, it's one of my favorite topics. So basically, it's all around um, uh, having you, allowing you to tell PowerShell to do all the work for you. Okay, And we were talking about this, this uh, last evening, this whole discussion about imperative code versus declarative code. And when do you want one versus the other? And the answer is a little bit complicated. But in general, when you can have declarations, declarations tell somebody else what you want, and then it's their job to make it so. And in general, that's very, very powerful. Now, you can't do everything that way, you know, world peace equals true, okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm a genius, just, I'm a good guy, just, just make, make it, it so. so. Yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't always work, but often it does. And so that's what we've done, and I think the parameter validation is a great example. Now, some of you will look at this and they'll say, well, look, I'm, you, you get this pound sign, mandatory equals true. I could have done that in code, right? I, I could have gone and say, you know, if it's not here, generate an error message. But here's the deal, don't do that. <laughs> if you go do that code, you have to do what? You have to write an error message, okay? If Jason does that, he's going to do what? He's going to write an error message. And the thousands of people out there watching this, you're all going to write error messages, and they're all going to be different, okay? If you use my parameter, my attribute, mandatory equals true, then somebody doesn't specify a parameter, there's going to be exactly one error message. 
and people will look at it, they're going to recognize it. They don't have to read it. They're going to recognize it because they've seen it before and they're going to know exactly what it is and they're going to do it. If, you, if there are thousands of different error messages for the same condition, they're going to have to read that, say, what is it? You know, call Bruce Payette at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, got another one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you know this one? And that's not going to be good. Now, the other thing is, like, okay, so you say, well, I'm just, I'm just not convinced. I'm going to do it. And then I say, okay, great. So what happens when you take your script, script and, um, and it's popular and it's run in French? In France, are you going to output it in French? Yeah. What am I going to do about the diff the language? Exactly. Stuff? And the answer is no. You're going to be an ugly American and say, "Just learn <laughs> English." You. <laughs> and, and of course, that's not a good and answer. That's, that's not a good answer. So. And so, if you use our attributes and your script runs in other countries, we do the uh, localization of the error message. Uh, the, you know what? So the people in that country are going to get an error message that they can read. You had me at. You don't have to type in the code. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, quite honestly, it gets down to the reason for the parameter attributes is you could hand code all of these, but why? When first of all, they've already done the heavy lifting, the hard work. You get features like localization for languages in different countries. Also, one of the primary things is, is quite honestly, this makes it so much easier than writing out all this code. So. Yeah. I think it's awesome. Well, first of all, we've got Let's some mandatory it. parameter in there. And I want to show you guys something just as, and it's on the slides that you have. So um, get help about underscore. And of course, my brain is, ah, functions. And you know what? Tab completion is such a beautiful thing that it's, so all of this stuff about the different types of attributes that we're going to show you is in advanced parameters. Now, I've got a set list of, of some of the uh, uh, parameter attributes that I want to show you, and I'm, Jeffrey's probably going to want to show you a couple, but the complete list and samples of code are in the help file. Again, the help system for PowerShell is Rockin'. unbelievable. I mean, just the most amazing thing By in the way, world. By the way, did we show them the trick about pipe to clip? Oh, I saw that. You know, would you, would you show the pipe to clip thing? Yeah. Okay. So, so let's. What was that again? It was like, like help. That... Was it uh, about function parameters? It was. What was it? It was pipe to clip. I. No. What, what was the name of the about function? Um, about underscore functions underscore advanced. Functions. Yeah. Advanced. Uh, underscore parameters. Oh, you know what? This doesn't have help. That's why it's not working. Oh, don't. you don't have help on yet? No. <laughs> Remember, you know what I'm doing? I'm doing all this uh, demo from like their machine. I just walked up and I said, oh, it's got PowerShell on it. I'll use that. And we didn't do an update help. <laughs> didn't run you, update you help, so I'll do it. I'll, I'll run and update so, help in the background. So this is the old Clip EXE, right? Is that is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you take a look at my screen, guys, um, get help uh, about functions, advanced parameters, pipe to Clip. And what were we doing? That, that, that actually puts it into the clipboard. In the clipboard. And then say, uh, you know, control N. It's a new tab. And you just paste it there. You go to the top, of course. Oh, anyway, so it's there all there. You go. So you can read it. Yeah, exactly. Very nice. This is very cool. A nice way to get it there so that you can read it and go through it. So all of this and all the code samples are right there. So let's go to our first one here, mandatory. Just once again, I'm going to run this real quick. The rest of the code down here hasn't changed. Just so you know, it's we're not dealing with that anymore right now. So we're just adding in features. So I'll minimize all that. Mandatory true. Going to run this, and you guys will know what happens. I'm going to type in git comp info, and if I don't specify, it comes up and asks. I want you to notice that because we're dealing with multiple values, the binkies inside there. Now he wants to know multiple computer names, and I'm going to show you something that happens to a lot of folks the first time they see this. They'll put in a computer and go. Well, uh. that's the one I want, and it's it's asking me again. So I, oh, oh, it keeps asking me. Oh, it keeps it, make it stop. Here's how you make it stop: just strike enter on a blank line, or then control C, or control C. <laughs> <laughs> so it lets you easily enter in multiple values, and also yeah, sh you show them with oh. it. Get rid of the binkies <laughs> and show them what oh, that would look like. Get rid of the binkies, and so dink dink. Yeah, right again. And uh, let's run it. And let me get rid of this line, and we'll do get comp info. Now you don't have the brackets yes. with the element numbers in there. Yeah. So now it only takes one. Right. So, so if you have arrays, matter. binkies matter. 
and uh, we'll just keep asking you. <laughs> like more and more and more. Matter, we'll keep asking. So mandatory is pretty straightforward. Let's see. And Jeffrey got, gave you a quick shot of this earlier. Pretend for a moment that I want to accept these computer names. I don't want to hand type them in to the parameter. I want to accept them from the pipeline. So example two, here are the parameter attributes for pipeline. Now notice I have multiple attributes here. Mandatory equals true, comma, value from pipeline is true, and value from pipeline by property name. And for the difference between being passed by value and by property name, I want to reference you back to the first jumpstart where we went through all of that information. Yep. And that was some pretty heavy duty stuff. Yeah. But basically what this means is, just like Jeffrey showed earlier, I can now take stuff from the pipeline. In fact, let's do, let's do that. Let's, um, I made earlier a computers.txt. So let's do this. Mm. Let's do get content, c colon computers.txt, just so everybody can see, watch. Aha. Mm. Okay, so I've got computers there. Now look at this. Pipe get comp info. Ooh, look at that. No, no, really, guys. Stop for a minute and look at what just happened. With a simple added attribute, my commandlet now supports pipeline input for that parameter. That is totally awesome. So I can do get content computers. I could be doing get AD computer. I could be doing from a CSV. I can hand type them in, whatever. But everybody says, well, how do I get something to support pipeline input? That. You got it. And you didn't have to code all this. You didn't. And I remember once. That and I, you put the comma, you put the code in the process block. That's and it. And you put the code in the process block. That's oh, very important. Remember, our code's in the process block because... That's where it needs to be for it to run if it's going to get it, catch it from it the pipeline. Because it gets called each time the pipeline has an object. This is, I remember hand coding this once. I did not understand advanced functions mm. well enough. When, when V2 first came out, and I, had, I hand coded taking information from the pipeline, it was ridiculously stupid. Ouch. And you, you've got it such a simple, sweet solution by just adding it in right there. So, guys, keep it simple whenever you can keep it simple. Now, there's a couple of other things you can do with parameter. I'm focused on computer name because I'm playing with it. But I kind of like this. This, yeah. this is kind of nice. How about we add a help message for the parameter? Now, this is different than the comment-based help that we're going to be showing you later. But this is a help message in case you think that somebody might get confused. This is a nice attribute to add. Take a look. So in, I've got mandatory, got my values from pipeline. I put in another comma, and I put in this one, help message equals, and I put in a little help message, one or more computer names. I'll just point out that's not that helpful. Yeah, it's, it's really... when you do it, you do something helpful. <laughs> Wait, I know, yeah. But you'll get the idea. Yeah, you're going to see exactly what he means, that it's not really that, that, that helpful. Let me show you how this appears, though, when you run this. Um, yeah, it's rocking. Yeah, this is actually get comp info. And I obviously, it wants something. PowerShell is asking me for something. And pretend for a moment that I don't know what computer name is. Notice what says above there. Type. And, and do you call those bangs? Yeah, I do. Okay, I call them bangs, too. Um, do you have a special name for the question mark? Yes. Question mark. Oh, <laughs> okay, good. I always check with the Unix guy to see if there's any kind of, you know, special stuff going on. So watch. What I'm going to do is, is I'm going to type bang. But wait, that did not exist the last time. No, it wasn't on the screen at all. It's only because you provided help, a help comment, that now we see that. And we say, oh, well, do you want some help? Here it is. And now watch, I'm going to strike enter and see it comes up with that help message and then gives me basically the mandatory parameter again. And if that help message was useful, was <laughs> then you'd have help and you'd know what well, to do. One or more computer names, that's not very useful, is it? So, <laughs> <laughs> Given that the computer, that the parameter's name, computer name. No, I know, it's, it's kind of, yeah. But you guys get the, uh, the idea here is that this is um, a great way to add in some help for the individual parameters. Um, that shows up. 
One of my other... And again, you know, yeah, for you, ahead. you might say, well, I'm not going to do that. And again, for you, you don't, right? You, you've named all your functions T and A and B, <laughs> and so you got 26, you just iterate through. But it's when I'm going to go, and I'm going to give it to Jason, right? He obviously needs all the help he can get. Uh. So I'm going to write this script to, with lots of help so that, again, we always think, and I encourage you to think this way as well, that whenever you're writing these tools, think about the person who is using your tool, and they expected to use your tool on Friday after everybody went home, so 6 o'clock, they're going to do something, they're going to be finished by 7, and they're going to be home for a late night dinner with their family and a movie, okay? But it's not. It's now 3 o'clock in the morning, in the morning. on Saturday, everything's gone pear-shaped, and they're <laughs> frantic, okay? Now, write your tools for that guy. Right, so don't be esoteric with the names. You know, at some point, you know, he's running something. Make sure there's help. Make sure there's confirmation. Make sure you'll think about that person because you know what? That person might be me, <laughs> and I want your tool to help me. And and it might be. And you know, and, and, and since else. you you mentioned that when you write your tool, please help message is good. And and yes, use better. Write something better. Help than than what I wrote because. I would appreciate it because yes. definitely appreciate it. One more uh, to take a look at before we take a break. Um, and I, I have a question about this. I, let me explain this to, to you. And then, um, Jeffrey, this, we have this attribute called alias. Oh, I love it. And, yeah. and, and so, so talk about this. Why does this exist in the first place? And why do well, I have there, this? There's many reasons why you might have an alias. Imagine you wanted to be like Dark Carlos or da Carlos Dangerous. <laughs> Did you just call me Dark Carlos? Wasn't that the guy's name? <laughs> a politician? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Carlos Danger. Okay. Um. So, no, this is my alias is, is that um, we have some strong guidance for the names for things. And again, it's about this world where you think, you type, and you get. And therefore, we tell everyone, hey, this should be the term, computer name. And people are like, okay, that's great. I love it. I'm into this thing type get uh, that makes total sense for me. A middle sense for you guys, but not for me. Because historically, I've already got some stuff, and everybody knows it as host name, not computer name. So I'm going to use host name. And we say, no, actually, you're not. You're going to call it computer, computer name. name. <laughs> and they're like, but that's not going to work for me. And it's like, no, I totally respect that. Here's how it works. So you use minus computer name, but then you can have an alias. And so that means that when your users use this, they'll see computer name, and they'll also see that there's this alias host name. So if they can use either one. So if they're used to using host name, and they'll just naturally use host name, but they also when they're looking at the help, they'll see, oh, I'm supposed to be using, using the computer term. name, and they're letting me get away with the host name right now. Yes. Now, so, there's another reason for this, and this other reason is actually even cooler. The other reason is... Um, so remember from the previous session, we talked about this pipeline, you know, get from pipeline by property name. Right. Okay. And so what that means is I got an object, I send it to a commandlet, and I first say, hey, does he bind by value? Yes. Is it the correct value? Yes or no? And if it is, it gives it to him and it goes. If it's not, it says, okay, can I bind to it by property name? And so it takes the property name and it says, do you have a value? Do you have a property by that name? And if so, it grabs it, gives it the value, and calls the process object. With alias, it'll see, do you have that property name, or do you have any of the aliases? Oh, so this is wickedly cool. And so what that means is, so you got this object, like, okay, I'm, I'm writing this tool, and you wrote an object, and you wrote it the right way, and so it's got a minus computer name. And so I say, by property value, computer name, and I am able to run your commandlet and pipe it to mine, and everything's happy. But Joe over there, Joe wrote a tool, and he emitted an object right. called host name. And it's like, thanks, thanks, Joe. Could you please go do it the right way? And which Joe's already been fired, so the answer's no. no. <laughs> and so it's like, well, what am I going to do? Well, I'm in a position, you'll see that there's other techniques you can use, but I'm in a position to just go and say, okay, the computer name has a, an alias, host name, or host, or IP address, or whatever, and I can have a number of those things. And then as I get the object, and says, oh, do you have a, a computer name? No. Do you have a host name? Yes. Okay, well, give me that one to go. So it's a way to be super, super powerful. 
And this is a great, uh, by the way, the uh, first jump start, this is step three in the module on the pipeline uh, deeper where we had to do a custom column where we created our own property name on the fly because they didn't match up. And so what you can do is you now as the tool maker, well, if you know that you're going to get, yes, they're going to send me things under properties called computer name and somebody's going to send me stuff under host name, you can solve the problem up front so that the admin that's using these tools doesn't have to go through all that hard work to make the conversions and to create the properties on the fly. So let me show you this, and then we'll take a, uh, a break. Here's By the way, it turns out all of our friends in the international lands have no idea what, who Carlos Danger is. They don't know who Carlos Danger is? So, well, this yeah. is the tool making, and so we don't want to talk about Carlos Danger too much because... <laughs> there's, there's an American politician who got himself in trouble very big using trouble. an alias. And that would be his alias that he used, and it's, yeah, American politician, bad, 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 bad. Um, So, guys, it's called alias, and I'm going to say use what Jeffrey said. Instead of host, I'm going to just change it to host name. Watch what happens here. I'm going to run it so you can see what the results will be. So we get comp info, and I want you to see that I can still do dash computer name, but here is kind of cool. Looky, 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 looky. I can use host name. Ooh. And as Jeffrey pointed out, this is a great solution if you know that you're going to be receiving uh, objects and properties that don't match, you can make them match to what you want them to be for, for pipeline. This is awesome. I just want to make sure if you've been following along with the slides and that, that you, that you know where we're at. So I just want to show you in the slides yeah, where, where we, we are. Where are we? Um, in, in Module 5, what we talked about so far mm. is we've done uh, mandatory parameters yep. and we've done switch parameters. And we've done accepting pipeline input. Very, very important. This is the cool part for everybody is, is making your command let's accept pipeline input. Parameter help, definitely cool. And we just finished um, uh, doing with aliases, which very helpful to be able to have aliases. There are a couple of more things that I, I wanted to mm -hmm. show. And if you want to show something too, that's, okay. that's, that's awesome. But let me see what you think of this. Um, you did this earlier, this validate set. Oh, yeah. So I just yeah. want to show everybody that validate set is, is definitely one of my favorite things. Now, I'm doing it on computer name, but you can do this with a lot of things. When you know that there's only certain values that you want an admin to be able to type in, validate set is your friend. So a lot of times with WMI or a lot of times with a lot of the tools that you're making, you're going to say, um, you've got three options. You type in the sun, the moon, the earth, and the ocean. Well, I guess that's four options. Oops. Uh, <laughs> the sun, the moon, the earth. Those are your options. If they type in anything else, you could write the code that would check to see if they type. But why? We've got validate set. So take a look at this. Validate set, DC, client. And I'm going to run this. And so as you saw earlier when Jeffrey had done this, and I, I, just, I just love this kit comp info I'm going to do computer name and watch I'm going to do something that it's not going to like uh, <laughs> <laughs> the guys the, the production guys are going uh oh <laughs> and look Red. I'm bleeding all over the screen so get comp info but look at what the message says cannot validate argument on parameter the argument local host does not belong to the set dc and client so the error message will tell you what you should be typing in, which... Pretty useful. I think is very useful. And so validate set is hugely, hugely fun and I like to use. One yeah, of my other favorite blast. ones yeah. is... And then guys, this is example number six. Hey, does IntelliSense work I mean, with uh, it, validate set? Try that. I, what try do you mean? Go, it, go down, go down, try it. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, yeah. um, so get comp It might, it might not, I don't remember. You know, IntelliSense has gotten so cool now that comp info computer name. Look that? Oh, look at that. Look at it. Look at it. Look, 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 look. Oh, I can't get it to do control it again. Control J. Control J. Or control space. I don't know. Yeah. Ah! Look at that. Whoa. So, do you, you guys see what's, what's going on here? This is actually really kind of freaky cool. Is that IntelliSense knows your validate set. So, it's displaying what's in your validate set. Another reason to use validate set. <laughs> Another reason. Yeah, absolutely. So, actually, that's wickedly awesome. Um, By the way, hit, so hit client. And so then, hit client. Yeah, and then comma, and then control space again. Control space? Is it, whatever you did before. I just did a space. No. no. Control space. 
Control space? Let's turn it in control space. Okay, so. Well, it gives you the whole list. Yeah, but, okay. So I was just wondering at, how smart it was. Yeah, well, Jason it, Shark did that stuff. Awesome stuff. <laughs> He's super smart, but only so smart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. So send your email to Jay Snover at. <laughs> No, actually, uh, he's correct, because what that says is you can use those names over, over and, and over, over and over, over again. again. Yeah. So, so, no, he's makes, correct. So he's, he's much higher on the smart scale. Kind of smarter than me, because I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, one of my other favorite ones is uh, parameter count. And so validate the count. And this is so that you can, um, you know, if you want to control how many things somebody can type in. So here's a great example. Maybe your tool is very network intense and you only want them to be able to use maybe two computer names at once. So let me run this and show you. I'm going to put in three so that you can see what happens here. Let me get rid of this guy. Why am I getting rid of it? Because it's just what I want. But I like to type comp info computer name. So DC client and S1, look at the error message that's come up, is cannot validate because the number of supplied arguments, three, exceeds the maximum allowed. So what I've done here is I validate a, a count that says, I only want you to be able to put two computers in. So it might be a command that, like we're gonna talk about in a little bit that makes changes, and maybe you don't want them to make changes to more than a couple machines at once, something like that. Or maybe your parameter, you only want it to be able to make a, a, a couple of things. Um, and then I'm going to show the last one that is, that is my favorite. But I have mixed emotions about this. Right. I have mixed emotions about this. Oh. Because uh, I, I don't remember if we talked about this in the last jump start. But the last one is validate pattern. Yeah. What do you mean mixed emotions? I have mixed emotions about this because I love it. It's what's inside of it I don't love. <laughs> oh, well, there's that. There's that. Okay. So, guys, if you're yeah. taking a look at my screen, um, validate pattern is one of the most useful. I use it constantly. This is if you know that somebody's going to be typing in data and you want to make you want to validate that data that it's correct before they type it in. And the example that I have here is imagine this. I want you to type in an IP address. Well, here's the thing. I want to make sure that that IP address that you're typing in meets certain rules, like it's 0 through 255. You can't type in 999.999. That would be wrong. So I want to validate that you're, you're typing in the right number range and that you're putting in four octets, not three or two. Yeah. That requires a little bit more finesse. And so PowerShell has the ability to support that, but now you have to... Use regular expressions. Yep. And regular expressions is, and I, I think I, I may have already told you this. I may, if I did this in the previous jumpstart, I'm sorry, but um, uh, uh, my best mate is this uh, super developer, and he has he has a, a word for regular. He has a phrase for regular expressions, and his his thing is this is so, and he's he's British, so I, and he's pompous, so I have to as they all are. Anyways, Are you about Richard? Yeah, Richard. Yeah, exactly, Richard. <laughs> so it's like. Uh, <clears throat> So, so you've decided that you have a problem that can be solved with regular expressions. Well, now you have. Is that British? That's my British. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you you decided that you have a problem that can be solved with regular expressions. Well, now you have two problems. Yes. <laughs> True. So, guys, look the the stuff that's in the middle here is is regular expression syntax. Um, that is going to validate this data. That was data. like the worst accent ever. Was it really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I almost wish we could get Richard on the phone because that, that, would, that would help out a lot. Um, I'm sure he'll yell at me for it later. Um, so you can put regular expressions in. Now, if you don't, hand coding regular expressions can be challenging. So you can go to uh, Bing and search for a regular expression, which basically is what I did here. Um, also, you can learn regular expressions. They're kind of bizarre at first when you learn them, but you can start to learn them and build your own. I'm a web guy, so I have to use regular expressions all the time. So yeah. it's something, but validating patterns of data is totally awesome. And so let me just uh, run this and show you. Yeah, it's pretty hideous. I agree. Yeah, it's hideous. And the thing is with regular powerful expressions. Powerful but hideous. Yeah, very powerful. But what, what I've run across with regular expressions is you're not looking for the shortest one. 
you're usually looking for the longest one because we have to get all the rules in. The logic of those rules have to get in there. And it usually requires a lengthy regular expression to do it. In this case, I'm just doing some sample IP address checking. I'm not really um, checking on numbers. I'm checking on to make sure you have enough um, octets in here. So get conf info. And I'm going to set um, computer name uh, DC because it's mandatory. And I'm going to do IP address. And I'm going to do 192.168.3. Notice I didn't put in enough octets for it, so when I run it, it comes up and it says, yo, dude, you know, your IP address does not match the, yeah, and that's kind of hideous looking, but it does not match that pattern. So this is probably, every time a developer talks to me about, well, I want to validate data, this is usually the direction that they're headed, is they have very specific data validation that they want to do, and PowerShell will let you do it. Yeah. Is there anything else? Uh, yeah, can you sc there? switch to my screen? Oh, so yeah. here... What you want to do is, uh, there's a ton of these things, okay? And so here oh, what yeah, I did yeah. was I did a help about functions, advanced parameters, my show window, okay? And so this is a great document. And down here, well, here I'll search. I use the old search here, validate. So now look, I'll go up a bit. Parameter validation attributes. So you can do things like allow null. You know, hey, I take a, a, a computer name, which is a string. Do we allow nulls or not? Okay. Um, do we allow empty strings? Do we allow empty collections? Okay. And then things like validate count. count yeah. Okay. So that says, hey, I got the bingy bingies. What do you call them? The binkies. 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 <laughs> binkies. Oh, like binkies. the little thing with the. Yeah. Okay. So you got binkies here. How many can I have? Can I can I put an, a, 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 a thousand elements in it? And this is saying, hey, no. Uh, I'm going to validate the count. You have to have between one and five things. That's it. You can validate the length. So that says, hey, I'm going to take a string, okay, but the string has to be between 1 and 10. That's a fun one. Let's show that one. Actually, that's it. That, Did you know that one? one? Did you know that? You didn't know that one? No, I, I, you know what? I've, I've used that before, but you know oh, when I've God. used it, I've actually used it on computer names, right? Because somebody validate. types in some ridiculously validate. long name, you know it can't be. Validate. Oh, and see that? That was control space, because I can never remember these things. So I know it's validate something. And what did I say? I forgot. Crap. What was it? Validate length. As I said. Oops. Validate L. You thought I was joking, didn't you? Validate length. Let's say it's got to be between 4 and 10 characters. Yeah. Let's give that a try. Okay, so that says. Okay, get. Go away, go away, go away, go away. Oh. <laughs> Hide. Yeah. Comp info, minus computer name. Uh, A. DC. Uh, not ah, big enough? Ah, yeah. DC, see? DC. Well, that one oh. works. DC, DC, DC. Too long. There you go. Too long. See, I cool. like that. I like oh, that. Oh, and it tells you how long it is. 18. Look at that. See that? Okay, so that's, that's one. Oh, that's all you guys. Okay, so that's, god darn it. Oh, I see. There it is. Okay, so that was... Validate length. So that was cool. Validate length. You saw validate pattern. Very powerful. Validate script. Now this is the... Oh, no, this no, is I haven't hope. used this. What? I haven't used this. I can't get Don Jones to stop talking about this. Well, yeah, but who listens to him? Oh, oh I mean, man. sorry, oh. that was on live camera. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> so here's one. Let's see. We'll do, okay, I'll just do one of these. And I'm just going to get rid of all this stuff. Blah. Start from scratch. Um, test. And what I'm going to say is, let's say that this is a path. And I'm going to say cat dollar sign path. OK? OK. So let's make sure we get this. OK. And then I'm going to say. Uh, what the heck was the name there? Oh, I don't want to type all that. So, of course, T. <laughs> <laughs> so now I can say T, uh, C colon jumpstart, jumpstart, uh, mod 2 dash that. Voila, it works. Yeah? Oh, very cool. <laughs> okay, blows up. 
So here, now I might have done a whole bunch of stuff before it finally blew up because I gave it a name that didn't exist. Right. So what you can do here is you can do validate, va valid something, <laughs> validate Scri script, Scri validate script, and dollar sign this. Uh, well, it can say test path dollar sign this. Ah. I think I have to put that in squiggle brackets. And when I do it again. Validate, cannot bind path because it is null. Oops. Oh, all right. That's all right. That's. Duh. Oh. Anyway, that's how that works. <laughs> <laughs> What the heck? So, so what is the purpose, though, to the validate script? I mean, what is his, his Here, you know his what you, when, in when in doubt, when in doubt, always bring up the help, right? Yeah. So where was that help? Where did my show window go? Help. By the way, so now, here's a little trick. I'm trying to bring up the help that I brought up before, and I forget where it is, and I did hit blah, blah, blah. It's going to, yeah. So what you can do is you can say pound sign, and a portion of the command and hit tab and it'll oh and it'll go right to it you know I saw you it. do this before and I've never done that trick and that, yeah. I think that's awesome it is okay so there was validate script Val yeah. script validate script Have two of those. Okay, so here it's a script. Oh, I see. He's at dollar sign underbar. Maybe that was my mistake. It says it can't be current date. Okay, so if I say, if I said t minus event date get date, it would say, hey, that's not going to work because oh, they are equal. Oh, have. Oh. Oh, I see, yeah. I see, I but see. If I, so said, if I said get date uh, 12 25 2013, Christmas, happy. What the heck? Oh, because oh, the path oh. is still in there, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's, he, that's why he's out. yelling about that. So validate script is actually your ability to run code that it's going to that it's going to use as the validation. Exactly. And so, and I think why Don's been talking about this is because, and this is really cool, is because in the scripting games that we just That's had. That's what it was. In the scripting games, we um, there was one of the challenges had you um, check a path or something like that, and somebody had tested the path, I think, yeah. with validate script. That's what it was, yeah. And, and it was so cool because if you typed in a path That's that it. wasn't there. That's it. I used oh, dollar sign this, and I, so I went back and I fixed it. I used dollar sign underbar instead of dollar sign this. So validate oh, script. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, takes a script block, takes a script block, and and basically returns true or false. We evaluate it, just like our where clause. Takes a script block, evaluates it, evaluates to true or it evaluates to false. If it's true, happy, happy. If it evaluates to false, not. So if you give it a, a value um, that doesn't exist, it's going right. to evaluate to false. And if you give it a value that does exist, Happy, it happy. Works. And the reason that this was such a cool thing, and we all learned about this in the scripting games, I can't remember who did this as an example, but a lot of us that were sitting there looking at these scripts went, oh, this is wickedly cool because instead of, because we were writing the code to check for the path to make sure yeah, it existed, yeah, yeah. and this checks for it right there at the validation. You got I, it? it? Totally awesome. Awesome. Damn. So yeah, there's a ton more stuff about parameters and uh, the document. But by the way, so again, another technique is when you're kind of messing up and things aren't right, go to the examples and the help, figure that out. So what happened, right? So I thought I knew it. Step number one, I don't remember all these things. <laughs> okay, so I thought I knew it. I thought it was dollar sign this. It's wrong. I'm not sure what to do. What do I do? Go to the help. 
use the example in the help. I use the example in the help, and then I notice, oh, it's not dollar sign this, it's dollar sign underbar. Duh. And then I go back and I fix the original problem. Well, you know what's really interesting is, is that a lot of people would say, well, you should have practiced your demos or something, and it's like, no, you don't understand. In PowerShell, this is what we do every single day. This is oh. what happens to us. And, I wanted and this to be, is how we solve the problem. Exactly. I want to be clear about that, right? I do not want to come here and show you this polished, no problem thing, because that's not the real world. It's not real. And I wanted to be super clear that, you know, I've been working with this technology forever and ever and ever, and it's not about memorizing it or being an expert. It's about being able to figure this stuff out. So that's why we show you all the warts, why we show you these errors. I love it when these errors occur, because then it shows you, oh, and then that happens, and then you do this, and then that happens, and you do that. It, that's more valuable than, okay, now, write this down 17 times, because after right. 17 times of writing it down, you'll commit it to memory. That's nonsense. And, and I think that's a very important thing that we brought up in the, the very first jump start, which was don't memorize stuff. That's why the help system exists, and it's a really good help system. So as we're making mistakes, it's what happens to me in real life, and I have to go look something up because I screwed something up. So, yeah, anyways. So this has been a, 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 a great run through on some of the, the, the parameter Primaries. attributes that we can use, which is totally awesome. So let me catch everybody up in slides because we're going to shift modules okay. here. Um, we got uh, about a half an hour before break, and so we've got really cool stuff. So we did uh, I did a couple examples of validate set, validate count, validate pattern are in there for you. Um, check out the help file and try those. It really helps out quite a bit. And this is a great time for me to just uh, briefly show you before we go to our next module that at this point, I'm going to go to a uh, create my own little blank one. Remember Control J where the snippets would come up? Oh, yeah. What I love is this complete snippet because it gives you inside mm. of here, look at all of these. Yeah, this is it the one I use. It reminds you that these are here, right? Yeah, this is the one I use all the time. Yeah, it's the one that, oh, there's where I got the sun, moon, earth. That's where it is. <laughs> I knew it was in my brain from somewhere. Um, so this is a great example. This snippet is, is great. It's the one that I use all the time, too, because it helps remind you about some of the things that are available that if you need to, you can then, they, they give you samples right here, or you can jump into help and get further ones. What we're going to do is we're going to take a break, a 10-minute break. <laughs> See you in 10 minutes. 10. So let's move on to, and this is going to be a cool topic. This is one of the, the most fun things in the world. I think this is, um, to me, when I first saw this, this was freaky cool. If you watched the first session, you've seen this, but I want to show you a little bit more about this. It's writing help. Now, mm. you putting in help into your tool, especially if you're going to give it to somebody else, is, the, is, is to me one of the most important things in the world. However, when I started scripting, Putting in comments and putting in help was the last thing that I did. You know, it was just bang out the script and, can I have that? Yeah, here. So you've given us this capability of creating the same kind of help that all the commandlets come with. Yep. And it's fast and it's easy. All we have to do is do it, right? Yep. Just do it. Well, let's... No more excuses. No, and I think that's no more excuses is the point to that. So let me uh, open up the new set. So we're going to go on into the help system. Oh, and it would be helpful... Ah, see, helpful. Here's what we're going to talk about. Why you should provide help, which we started talking about because you should. Um, 3 a.m. in the morning. By the way, sometimes it's your scripts. I've done that myself. Uh -huh. Like something bad's going on, and, and it's like, oh, well, it's my script, so I know what I did. But I wrote it a long time ago. So the fact that it's helpful, you know, it's helpful, it's got comments, it's it used variable names that you can read. These are things that are, are good. Yeah, and so, you know, admins, it, it, you're the tool maker now, so you have to take the responsibility of making sure that admins get the same expected behavior from your tools that they get from the PowerShell team, the Active Directory team, all of those teams that, that write help. And so you want to have this de uh, detailed help, and it's so simple to do. Let me start off by, by showing you the help file for the help. <laughs> um, the, uh, just, just because, I, well, okay, I thought it was funny. This is what, module six? Six. Um, and so let me just say, get help on, and 
it's comment-based help. And so uh, I'm just going to search for comment. And it, it, it just brought the file up for me, but it's about underscore comment underscore based underscore help. As a matter of fact, you can see right across the top here Good Lord. is the name of the, the, the file. Yeah. And I have to tell you, this is uh, definitely one of the help files I spent quite a bit of time reading because of a couple of notes in here. First of all, comment-based help gives you the same format that all the other commandlets are when, when somebody uses it and they see it, it looks the same way. But there are a couple of things you're not going to get with comment-based help. How many of you, and go ahead and raise your hands because we can see you, honestly. We can, uh, it's freaking you out. We can see you. How many of you <laughs> have uh, done update help with version 3 PowerShell? Yeah. So here's the deal. When you write comment-based help, you're not going to get that feature of update help you're not going to be able to update your help and have this magical thing happen with your tools, although it does tell you why briefly in here. And this is kind of a tricky subject. So you're going to be able to do, create your own help. There's also another way to do this, right? This, this XML base. XML, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and that's where you get all those features, right? Where you can, you can have it do an update help if you have it you know, stored in a, where you can run your own and do all this. I know June Blender was writing all a bunch of stuff up about it. Yeah, it's actually part of the modules is required for update help. We have yeah, a URL. The modules. When you do a module, you can have a help URL to go get it. To go get it. And yeah. so the XML-based stuff and, and the update help stuff is a little bit more complicated. And if you want to dive into that and get in that, you certainly can. But let's get good at some of the comment-based help, because this is a part that a lot of people leave out. By the way, that's one of those things I just, here's, here's the acid yeah. test. Like, when do I use comment-based help versus when do I use this XML and the update help and all that stuff? And I'd say, if somebody give, are you charging money for your scripts? Right. If you're charging money for your scripts, use XML-based help. If you're not charging money for your scripts, Probably the other one's just fine. Now that's not entirely true. You know, there's a little bit back and forth, but that's a that's a good determinant. And I've written a lot of commandlets, and uh, a comment-based help is fast. It's easy. It works. And unless you're right, unless I'm selling it to somebody where I need to be able to do updates and stuff, comment-based help for me is the most wonderful thing in the world. So. Guys, let me show you a quick example of comment-based help, and it's all in this help file. Every single thing is in here, so make sure you, you check out the help file for it. What I'm going to do is, whoops, not even close. <laughs> Under bar. <laughs> I know, <laughs> keep telling me because I, bah. So, if you watched the last one, we showed you comment-based help real quick, but we didn't show you the whole story. First of all, and, and this is going to be kind of interesting because I'm, I'm going to ask Jeffrey a couple of bizarre questions here. <laughs> comment-based help is, and I want to show you guys, the comment-based help, first of all, placing it. Notice um, we've got uh, block comments, which yeah. are the block comments, first of all, yeah, which I love them. are great. Now, usually in a lot of languages, when you comment something out, that means that the parsing engine in that ignores it. That's not the case here in comment no. based help. As a matter of fact, we're paying attention to what you do. See, we not only know when you download stuff from the internet, we're watching what you do in your comments. So, careful what you type in there. Um, like Santa. Yes. <laughs> no, he's like naughty Santa. and nice. So, I've got one keyword in here that I want you, want you guys to see. It's called dot synopsis. And I wanna, I'm going to call it, this is the short description. just want to make sure I don't have anywhere. Okay, good. And I want you to see the, the cause and the effect of this. First of all, before I um, um, run this, or actually, I'm going to just run it. And notice it's called get test help. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do get help on get test help. I want you guys to see that. Looky, synopsis. This is the short description. So you can start adding in the same things that commandlets have. But I mean, here's yeah. so notice you got name, <clears throat> and you didn't do anything for that. We gave you that. Yeah, you gave us that and then, free, and then go down. You give syntax, syntax for, for free, and uh, and uh, then some related links. And if you did minus full, minus full, yeah, let me do that full real quick. Now just so you see what's happening here, is. Oh, we don't have any parameters defined yet, but oh, no, no, yeah. Parameters. You guys so are what, see. what happens is this this help, we're actually pretty clever about this stuff. What we do is we take a look at the document, we take a look at the metadata, and from that metadata, we're able to generate a certain amount of help. And then, oh, you gave us some extra information, so we'll bring that in. And oh, you give us some more. 
And we just incrementally build this up. By the way, that's why some people were, were outraged, outraged when they heard that we had removed help from version 3. And we said, well, no, it's downloadable, yeah. all this, and we explained all that. And they were outraged. And then they got it, and then they're like, oh, but there is help here. I mean, I wish you had more descriptions, but the help's all here. Right. <laughs> the answer is yes, that's right. So what happens is, because we have all the structure, we're able to generate the help files on the fly, but there aren't the strings, you know, these descriptions. And that's the stuff that you say update help to get. In fact, I want to show you guys this real quick of what Jeffrey's talking about. I'm going to go back to one of my Module 5 demos where um, let me just do, uh, as a matter of fact, let me go back to Module 4 where um, I had one of them. So you can see this. We, we did show this a little bit in the last one, but this is a great thing to show. So I'm going to run the uh, Making Objects uh, uh, script. And so six, remember it's console, you want to add the extra dot in there. And I think it was get comp info. Let me check here. Get comp info. Good. Watch. We didn't do any comment-based help back in that module. So, or back in that section. So, boy, I can't even type get help anymore. Get help. Get comp info. And I want you to see what Jeffrey's talking about. Look, I'm going to do dash full. Look at everything that they're already providing us. Look at what they've done. Those parameters we were creating, They've already put those parameters in. If you filled in, whether it could do pipeline or, or whatnot, you're going to see that later. That gets all filled in. They've already built the syntax out for us correctly. All we had, they gave us the name. All we have to do is go fill in a few more things. Hey, can you uh, open it up a second? Edit oh, it? Edit it? Sure. Yeah, because there was a comment in the, in the uh, help form, or in the Q&A form, I wanted to address. Okay, and grab one of those and uh, add a bunch of aliases. To Any oh of them. oh I, okay yeah, okay, like computer okay, okay. name so computer name we'll add in okay well we'll add in add a couple um, add a couple so um, we want host quotes um, oops yeah String. quotes thank you host um, um, host name and comma. so is it is it is comma, comma and it's host or yeah let's do that host name host name um, IP address, and then we'll be done. IP address. And paren. Okay. In paren and bracket. Got it. Okay. So and let me uh, run this real quick. And, and do it again. <coughs> Actually, you know what you can do? Here's even better. Say get help, and then the name of the command, get comp info, minus parameter, Ooh. computer Ooh. name. Ooh, parameter, computer name. Which, this is really cool, because, yeah. Oops, it would help if I could spell mm. correctly. Computer name. And so you see, someone said, oh, well, they, they, you know, what, how do I get the aliases? They're right there. They're right here. See, but there are it, your aliases. Isn't it correct, though, in PowerShell 2.0, though, I don't think they did display okay. in the parameters, So, but uh -huh. it, it, which is another reason why you need to be that running sounds V3. sounds right, because I remember being yeah. cranky about that. Yeah, I, I, I think I remember. So this is another reason to run PowerShell V3, because it could be confusing. If you have aliases and you don't know how to see them, that's a problem. In V3, <laughs> though, you will show you those aliases when you look at the full help. That's where you see all the definition, all the parameter attributes. So it's dash full on get help, or as we just did here, which is really cool, if you just call up that individual parameter. So I'll show it to you the other way. You can also do it, you know, if you're doing dash full, you'll also see it as we go up to the parameter. Dun, 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 right there. So computer name, and you see the aliases for it. So what the, what's happening already is, is awesomely cool. You're already building a help file for me. Now all we need to do is start adding in a little bit more. Yes. So with this example, I want you guys to notice, I just added in the synopsis. Now there's other stuff that we're going to add in in a second, but there's a couple of locations where you can put this block comment mm. of help. Now you can put it like I have it right here, right in front of the function. Be careful of spacing. It'll be okay if you do one. It's not going to be okay if you do too. So let me show you. you. You you need to put these together and be a little bit careful about the spacing of it. So get help on get comp info, and now you're going to see. Well, there's no synopsis. It's the spacing in here. So you want these guys to be tied together. But there's a couple of other locations where we could hide this, and I'm really interested in your opinion. <laughs> I usually. I, <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> Turn the center camera on. <laughs> I'm not that interested in his. No, I actually really am interested in his opinion on this. I usually put 
my help r before the function. Yeah. But th this is kind of tricky, though. I'm going to hit Control X and take it out there. There's a couple of other places, right? We can put it um, here as right under the name inside of the function, right? We can put it there. If you tell me so. No, we can't. We can put it there. Okay. Um, we can also put it down here at the very end, making sure that, again, spacing is, is crucial, making sure that the end of the block comment is right here at the end of the squiggly. Mm. Where do you like your help? Always at the top. So here's the thing. I, I, I have to say that some of these, like, it works here and it doesn't work there, drives me nuts. I am not entirely sure where in that code base <laughs> that made sense that made it made made sense to do. So and especially I mean if it was like wildly like, oh, you know, of course people want to put it here versus there. But uh, anyway, so I just learn one thing and I don't think about the others. Ever, 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 ever. And I put it at the top and I make sure there's no spaces and I don't ever think about it again. And don't in fact, you know what? I don't even do that. I just type control J because <laughs> right, the next right. step is synopsis. Right. Who? Okay, stop. Okay, you, you hit it. Good. Okay, spell synopsis. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I bet you, you yeah, English, I I bet you English majors are like, well, of course, it's S something. It's, it's easy. Or no, you spell it out. I'm a physics guy, right? I can't spell synopsis. Like I can, I can sort of say it. Am I saying it correctly? Well, you're saying it correctly, okay, but anyway. I can't spell it either. Exactly. <laughs> and you, right, you remember, you're talking to the guy who can't spell description, okay? Synopsis and all these other things. And I can't remember all the terms. So Control J and the the comment based help is the way I always, always, always do it. And as a matter of fact, we're going to use that. But uh, it, so here's the uh, uh, note, guys. Put your comment-based help right here at the beginning of the function. If you join us at, at PowerShell.org and with the scripting guy, we write, we have the scripting games. A great way for you to practice mm. ch doing challenges and scripting and getting feedback from the community to help you script better. You always see the comment-based help at the very top uh, uh, of the function when they're when they're writing it. Now, a couple of other things you can put in there is. Um, on comment based help. And let me go to example number two, where, and I'm not going to hand type all this out uh, so you can see it, but there's a couple of other things synopsis, description. If you want to give an explanation of what the parameter is, parameter, computer name, and then you can talk about what it is. And you can but notice there, okay, so let's stop there. So you say dash parameter, and you can give more details about that, and that gets, shows up in the help file. Uh, and you don't have to give it for all of them, you can give it for some and for not some, others. Yeah. yeah. And in this case, I think when we look at the script, I've, I've only given it for one, so that's, that's kind of cool. Um, you can do multiple examples, and you don't have to worry about numbering your examples or anything like that because they'll take care of it. You just say dot example, give us an example of how it's used, and you should give a lot of examples of the way that you intended this. Oh, please help me with this. I can't convince guys of this. You need to put in examples of how you intended and designed your commandlet to be used. Versus what? Versus a lot of times you'll see somebody will put in just one example. Yeah, no, don't do that. Yeah, please, please help yeah, us again, with this. Again, I would encourage you to take a look at uh, get, you know, get the help. Take a look at the examples for process. I mean, again, that's, I think we did a really good job there. And we showed all the various things you want to do. And it wasn't just, um, you, know, we, you might say we went a little bit overboard on get process. Because we also tried to teach you some scripting techniques. But we did this in the context of, hey, here are the sort of things that you're going to do uh, with this. You're going to run this, and then you're going to pipe it to that. You're going to run this, and then you're going to put it in an object, and then you're going to do that. All those things that you think are going to be common usage patterns, I mean, right, you wrote the darn thing, so you should have a clear <laughs> idea as to what you think people are going to what do. What it's supposed to do. Now, indeed, sometimes you get surprised by things, but in general, if you see something, people doing something clever or you want people to emulate, you got to show them. Right, because people's again, again conceptually. Here's the way you want to think about it. You want to think about it as people's pe people who people. have hair, <laughs> their hair is on fire, <laughs> and the last thing that they want to do is to spend time like trying to figure stuff out. Help and and, and particular examples are just this clear cut way. Like, look, don't don't you don't have to figure it out. Just here, try this. And uh, if you want to get into the details, there's something called Vygotsky's activity theory, where competence uh, uh, pr comes after performance, which is to say you get people doing something above their level of competence by following your examples. And in doing so, then they're able to learn, oh, okay, and then fill in with competence. Oh, I see how that really
really works. So anyway, there's theory behind this. Use lots of examples. So, Vygotsky? Vygotsky. Vygotsky, Vygotsky. was this uh, Russian psychologist, did something called activity theory. Um, the bunch, that influences a bunch of the things we do. You know, we, we have these things called Jeffreyisms. This is going to become one of them. One of my favorite ones you had written a blog on, and this this is when I'm scripting, I think of this. Is 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 um, and also when I'm doing help, I actually think of this. And I'll see if I can get the quote correctly. But you were quoting, I think, somebody else, and I'm sure you probably remember who. Um, and the quote was, um, "A vision without action is just a dream." Yeah. And so when or I'm working with a commandment or, or <laughs> hallucination, yeah. Um, when I'm actually writing a commandlet, the way I'm testing the commandlet, every way that I'm testing it, to me, should be an example yeah, in there. Exactly. That's the actions that I'm taking, is that if I envision that you should be able to use it this way, then that needs to be an example of, yeah. that you can type and that you can use. Yeah, so, you know another way to say it? It's the golden rule. Yeah. Do unto others as you would have be done done to you. When you're trying to learn something, how do you like to learn something? I bet you it's examples. So, and it's not Carlos, whatever. Or <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, take a look. I've got a couple of examples in here, and I, I want you to see this. This is the comp info commandlet. Um, the rest of the code has all been the same. This is what we were using earlier on. Uh, I haven't changed anything. Notice it's still ordered, all that kind of stuff. And so now we're adding in the, the, the help, support, and value to this. Let me run it, and so you can see that. Now we've got beautiful help, and we've done it correctly. So get comp info. Why don't you do show window? And I think you're right. Let's do show window. I, I've got to get in the habit of that because this is totally awesome. So as you can see, everything that I've written in here, everything that gets generated for me automatically, the description, look at the parameters, computer name I gave a definition to. So uh, da, 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 there's my definition. Also, this supports pipeline input. So now you're starting to see that being added in for me. Um, you can go down and here's each parameter. I, I guess I added in uh, uh, error logging as well, but notice I didn't add in a definition for log file. And then there's all Wait, of the examples. But, so show that. Where'd you get that text for, for error logging? For, for error logging? Yeah. Switch to turn on error logging. You know what? I have to take a look. Go look at the parameter. Uh, you didn't know that? I didn't know that. I, you, are you kidding me? Yeah, so go put a... Put that a, was as easy as doing that? Yeah, put a comment in front of log file and do it again. Guys, do you, do you see what he's, he's, he's showing me? I didn't know this. This is kind of freaky cool. Um, I'm going to put a comment... Worth your money to show up, wasn't it? It was worth my money to show up for this. It was definitely worth... <laughs> um, so let's put in um, uh, this... Wow, isn't this rocking? Well, well yeah, if it's going to work, wow, isn't this rocking... Um, rocking. So what you're saying is that's going to show up here. I don't know. Let's find out. Oh my God! I didn't know you could do that. that that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So there are again multiple ways to do things. Uh, <laughs> the best practice is probably going to be to put it up here in the examples and in and, and, and the parameter uh, where you're defining it. But that is awfully kind of cool. I didn't know that would happen. That's that's surprising. Um, and so you, you, we've got a nice help system at this point and all the help that we need for our people that are going to be working with this this command. This at this point has started to become something that is that looks, smells, and feels very professional. So you've got help that's in here. You, this commandlet um, produces objects. That's important. It produces objects. So it can work down the pipeline with select and where and, and, all, and convert to HTML and all that kind of stuff. I also have supported pipeline input for parameters that make sense that I might want to pipeline things to them, like computer names. Um, it's very helpful to think about what do you want to, what is going to need to be pipelined to this commandlet because you want to support pipeline input. We've actually been doing quite a bunch of stuff today with all of this. Yeah. By the way, so did you show them the examples? I'm sorry, I was looking, thinking about something else. Did, in the help. Oh, in the help. I think yeah. I did. Let me just pop it up again real quick. Down here. Oh, look how they, see they numbered the, the example. See, power shell guy, they, they numbered them. Um, there's the definite, you know, I wrote that in yeah, there. Yeah, so now here's the thing. Okay, now, now make this go away. Make this go away. Yeah, and let's change it a little bit. Let's, uh, let's, add, a, let's add like a host name alias to, to computer name. Ah, okay. so uh, computer name. What's alias um, host name? 
Yeah, so we'll do um, alias, whoops, bridge too far. There we go. Host name. Um, and then compile it. Oh, Did you yeah. just say compile it? Well, um, actually, that's what happens. That's what, so in, do days. you just want to show the help? Nope, no, 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 no. Now I want to run, now from here, say get comp info minus host name and then DC1 or whatever. Host name. Host name. DC. DC. Yeah, whatever. Carriage turn. Okay, guys, now watch this. So now go and select that, 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 that output. Oh, select the output. Yeah. What, like this? Yeah, and all the way up to the, all the, way up to the top. Oh. Yeah. Ooh. No, no, start with the command line. We're, we're going to, I'm showing oh, people okay. how to do help. Oh, okay. Oh, oh I mean. Yeah. Uh, so grab that. Grab this. Control C. Yeah. And then just go back up into, into the, this and you just say dot example and paste. Oh. Watch this. So you just say dot example. Dot example. Paste. And then do it again. And then you'll save it. And okay. I'll do a show. This is really cool because this is a nice way to do it really quick to get your examples in there with some results. Exactly. So you, people can see what the results are. So in this case, hope it works. Get, <laughs> get confused. Well, I'm going to feel real stupid if it doesn't. I show window. Let's scroll down here. I like this a lot because I, I know what this is. Yeah. You, know, you, make, you make it wider, but yeah. Yeah, we could uh, uh, do the formatting Same. a little bit different. We could use format commands, that kind of thing to get the formatting. But what an no, easy way wider, work. to grab it and put it into the help file. Yeah. I think that's awesome. Oh, that's totally cool. Well, guys, you know what? This is about all we need to do with help files. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Comment-based help is awesome. What you have to do is make sure that you're using it. We've gotten our code up to a point to where this is a viable tool now. What we're going to do is we're going to take a break, a 10-minute break. And when we come back, we're going to show you a little bit about error handling. What happens if we were running this and the computer wasn't available? We want to show you what happens, what PowerShell does by default, and how to control this, and how to create your own error log. And then we're going to start showing you the dangerous stuff. We've been getting information. I know. <laughs> not I, the Carlos danger no, stuff. Not the Carlos danger stuff. <laughs> We've been getting information. What happens when we want to set or change some information? Well, I like so, that. Set. set or change. So <laughs> see you in 10 minutes. 10. I was going to eat all these Oreo cookies before we went back on so that I had Oreo cookie stuff in my... Yeah, okay. No. Uh, it was no. not no. good. No. Error handling! Because I, I never make an error, so this one's all yours, babe, because I don't make mistakes. Well... <laughs> Clear, yeah, clearly, if you've, been, yeah. If, if you've watched a any of this... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good! So yeah, if you've been watching any of this, I constantly make, make, make mistakes. And I constantly, um, when I'm using commandlets, I'm going to make mistakes. And it's, it's really great to get a helpful or useful error message. And it's also really great to, to trap or grab hold of, uh, of, of an error message that doesn't make any sense and give me one that's, that does make more sense to me. And what we wanted to do is do some basic error handling. Now, there's, this can go very deep with the error handling, and, and what I've done is set up some, some simple examples of, of doing some basic error handling to get you started. And so let's take a look at this and see what you think. First of all, here's what we're going to do is we're going to show you how PowerShell treats things when errors happen. And this is actually what I think this is really cool, so this is going to be a fun little demo. And then we're going to show you how to start to trap when errors happen, and then how to deal with them, and something called a try-catch-finally block. And I've got a couple of examples. I have, obviously, since I have something that says a better example, you know I'm going to start with a lousy one, apparently. <laughs> and then I'll have a better one, and we'll see what goes from there. And if, oh, please uh, join it, because I'm going to screw this up. It's all about errors. That's all I, I yeah. So yeah, here's awesome. the deal. A dollar sign error action preference. This is one of the, the interesting things. This kind of freaks people out in yeah. PowerShell at first, that when they run something, mm -hmm. it just does it. Yeah. And it, it, to me, I, I'm just... That's what I want. Don't don't ask me. You know, are are you sure? Yeah, not, 
I was sure when I typed it in, just do it. And PowerShell does that. But there, that's actually controlled, though. Um, the error action preference of, of, of getting errors and how errors get handled as it goes through and it does things is something that gets controlled. And we have this error action preference variable. What, mm. is, what is this error action preference variable thingy? Yeah, so basically the, the, the issue is <clears throat> when something goes wrong, what is the right thing to do for the user? And the real answer is who the heck knows? Right? Um, could be this, could be that, could be that. So what we do is we have a default answer, and then we allow the user to decide to do something differently. Well, let me give you an example. So whenever you, we, as a developer, you write code, uh, there's always this issue of like the compiler. Should the compiler generate an error on the first error it sees, and then stop? Uh, and some of them used to work that way, and so you're like, oh, okay, great, I got an error, so I go fix that error, and then you compile again. It's like. Line, next line, next line, here's the error. It's like, okay, well, fine, fix that. Next line. And it's like, hey, you know what? Why don't you give them all to me, and then I'll fix them all at once. And, and so sometimes you want it that way. Sometimes it's like, hey, I'm going to go do something to a very large set of systems, but if something goes wrong, i got to stop like, and then roll it on back, right? Because it's all yeah. got to be perfect. And other times, it's like, what do I know? Uh, I think everything's going to be fine. I'm not sure what to do. Just, if something goes wrong, come back and tell me, and then we'll discuss it. And so that's what we do is we allow you to choose what uh, behavior you want to have. In fact, it's a little more, the story's a little bit more complicated than that. I wish I had a white, bo a white uh, board here. I'd describe it. But you can use fact, my hand. You can just draw on there. Well, you know, I've described this uh, um, in PowerShell. Um, it looks like a command line, right? A pipe to B, pipe to C. It looks like a traditional pipeline. But that's not at all the case. It's actually masking some amazingly powerful technology. And what happens is it's an actual an object flow engine where A, B, C are these compute units that then get hooked up in this directed graph. Notice I didn't say acyclic graph, directed graph. Um, and we pass control to one, and it runs. We output an object. We then give that to the PowerShell runtime engine, who looks at the data contract required by the next guy. And then the data engine does all this manipulation. Hey, okay. can he just accept it as is? Do I have to parse it and you know, match the properties? Do I have to do any coercion or casting or parsing required to give it to it? And then it hands it to it, and then it runs. Which is the magic about making the pipeline work. Which that is, is the magic. We, we got into it from an administrative level, but that's, that's definitely deeper. But that is that magic that's making that pipeline work. Exactly. Now, the original design was that the pipeline was just one of n streams of objects. So you have this object and you have any of these n of these streams. You got the error stream, you, sorry, the output stream, the error stream, the verbose stream, the warning stream, etc. And the idea was that each one of these streams could have their own pipelines. Now that was the original design. Turns out we didn't implement it that way. But <laughs> 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 I still don't know who did that. Anyway. <laughs> Called Bruce Payette. No. no, no, no. <laughs> anyway, so but what we do do is we have we do treat it largely like that, but then the actions, the point is that ultimately what you'd like to be able to do is to say on the error stream, I can just run an entire another pipeline against the error actions. Now, we don't implement that. What we did was we have a set of enumerated actions, and it's a little bit simpler to understand. As a matter of fact, let's, let's take a look at some of those. So first of all, guys, this is um, uh, the the first demonstration I have in here. And I'm going to run these. We're in mod seven. Yeah, mod, module seven, which we, and these are the scripts for module seven. And so first of all, we have the dollar sign error action preference variable, which shows you what the default is. And this is what PowerShell is going to do when it runs into an error. The error is going to get displayed he's just, and he's going to continue on. So Let's take a look at what that looks like. I've got a simple get WMI 132. Oh, a a yeah, bunch of people yeah. will never remember this, the dollar oh. error action preference. So the way I remember this, because I don't remember this, is you do a dollar sign variable. Oh, sorry. Sorry, do a dir space variable colon. Oh, okay, variable colon. Star pref star. Star pref I know star. star. Pref, pref. F, oh, pref. F. And you see, there's, we have a set of preferences, and one of them is the error, error action, action preference. preference. So that's how you're going to remember it. 
That's I know cool. some variable somewhere had something to do with errors or something to do with preferences. Use wildcards and you'll be able to find it. And you'll be able to find it. That's awesome. Now, guys, I want you to notice that um, we're not going to change the system default right now. Uh, instead, we're going to do it with the commandlets. Take a look at this get WMI Win32 computer name. I want you to notice I'm not doing anything special, but I've got DC, not online, and client. So you can pretty much guess that there's going to be a failure. Notice what PowerShell does when I run this. I'm going to clear the screen down here. And by the way, for you at home, you'll want to change DC and client to be like local host. Yeah, exactly. Oh, good, great. Yeah, yeah, great. That was that was that was a good point. So let me go ahead and run it because all it's all going to fail if you do it. So let me run it. You see, the first one gets executed. So that was it was DC. We're trying to reach not online. We didn't get it, but look. I want you to notice, we got the first one, we get an error message saying, hey, that server um, isn't available, and then it went and it did the next one. In other words, PowerShell's default is to continue. So here's the error, but I'm going to keep trying, and I'm going to keep going. Now, I want you to see what some of the other options are besides continue. Sometimes when you're running this, well, you know, I know there are some computers out there that aren't going to be available. And I don't want my screen bleeding. I don't want to see it on the screen. I just want it to run. Well, take a look. We've got get WMI object, Win32 computer name, same problem. But now I'm going to use, and I've used the abbreviated versions of this. So let me show you what the full versions are on the slide here first. We've got error action, which can be EA, and we've got error variable. Error action means we can change what with the action that PowerShell is going to do, and we can store the errors in error variable. Now, if you're thinking about this, well, if I store the errors in error variable, oh, and I wanted to make an error log, I could probably just outfile that variable, but we'll, we'll get there. So huh. you can see that we're going to, so take a look. I've got error action, silently continue, and EV, error variable, my error. So I'm going to run this guy. And let me clear the screen so you can see what's um, going to happen here. Now, it's still pausing because it's trying that computer that's not online. But look, this time, I just got the results displayed. I didn't see any error messages. But here's the best part. If I want the error messages, dollar my error has the error message in it. Also, and, and think about this, because we're going to do this in our script in a second. I want that error in a log file. Well, pipe it out to file, uh, whatever you want to call it, error log or whatever. So you can then quickly dump the error out to a file. This is kind of cool. I like this because it continues. Now, this is not something, oh, by the way, I have to tell you that um, this is a Don Jones uh, uh, thing. He was trying to get this to break because he was doing not online and he couldn't get any errors. It kept returning mm -hmm. results. And he was at a client. He's going DC, not online, cl you know, client. And it kept coming back and it kept giving him an answer for not online. And he's like, what's going on? And one of the guys says, we have a computer called not online. <laughs> <laughs> Which apparently has no security <laughs> because it lets Don Jones query it. Yeah, because they're letting Don Jones query it. So let me show you another way, though. And Jeffrey mentioned this. Sometimes, though, when an error That's occurs, a way to set low expectations at work. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Ping not online. Well, wait a minute. Why are we calling it not online? If, I can, if it's online, I don't get it. It's, uh. So Good. Jeffrey mentioned this. Another thing that we can do is maybe when an error does occur, we need to go stop. Stop, 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 because we're going to have to do a rollback or something like that. So we can do an error action of stop. And as you can imagine, I'm going to run this. Let me clear the screen down here. Yeah, let me run it up here. It'll go through, and what you're going to see is, as soon as he errors out, notice he didn't do the third computer. He stopped right away on this guy. Just stop. And now we could go on and do something else. The last one that you can do for error action is inquire. And this, is, this can be useful when you're, you're testing something and it's not working and you're trying to figure out what's going on. Let me show you. I'm going to run this one, inquire. I usually use this when I'm trying to debug what's going on with my commandlet or something like that. Comes up and says, hey, look, I've got this error. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to continue, not continue? Do you want me to suspend? Suspend is kind of cool, right? I love suspend. Because if I suspend... 
See the special prompt? The command's still there, but in, in anything that I may have in variables and stuff, I can start to look at it, right? Yes. I can start to inspect what's going on. This is actually kind of cool. Um, <laughs> except I forgot how to exit the uh, suspend. Is it just exit? <laughs> Think type get, my friend. Think, Think type get. <laughs> Think type get. Yes, it is. Uh, I think, see, type, think, think type, type get. get. It's, it's, it. So do I want to continue? Sure, I can continue, and it'll do the last one. So inquire can be really useful if you're having an issue, you're not sure what's going on, and you want to kind of debug what's going on. Now, I'm going to start to use some of these so that we can start to do some error handling. And we're going to start off with... Could we say you didn't show oh. the cool stuff? What? What? I didn't show what? cool stuff? I yeah. thought that was cool. Well, that's cool, but you didn't show the cool stuff. Oh, well, then show us the cool stuff. Okay, so let me show you this one. So so it turns out that there's, uh, uh, on, on Windows, uh, there are no process IDs that are end in three. It's actually, I think, any odd number of process IDs, right? So if you do GPS, Seriously? pipe two. Yeah. <laughs> pipe two. Uh, select, select ID. Notice, notice they're all even numbers. Okay. And the reason for that is I've never actually noticed this. I don't know. Ask Krasinovich. <laughs> some, some good reason for yeah, it. I don't know. Krasinovich anyway, so, so here's the deal. So you say stop, process, so ID 13, 23, 33. Okay, and, and, and voila, you're going to get three errors. Right. Okay, so that's, oh, that's okay. the point is that, is that that's a safe thing to go experiment with. Okay, this error actions, right? So we, you, you saw the error variables, right? Or sorry, the, the error action, right? Uh, all that good stuff. But now I want to take a second here on this error variable. Okay. And I'm going to use E, right? Because it's like T, but it's E. It's like e. T, but it's E. Because it means <laughs> error, right? <laughs> so now what I have is E, okay? And I have all the errors. So that's dollar sign E of zero. Okay. Now oh, the point the of this one? is yeah. the first one, the second one, the, the point of this is it's very, very rich. Now there's a trick to this, and 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 it's a general PowerShell technique, right? So what I'm going to say is okay. Well, I bet you there's more to it than that, right? So I say pipe to get member, and oh, there's a ton of stuff. Look at all this great stuff. And I say oh well, I'd like to see that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say dollar sign e is zero. I'm just do the first one. Format list star. And it gives me the same gives thing. You, yeah. Okay, so, so what's happening is that the error object is treated specially by the host. Okay, details don't matter. It's treated specially by the host. In order to see all the rest of the, the parameters or the, the properties, you have to say minus force. Okay, so this, by the way, is a general PowerShell thing, and general PowerShell will, will do something. And if you say, no, I wanted to. I really wanted to do this. You just say minus force, and we'll do it. So, you know, if if you try and kill LSASS, <laughs> why don't you try that? Do, serious? It's your machine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no. Well, I'll try it. I'll I'll, my, I'll, I'll, well, I'll try it. Yeah, yeah. Because I bet you it'll work. So. Oh, I like this. I bet you it'll work. Let's see. <laughs> yes. Get process pipe to LSASS. Or so get process LSASS. Pipe to stop process. Now, if this does not work, Jason's taken over while I spend a bunch of time trying to <laughs> restarting okay. your machine. Okay. So, um, and I wouldn't do this until. By the way, don't do this in PowerShell version two. Yeah. <laughs> if you get version two, don't do that. Okay. <laughs> no, I think it'll work in two. You should try it. <laughs> so what happens is, oh, look great. here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And so what we did was, by the way, because uh, this because did not used to do this at some point, and I used to make these mistakes, so I said, hey, you know what? We should do this. So what's happening here is it'll come in and it'll say, uh, uh, oh, are you trying to process, are you trying to terminate uh, um, a, uh, a process that you didn't start? Oh, okay. And if okay. so, it says, hey, that doesn't sound right. Doesn't sound good. Warn, 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 warn. And well, by the way, let's make sure I get this right. Get no. No. Is it no? no? No. Now, if I wanted to, and I'm, I'm really, t here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a pound sign in front just in case. <laughs> oh, know, so I don't, smart man, yeah. So that, no matter what. And what you do is you said, no, I really want to have that do it. You just say minus force. And then we'll do that. We won't tell you anything. We'll just go whack that thing. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now, back here. You say, hey, I want to see these things. I really want to see it. So show it to me minus force. Force. For, oh, force. 
and you see oh, there they are. we have yeah, all the yeah. details, okay? And there's some really cool stuff here, including target object. So target object, 13. 13. So wait a second. So you mean I could have said like dollar sign E dot target object? Would it be E dot zero? Oh, oh, so you can get it for all of them? Or yeah. you can do the individual and elements. And so this so. is the point. So now imagine, so the point is I'm going to do something on, uh, I'm going to perform an operation on a thousand things, 10,000 things. 13 of them fail. Oh, which 13? Well, good luck, my friend. No, no, no. You capture it as an error variable. Right. You have the target object, and those are the 13. And, and you, you say, know what? now I do a remediation action. You say, dollar sign four, you know, sorry, uh, four, four, four E, four E each. <laughs> dollar sign, well, what's short for E? I guess I'm kind of dumb, dumb dear. E? Um, oh, I guess I'll go back to T for each T <laughs> and dollar sign E. <laughs> This is not best practice, by the way. <laughs> and then you do something with it, right? So then you do a remediation action. Well, anyway. Oh, sorry. E dot, e dot target object. Target object. And then yeah. you can do something Yeah, and then you do some action. It. You know, restart Now, it, that's interesting something. because you, I bet you here in a moment you're going to help fix my code to be even better like that because yeah, I did oh, something I else yeah. that was a... a but, but before we do that, you, you didn't, you didn't tell, are you going to tell them about the views? The views? The views. The views. Category view? Category view? You don't know about category view? I, I don't think so. What, what are you talking about? Okay, so again, there's some error. There's something like an error view or uh, error, I don't know. Anyway, so how do you find out? Dir variable. There's something about errors. So let's just look. And so, by the way, there's maximum error count. Like, don't oh, screw okay. that up or... Okay. No, so there's um, error, view. error view, and it's so normal. normal. View. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, that's odd, right? So, yeah, that's so odd. let's take a look. Let's say, and by the way, here's another cool tech trick. Let's on error view. I don't know if it'll work on this one. Equals. Oh, that's that's not good. Anyway, so you got to know <laughs> category view. Okay, so you just got to know this one. And there's two views: normal view and category view. Okay, so. Before I set that, let's make some errors. So error number one, stop process uh, ID 13. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> don't do that. 13 and some nonsense. Okay, and those are, those are my errors. Yeah? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say dollar sign category view, sorry, dollar error view equals category view. And I'm going to do them again. <gasps> Look at that. Oh, so these are so these are very pithy ways. And so instead of, I mean, take a look, blah, 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 blah versus, blah. hey, object not found. In 32, it, it's 13. It gives you the value There's of what it was doing. What was going on? I was doing a stop process. What was the exception? Process command exception. You know, oh. I like that a lot, and I haven't seen that before. Yeah, I... no, here's the trick. It's always been there, my friend. Really? Yeah, look here. So here's the text. Here's where it happened. Category info. It's right there. Oh, I see what you're saying. So that view is just showing the, 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 the terse category info that's there. Yeah. Oh, that is awesome. Now, here's the thing. That that thing there, um, it's, it's, it's not localized. It, that's going to be the same everywhere, as is this this fully qualified error ID. Did you ever pay attention to that? Do you know what that is? Oh, well. So look here. Let's do this fully qualified. Let's set it back a second and run it again. It's a normal view. Okay. Let's do that. Stop process 13. Okay. This, uh, this text is all going to be localized. One language to the other. One language so to imagine another. you're sitting there in Poland, and uh, you run this, and uh, you get this this error message, and you're like, oh, I wonder what that is. Well, if you take, I guarantee you, if you take this Polish error text and put it into Bing, it's going to say... Something back in Polish, I don't probably. Know. Well, or no, or prob I don't know. Or it's going to say, I don't know. But this is this fully qualified error ID. Now, look what it says. Process, no process found for given ID, comma and then a location. So a specific error, comma, a location. And, and the goal of this is you take this guy and you cut it, and then you go in here oh. to 
Bing, the best search engine in the world, and you paste it, then you find all the information about, about that specific thing. So it that acts like a unique search engine optimization for all the content about an error you're going to have. Again, you're going to have errors. You're going to have errors all the time. And so how do you get help about the errors? Well, the answer is, well, sometimes we have help documentation, but the space of errors is pretty vast. Mm -hmm. In general, what you're going to find is that somebody else had this problem, and uh, they've got some blog somewhere that describes what was going on, and, and then this fully qualified error ID helps you find it. I love that. It, it, that that really makes it helpful then to find those errors. And you said it's not lo it's not localized, so yeah, it's, it's, never al localized. it's always going to look just like that. So you, you put it into Bing, it rocks no matter where you're at. Right. And you, so that also means you might find some Polish blogs about this, but <laughs> they might not help <laughs> might, you. Might help now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Since I can't read it, so. <laughs> well, no. Then you can, you can send it to a translator. I, I can send it to a translator. Do we do do, do we do that in Bing? Do yeah. We, do we translate? Sure. Oh, Somewhere. Awesome. Somewhere. Okay. I don't, but someone does. Okay, folks, so take a look. We're going to do uh, a little error handling here using this error action and error variable. And I'm going to show you a simple way to do this. And I, I want you to see the script that I have here. This is the start, number two, and it's our comp info one. I'm going to minimize the parts that we, we've already looked at. Um, the switch, error log to make an error log. And I want you to notice that I've already got a log file set up at c colon error log dot text. And so let me just go ahead and, and minimize him. My process section, take a look at what I'm doing here. I'm going to uh, take a bunch of computers and I'm going to grab some information. I want some inventory information. So I've got like three WMI commands here and I'm going to create an object. This is fine and dandy, but you know what's a real huge waste of time is if I'm hitting a computer that's in that collection and it's not online, well, it's going to be banging all these commands at it, trying it over and over again. It's going to be slow. It's going to be trying to retry. And then when it, it fails on the first WMI command, what's it going to do? It's going to go to the next command, and it's going to fail on that one. I know it's going to fail, but it's going to sit there, and it's going to retry, and it's going to retry. And then it's going to fail on the third one, but it's going to sit there and you know retry it and retry it. What I'd really like is if, oh, man, if you get an error, just... Let's, let's, let's not do this again. Let's not keep going through all of these. So take a look. I've got something called a try-catch block. Now, this is one of the ways that you can try and trap errors and then decide to do something. So look at the simple format here for it. I've got dollar sign computer equals not online. We know that that doesn't work. So I've got this try-catch, and technically it's try-catch finally, right? Yeah. And, and a lot of times, finally always executes. It's just, always. Yeah, a lot of times in a lot of stuff that we're doing in PowerShell, you don't always see the finally in here because we just don't need it. Yeah. So, so if you take a look, I've got try. Just be clear, so finally is like when you want to do some cleanup, you're doing something, you've allocated some resources, and whether you succeed or fail, you want to clean up. So that's yeah, what finally is for. And so if you're a developer, you probably know the try-catch finally really well. You can have multiple catches that catch at different levels. We're not going there, but this is in PowerShell. It's a very powerful well, implementation. Actually, you know, it's worth making a point. Sorry, this oh, is completely yeah, off topic, completely off topic. But so here we've been teaching you the scripting, and it just kind of popped in my head, this try-catch finally. There, here, there's this little secret thing going on. You've been learning C Sharp. You know, by and large, everything that you've learned here, I, by and large, if you go pick up a C Sharp book, you're like, oh, look, these guys stole all this stuff from PowerShell, you know? <laughs> yes, they did. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes they did. They did. <laughs> they did. No, in fact, uh, you'll find it very, very similar. Uh, we chose the, to be very much match. And if you know C, same thing. It's going to, you know, C stole from C++, which stole from C, and we stole from them all. And, and, I, and there are variations. Again, I mentioned to you how Bruce and Jim Truer and I struggled with this. Hey, you know, if you just took any of those languages and tried to make a shell out of it, and people have, and they're really crappy shells. It turns out that that syntax just doesn't work for an interactive shell. You need something different. And so we struggled with that, and we came up with what we think is a good interactive shell but also plays homage to these line of, of, of uh, programming languages. And so if you've learned PowerShell and you decide, hey, I'd like to go on and do something else, uh, you'll find it a, a, a pretty smooth transition. It is different, but it's very f comfortable. And I want to point that out that a, a lot of research uh, a, a, over many, many years went into uh, you know, admins doing administrative stuff. 
very verbose languages versus very terse languages. And this really works well. C-based style, this kind of thing works so well for admins. And I just want to reiterate what Jeffrey is saying. If you decide to start moving towards, well, I want to do some more development and I need Visual Studio. The language that you're going then for is C Sharp. You will not, you will be amazed at how much you already know because PowerShell is, is written very similar to using that. And try catch is a great example because it's the same kind of try catch that they would be using in C Sharp works the same way. So take a look at my try here. What you do is you put the, your code that you want to try to execute that you think might generate an error you put that in the try block. And notice what I've got here. I've got Win32 um, uh, operating system. This dollar sign computer might fail. So I put in an error action. I want you to stop and then put the error into a variable called current error. So I'm going to try that. Now, here's the important part to this. You need to stop. That's what gets caught so that we can go to the catch block. If you said continue, well, it's going to continue. It's not going to go to the catch block. The idea here is try this, and if it blows up, stop and let me catch it and put up a nicer error in this case. Look at my catch. I'm going to do right warning. I'm going to put up a slightly nicer error message or a different error message. I could also do some remediation code in here. Maybe I could you know, try to test the connection to the computer and see if it's really online or not. So let me just uh, run this for you so you can see what's going to happen. I'll clear the screen down here. Voomp. Now, of course, we're waiting for it to fail because not online. But look, warning, you done made a boo-boo with the computer, not online. Yes, cool. Is that kind of cool? That's, that's, it's really cool. So it created a situation, stopped, and now I get to do my own thing. So the point of the try-catch block is try what you think might cause a problem, and then error action, stop, and then you can deal with it. The other cool thing about this is, is I haven't lost the error, and even the cool stuff that Jeffrey was showing us, dollar sign, current, error, there's the error message. And because RPC server is not available, so I can now then put that into a file, however I wanted to do it. In fact, that's what we have right here under the better try catch. I notice I've got help here. Uh, this is our function comp info. I'm going to minimize the stuff that we don't need. Take a look. I've got my try block, and I'm trying to make an object for each computer. So I've got all of my codes in here. And I'm, whoops, went a bridge too far. Uh, all of my code's in here because I'm trying to make this object, and I know the computer might fail. Well, I know that the first time it might fail, I certainly don't need to do the rest of this code. So I'm going to go over here and go error action stop. I'll put the error into a variable, but we'll look at my catch block. Now I've decided that in my catch block down here, I've decided to, going to give you a warning, but... If you turned on the switch, which we started out with this morning, error oh, log. I wondered where that would be. I you wondered. I was going to wrap it up towards the end. I got an amazing kind of guy. So, uh, rabbits and all kinds of stuff. So, if error log, so if you turn on that switch parameter, here's what it's going to do it's going to take the date, put it out to a file. Um, I've got a force so that it can, if the file already exists, it'll just uh, overwrite it. It'll take the computer name and put it out to that file, and then the current error. Now, the stuff that Jeffrey was showing us would also be really useful, uh, especially that target instance kind of thing would be useful here. But let me show you how this, how this is going to look. So let me run this, clear the screen. Whoa, stop doing that. Mm -hmm. There we go. Down here, clear the screen. Get comp info. Computer name, not online. Uh, we'll do DC so you see that one works, and then we'll do not online. Now, if I don't put in the error log switch, there won't be an error log. So I want an error log. So I'm going to put in the switch parameter for error log, and let's see what happens. Well, there's DC. That's awesome. That's great. I love it. Whoop, uh, it's whoop. a yeah, whoop, 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 whoop. Oh, you done made a boo-boo with a computer that's called not online. Really, um, I wonder what you did. I, I turned on an error log, so there should be an error log out here. So let's see what the error log has. Um, uh, DIR, do I have? I'll look error log.txt so I can grab hold of that error log. 
and now I've got the errors in there. And if I was making multiple mistakes since it's getting appended, it would be added in Ooh. and added in. So this is a simple way to do error handling, but it's a, it, it gets you started down the road of being able to trap errors when they occur and then do something about the error and record it into a log file. So while it's simple, this is actually a great place to start with your error handling and, and working with it. Yeah, yeah that kind of log file is kind of whack, kind of whack, but... Yeah, kind of whack, but yeah. Does write error, write event log? Oh, yeah, but see, that's that's the other cool thing, right? So yeah. you guys know that you've seen us do like get event log. Instead of writing to your own log file, yeah. why not write to the real one? Yeah, show them that. Um, so oh, you we, have, we should tell, I think we have a little bit of time. Yeah. We should show we should. them that and then ha tell them about the conversation we had last night. Which one? Well, I was drinking, so why okay. am I supposed to remember? Okay, so you remember that, and okay. so guys, you've got this commandlet, right? Yeah, show this. This is good. Um, uh, write. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to show it. Write event log, um, log name, and you get to tell us where you want to write it. So let's say you wanted to uh, application. Application is a great place for this to go, and you know I'm gonna. Uh, I have to specify a source, right? And yes, and it is. Jason saves you money. Jason saves you. It sounds like an insurance commercial at this point. Money. Um, what else do we need? Uh, I'm say, just, doing, just say, uh, say. Uh, um, um, no, no. Um, um, entry type uh, information uh, is information. Yeah, and which then, you and would then a put message. in like a script. You'd probably do entry type of like error. Error. Yeah, yeah. but this one's different. Where this tees up the exception, and then say minus message. Message and then say quote uh, <laughs> script foo, foo ran ran. Okay, so you could put this into your script and of course fill in with variables for the message and stuff like that. And so I'm going to run this. Oh, event ID. We forgot event ID. Um, seven. Uh, seven sounds good to me. It didn't like the source name. Oh yeah, you got to register a source. Anyway, you have to so register a source. it's pretty straightforward to do, but there's an extra step here. The point we had this conversation last night, and Jason was telling yeah. me how uh, when he and Don train, they do training, they do awesome training, and they point out that hey, as you're learning PowerShell, um, you're really back to this point of like you should maximize. You, you do your job, and you do your job in a way that maximizes your integrated lifetime earnings. Now, in Rome, ancient Rome, they had this notion that. In order for justice to be done, justice it was not good enough for justice to be done. Justice must be seen to be done. Okay? So the public awareness that justice was happening was just as crucial as justice actually happening. So too, saving time and saving money is important. <laughs> Being seen to save time and money is That's just as important. Exactly. So they were talking about how, hey, every time you write a script, you should document the fact that, hey, uh, this used to take this long, and now with the script, it takes this long. And so we were brainstorming about that, and then he said, oh, yes, and at the end of the year, you just go up to your boss and you say, hey, by the way, ka-chunk, here's what I've done, and... Uh, Give me the money. No, I just, uh, you know, here's my value. <laughs> and we thought, well, geez, you know, well, how do you actually translate that from, like, well, I ran this script and it generated this much, saved this much time to what that save over the course of a year? And so we discovered, we thought, hey, you know, this would be simple. If you just wrote your script and every time you ran your script, the first thing you did was you first created the source and you know, Jason saves you money, and you logged the fact that it, it, that it ran, then what you could do is say, have a script that says, okay, I'm now going to go across all these machines. I'm going to look in the application event log for that event ID. You know, the JSON saves you money, the source, and, and the event ID. And then grab that all up, see which script ran, have a table that said, oh, this script saved this much time, and then actually do a calculation and maybe even do a chart. And you do that on a weekly, a monthly, a yearly basis to actually be super crisp about how much time Time, scripting and automation was going to save you. And it, so anyway, the point is, it's actually pretty trivial to do. And it, well, the thing is, and I, ha I have to talk to Don about this, because this is actually a, a really cool, you're right, if I was writing this to the event log, that this script or this command that got executed, that, that, that you've built, what you're doing is you're showing and you have a way to prove by using get event log, by looking at that ID, you've got a way to show 
how your tool is being used that you've created. This is good for informational purposes, but it's also good for you to say, hey, look, I automated, I reduced the cost of human man hours or human hours down from, you know, I've saved you an entire person. It, it sounds a little vindictive, but it's time to eat your peers. If they're not automating <laughs> stuff, if they're not automating and you are, you're probably starting to automate them out. You guys have seen the shirt, you know, uh, and I think it goes something towards the fact uh, of, of I can replace you with a script. Well, yeah, and that's kind of what's happening. This is a great way, writing it to the event log is a great way to keep track of where it's been run, when it's been run, how often it was used. I think that's a great measurement stick. And that will definitely become part of the conversation. Now, yeah. that was brilliant last night. You came up with that. That was awesome. Well, guys, we've done some basic air handling for you, and you've got the examples. And I want to show you where we're at in the slides, because we're going to move on a little bit here and take a look at dangerous commandlets. But so error action, uh, catching errors with try-catch. Carlos Dangerous. Carlos Dangerous. Commandlets. <laughs> um, a better example. I showed you a better example. <laughs> commandlets to automatically tweet to all your followers. Oh, yeah. Don't, don't, don't. don't. <laughs> commandlets Take to automatically Take pictures tweet. and tweet. No. Oh, God, that's terrible. So Before we take a break, we're going to get started in Chapter 8 with tools that make changes. Tools that make changes. Like you? Yeah. But, um. <laughs> but um, thanks, yeah, because I'm going to make some changes. So, having said that... Um, Somebody said, what was that? I think they misquoted us. They said, oh, you know, they, they, it was a great quote. I'm going to say I actually said it. Oh, they yeah, said, yeah. Uh, this course, what was it? Um, I used to be a tool, and now I'm a tool, a tool maker. maker. Yeah, yeah. So out on Twitter or something, they, they misquoted one of us. It's hilarious. Um, used to be a tool, now I'm a tool maker. So we've been playing with tools that have just been retrieving information. There's more to this. If you want to make a tool that's going to change information, there are a couple of things that we expect as admins when we work with PowerShell. And let me just give you a quick example. And this is a dangerous example, so don't follow me through this. Uh, this is a dangerous example, so why am I doing a dangerous one? So you keep saying that. Watch, I know, what are you I know, doing? but get service, stop service. Now you guys know what's going to happen if I strike enter right now. It's it's gonna my, I'm going to have to restart my machine. Um, so when commandlets do things that could be dangerous, PowerShell doesn't by default in most cases ask you Are you sure? So you have these options of of what if and confirm. When you write a tool that's making a change, you should provide these options too. And so that's mm. what we want to talk oh, yes. about. Yes. So, and it's in the uh, snippet. So it's, it's going to be very helpful. Um, let me open up for module eight. And it made me thought of a great idea for a book. When bad things happen to good computers. When bad. <laughs> When bad things happen to good computers. So, and and, and actually it's kind of uh, uh, fascinating. Let me show you the, the two lines. You will see this in the complete snippet as well. But command oh. binding has some additional stuff. So just yeah. take a look at my pseudo function here. I'm going to call mm -hmm. it set stuff. I mean, we're going to pretend for a moment that it's setting something. Command binding has this option called supports should process equals true. Uh, supports should process equals true. That's so that we can use this if down here of should process. This will give us our dash what if and our dash confirm capabilities on the commandlet so that we can ask it, what are you about to do? And I want to have confirmation on this. But before we can actually show this to you, we need to talk about this confirm impact level. Mm. So I, I think I have it in the slides, but confirm impact is, is one of these things that always has kind of made sense, but I haven't messed with the impact level very much. So let me get to the uh, confirm impact level. Impact level here in the slides, low, medium, or high. And so the impact level is low, medium, or high, and we've got the confirm preference which is set to high by default, which means if 
if a commandment has a co uh, confirm impact level of no. Okay, so help me out with this because yeah. I, so I get stumbled by this. So basically, each of the commandments to, to, um, tells you what its impact is. Okay, so if you're going to reboot the computer, high impact. If you're going to delete a user, high impact. If you're going to stop a service, medium impact. If you're going to change the description on a service, low impact. Okay, so. It's, it's just as rough and vague as that, but you get it. You know, there are high impact things, medium impact things, and low impact things. And the commandlets declare that. They say, hey, here's the impact I'm gonna have on the system. Then we have these variables that say, well, hey, based upon whether the impact that a command's gonna have, what should I do? Like, should I confirm or not? So by default, I think confirm is high, which is to say, anytime something has a high impact, uh, we will confirm. We'll auto confirm something. Um, like I think restart computer is declared restart to be computer, high compute. Um, yeah, when you do like enable PS remoting is, is, is a great example yeah. of and that. And so yeah. we'll ask you like, hey, but you can throttle that down. You can say, hey, I would like to, like you're just beginning PowerShell. You're maybe a little nervous. You're not so sure. You don't want to screw up the server. Right. right? It's an important server. So you might say, hey, I'd like to set my confirm impact to be medium. And what that says is, if you do anything that has a medium impact, it'll come up and say, hey, Jason, are you sure you want to do that? It tells you what it would do, but right. doesn't do it until you say yes or no. If you didn't do that, it would just go ahead and do it. You know what? I think I can show that real Let's quick. Let's show them. Is, is, so take a look at my screen, guys. I'm going to show you the, the default uh, confirm preference is high. Let's change that. Um, let me just uh, do um, Actually, show them, get run service, it. like do name bits, and we'll... It's oh, running, yeah. so you want to do like stop service, and you'll see that. See, PowerShell just did it, right? Boom. Blah, 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 blah. It doesn't. So let me just. You're a smart guy. See, we assume everybody's smart. Yeah, and, and I love that about PowerShell. Yeah. Um, you, you should have talked to me sooner, because um, <laughs> <laughs> you probably would have changed that. Um, so I've got the service started again. This time for a dollar sign confirm uh, preference. Let's set that um, equal to uh, medium. Yeah. And I think medium will be enough for this, that uh, this time we'll stop it. And now it comes up and it says, hey, dude, are you sure you want to do this or not? Bucko. Yeah. Now, one of the things is, is that that's what we're, spe say no. <laughs> that's what we're specifying here. When we say confirm impact level, what I'm saying is, is that if you use my set stuff, it's, it's not going to do anything so detrimental that it's going to, shut down your computer or anything like that. So I set it to medium. If I, in my tool, set this to high, which the default is high, then it would always ask every time you were running this, do you want to confirm it? But since I'm doing it to medium and I need to go back and change this, confirm uh, preference equals high. Since I'm setting this to medium, what's going to happen is, is if you try to run my commandlet, it's not going to ask, are you sure or not? It's just going to do it. Boom. But because of support should process, I'm going to be able to use those uh, common parameters, dash what if and dash confirm, if I want to. So let me just run this for you real quick. And I'll clear my screen, and I'll do set stuff. You can see that when I just type set stuff, Oh, computer name I made mandatory. Seriously? <laughs> I did that in the demo. Okay, it says I'm changing something right now. Well, now let's do this. Let me uh, up arrow, up arrow, up arrow. Set stuff dash what if. Computer name, yes. What if? Performing operation set stuff on target DC. So now I've got the option where I can say, wait, wait, wait a minute, before you do it, what is it that you're going to do? And I've now got the option to say, you know what, I'm going to run this against uh, a bunch of computers, and I want to confirm on each one of these just to make sure. And it comes up, and it, bingo, lets you confirm. Is that kind of cool? Yeah. I think that's really cool. Are you missing one? I'm missing one? Yeah. What am I missing? I'll say yes. Say yes. Now verbose. Oh, verbose. Wait a minute, did I, let's see, so, um, so what if? Nope. Oh. Just get rid of what if and say verbose. What if? Get rid of what if. Oh, get rid of what if and just say verbose. There you go. Boom. Oh, DC. 
Performing opera, yeah, so you, this is really cool. This is really, 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 really cool. Um, I'm so used to using right dash verbose and thinking of it that way that I oftentimes don't think of it this oh, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th this is totally <clears throat> cool. Um, so what's happening is, is right verbose is telling you what it's going to do, and then it just does it. Yeah, so the, here's the thing. This is like one of the cleverest things I think I ever thought of in my life. <laughs> I'm just so, so proud of this. I got a patent on this thing. Ah, Seriously. I love this. Oh. And it's one of those things that's like one of those, you know, sometimes... You know, you get a patent and it's this big complex thing, like, rah, you know, and it's like tour de force. And then, but this one's just like this really little tiny elegant thought, okay? And it is, let me show you on the screen here. What happens is you call, there's an API called should process. You tell us what it is that you're going to do and what you're going to do it to. By the way, so you didn't do it quite right. Uh, PS commandlet dot should process. By the way, here's a technique. So, oh, what? LPS command that should process. Anyway, so you tell what you're going to do and what you're going to do it, what you what you're going to act on and what you're going to do. Um, mess it up <laughs> seriously, okay? And let's make sure we do did that right. Zoom in. Zoom in. Zoom in. Thank you. Okay. Let's make sure I did it right. Set stuff minus verbose. Or sorry, minus what if. What if my computer name local host? Okay, so see, mess it up seriously on target. Performing local. operation, mess it up seriously on target local host. So you tell us what you're going to act on and what you're going to do. So this API, you just do that and it returns a boolean. And if it returns true, then do it. If it returns false, don't do it. Okay. Okay. So you say what you're going to do, and if it returns false. Don't do it if it returns true, do it. Now, when you say minus what if, we print this out and we return saying don't do it. Don't do it, false. So okay. here's that if statement. So it prints it out and then we don't do this. If you say minus host, if you say minus verbose, we print out a verbose statement and then we return true. So that it and actually say, does it. Do it. Oh, that's awesome. And then, if you say confirm, we say, what do you want to do? We generate the question. Right. And if you say yes, we return true. If you say no, we return false. So uh, this is an incredibly small piece of code. That's incredibly powerful. That, and I, and I, I have to reiterate that, that, especially for me when I started doing this, it's like, okay, I want to be able to have what if and confirm. It's very important. And, oh, my God, this is going to be complex dealing with this. And when I had first seen it, I went, seriously? Exactly. And it looks just like what the PowerShell team does. And so my stuff looks and feels so that all admins, they get... Everything looks and feels the same. And I all, all I had to do was put in a couple of lines. Let me show you a real example, and then we're going to take a break here in a second. But, and the key oh, thing yeah. was you need this supports should process up at the top here. You see that? Yes, yes, you need yes, that. yes. That's the thing that tells us. That's the thing. So if you don't have this, you'll see a common set of parameters. If you add this, you'll see that common set of parameters, and then you get minus what if and verbose. And minus or, what sorry, if minus what if and confirm. Confirm. Okay? And the other thing I want to point out here is that this is super, super important. I once dealt with an admin who was saying, you know, every now and again I get to the point where I'm about to do something, and I realized if I get this wrong, I'm about to hit carriage return. If I get this wrong, like it's over. You know, right. the system's going to be doomed. My career is going to be in the toilet. Muffy and Buffy are not going to college. It's going to be bad. And if you just think about that, that's a lousy position to ever put someone in. I mean, it's just not, it's wrong. And so this calling should process alleviates that. It puts them in power. They're going to do something risky, and they're taking responsibility, and they can say, what if? And they can know that it's going to be safe and secure. They're going to know what is going to happen. Or if there's a bunch of things, they can say, minus confirm and double check. I mean, it's really just, it really, it's a morale thing, a moral thing to it do. Is. And because think about this, guys, if you're making tools and your your tool is changing something, you need to give me the ability to go. Wait a minute, maybe I don't understand what's happening here. 
and I can do what if and confirm. I mean, it's something that is 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 just you have to do this if your command is doing anything that makes a change. And so here I gave you an example of this is one of my fun ones. Set volume label. Oh, um, cool. So uh, here's a command. That support should process true. Got to have that. Confirm impact. It's medium. It's just a volume label. What do we care? Um, I've got a computer name and a label as parameters. And here you go. I'm going to put in computer name, label change to whatever that label is. And I've got a, a, a WMI class in here that I'm changing the uh, label with. So just so you can see what this looks like when it, it runs, if I remember how I set this thing up when I wrote it, um, it was set volume label. What computer? No, that's theirs. What's that? What? You got theirs. Did you get yours? Oh, sorry. Nope, never oh, mind. Isn't it? So DC. I'll, um, just, I'll just shut up. No, no, you're good. You're good. Did I happen to put a, I didn't put a, uh, a get in here. So I'm going to set the volume label on drive C as, as what I set up. And I want to do the label of cool. Boy, are you showing computer, uh, computer before you hit carriage return? Are you, gonna, yeah. are you showing um, the file explorer <laughs> to show the label? <laughs> Whack. <laughs> Hi, how you doing? No, I didn't show them file explorer to show them the label. Um, yeah, because that's, that's the way you can see it, right? So, so, oh man, now I, so let's go out here to see, oh wait a minute, this isn't the machine I'm doing it to. Okay, but this oh, will be mind. the machine. So, with, th there is no label, right? There's no label. I'll do it to this machine, so let me change this. To and, dot. Yeah, let's change this to dot, which is my local machine. Now, notice I'm going to do what if, because I want to know what's going to happen. So I'm going to perform the operation, set vol label on target, well, my local machine, label change to cool stuff. Well, let's go ahead. Okay, that's exactly what I want to do. Bingo. Oh, I love that. So now I didn't actually put in a function in here for get vol label or get volume information, but I, I could have. But we'll just do it quickly back out through here. Oh, looky. Cool stuff. Ooh. And the extra O's. So anytime you make a commandlet that's going to change something, you should be putting in support should process, and you should yep. be putting in this if statement, and you should make sure that you've given us a way, all admins a way to use dash what if and dash confirm. Yeah, Folks, it's about time for a 10-minute break. When we come back, it's our last, last session. session. And, you know, we've been making tools. It's now time to put a bunch of tools together and go from this script way of doing it back to modules, putting them into modules and creating module manifests and maybe even creating a custom view. So It's worth noting Rick Kloss never showed you how to do that. Yeah, it's so worth noting now that Rick show Kloss it. never showed you. And so when we get to that, just remember it yeah. was us that... So anyway, see you guys in 10 minutes. Duh, duh, yeah, just, uh, it's wrong. Oh, stop. Sorry, I have to be serious now. Yeah. This is our last, our last bit, and this is this is taking all of the tools that you're making that you've been you've been testing in your scripts and you've been building them, and now you've seen how to put help and all the good stuff in. Now we're going to turn them into modules. Right, so now it's it's formal, it's safe, it, you're no longer embarrassed about it. Right. But you got to share it. You're right. Now you got to share it. And how do you want to share this? Well, you want to share it the same way that. Microsoft shares it, so we want to do it with modules. So, module nine is script and manifest modules. Now, if you joined us the last time, we did this briefly, but there's more to it, and so we want to show you some more about it. But we're going to start you off one piece at a time. First of all, here's what we're going to do. Putting your tools in one place, creating a module manifest, we're going to take maybe a look at a little custom view action here, too, that'll be fun, and oh, yeah. getting that set up, yeah. Ooh, ooh. So putting your tools in one place, look guys, you've got this in the slides, but it's pretty simple. We want to create a module, and I want to show you how to make a module. And we're going to start off simple, and we're going to make it better and better and better. First of all, let's make it really easy. So let me do this. Let me uh, launch my scripts in Module 9 for this. Take a look at mytools.ps1. 
And what I've got is I've got a few things in here, actually. Uh, let me collapse the help down. I've got a function called that uh, we made earlier, get uh, comp info. Um, I've got my set volume label. And so, and I've got, I think, a couple of other ones. Oh, yeah, great. The get <laughs> Jason Fun 1 and Jason Fun 2. So, I've now got a collection of uh, functions that I want to be able to let other people use and I want to use and I don't want to have to run this script every time I want to use these functions. So we want to make a module. We're going to start off with how easy it is to make a module. So watch, I'm just going to do my tools PS1, file, save as. I'm going to do this in module 9 and watch what I'm going to do, PSM. One. Oh. The strain of it all. The strain of it all. And this is why we get paid the big bucks, right? Uh, we just made a module. So watch. I'm going to open up a uh, new console. And I'm going to go out to, uh, well, actually, I'll just do it right from here. Import module. C colon scripts. Module 9. And I called it My Tools, right? Uh, not PS1, but PSM1. So I've now imported the module. Awesome. Get command dash module. Uh, my tools. There are the commands. I can run help. I can get help with it on the get comp info. I can now do get help on it and see all the help. There's all my commands. I can run these. This is great. This is cool. Well, this isn't that cool, though, when you get down to it. Because I... Looks I had to, cool. Well, it's it's very cool. I mean, I made yeah, a module, my but, tools, but my I have tools. to I have to import it every time. When, oh, when, and I, I, I that's I, you I, need I wanna, virtual I, modules. I, I I don't believe he's using a word again. We, I need virtual modules. I need dynamically loaded, mo imported, mo vir screw. It. I need virtual modules is what I need. <laughs> so. This is where we're going to have this conversation again. Now, look, I've given you guys this launch PS1, and what it does, it shows you if you need to manually launch a module like I just did, you can do it. Get command uh, module, my tool, so you can see all the commands that are in it. And if you edit your module, one of the things you have to remember is you've got to remove it and re-import it in order to test things that are in it. So I've given you an example of that as well. But here's the thing, I'd like to put the modules in a correct place to put it. And if you joined us last time, you saw uh, uh, this, and I'm just gonna do it uh, this way. I, I was doing PS module path. Oh wait a minute, was that? No, I wasn't doing that. I was doing dollar sign environment PS module path. And here's the thing, and, and Jeffrey pointed out, well, why don't we make this a little bit easier to read? So I, I gave that to you, the, 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 the Jeffrey Snover trick. Um, and so what I'm going to do is, can I just do split on that? Yeah, split. Yeah. And semicolon. Oops, he wants quotes. it in. Yeah, quotes. Uh, quotes. So there are two paths that by default uh, that we're looking at with this current logged on user. So we've got the System32 Windows PowerShell 1.0 modules path. And if you joined us last time, you heard us say, don't put your stuff there. That's not for you. Matter of fact, let me show this to you visually through File Explorer. This is where PowerShell gets installed. Windows, System32, you guys all know System32. And I'm going to go down here and show you where uh, Windows PowerShell is. Ba -da -da -da. Version 1.0. Here you'll see, that, and we're going to come back here in a little bit, but you're going to see here's where the executables are for PowerShell. And here is this folder in here called Modules. And this is where you should not put your stuff. Don't put your stuff here. This is where Microsoft puts their stuff here. This is a sacred place. Don't mess with the sacred place. I think you're doing this wrong. Why? Did you ever see that Kids in the Block skit where the guy says, he, he says, what did my mother say about salt and eyes? Don't put salt in your eyes. Don't put salt in your eyes. Put salt in your eyes. Ah! <laughs> put salt in your eyes. Ah! <laughs> it turns out there's, there's some psychology behind this. It turns out that, that as, you, as, you, as you teach someone something, right, and, and you use a negative, right, memory goes into short-term memory. And then it makes a transition to long-term memory. It turns out, just statistically, that negative things uh, do not make the transition to long-term memory as well as positive things. Therefore, they found if you have a safety uh, uh, program that says, 
don't forget your safety glasses. Literally what happens is people, when the first time they hear that, they hear don't forget your safety glasses, but as they remember it, they remember forget your safety glasses. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. So, uh, so the way you do this is you always say the positive thing. Wear your safety glasses. Oh, okay, so instead of me saying, don't put your stuff here, I should be saying, let me show you where you do put your stuff. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, and I'm gonna bring up, a, a, I showed this to you graphically, but let me just show you. Um, this is where you wanna put your stuff. Do put your stuff under Documents, Windows, PowerShell, <laughs> Modules. You. And I wanna point out that by default, Windows, PowerShell, Modules, does not exist under your documents. I'm gonna show this to you graphically, although I do wanna show you, I, 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 I gave you guys a kind of a quick a scripting way to do this. Somebody yelled at me. It, well, you showed it to us graphically. You should have showed it to us in PowerShell. Okay, well, here's, here's okay. one. Okay. Look, look at what I'm doing. Dollar <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, dollar sign that, module path. That's your Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> that's my Dick Van Dyke, yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Actually, that it is might good. might might. So I'm gonna I'm gonna run this, guys. I'm just gonna show you what the code does, and I'm gonna show you that the path, that's the path that we want. And what I've got here is module path is path zero plus my tools. What this is gonna do is um, let me show you what module path now looks like and what why I called it my tools. Here's the important thing: under the modules folder, you need to name the folder that's going to hold your module. The folder name and the module name need to be exactly the same for right now. And so for right now, I'm gonna call the folder my tools and I'm gonna call my module my tools. And so what I've done here is, how you do this in PowerShell is you can use new item. I'm just gonna give it that module path and tell it that it's a directory. <clears throat> so it created it and it created the Windows PowerShell modules and it created the My Tools all in one foul swoop. And then I'm going to copy the My Tools PSM1 to that destination. So lo and behold, I didn't want to let anybody down from the last show. I just showed you how to do it in PowerShell, but I'm still gonna show it to you graphically. It's the reason I want you, because I just want you to get this. This is under Users. And it looks a little bit different. I've logged in as a user uh, in a domain, student.company. It's my documents when you look at it visually. There's the Windows PowerShell. There's the modules. There's the folder, my tools. And there is my module. Now, this is still pretty simple, right? But since it's in the special place where you do want to put your stuff, the in virtual your, module place. The vir, the, you, we're going to get in trouble because somebody is going <laughs> to... The virtual module place. <laughs> I, there's an MVP probably online right now going, don't you dare say that again. Um, <laughs> since it's in the special place, watch what's going to happen is... Uh, let me close off all those and let me open up a brand new one so you know I'm not cheating. By the way, I, I could be wrong, but I think I get to do that. You think... You, you know what? I, do, do you guys just... Hear what he just said. Uh, <laughs> that's that, that's hilarious. He made up the virtual module thing, but he's actually allowed to do that. <laughs> that's the best thing about being the architect. Oh, that's great. Now, wait a minute. I'm pretty sure that I made up a term and gave you a term for, for a particular thing that, that, that you're working on, and, and you didn't like the term very much. The, the, the no, no, not the Chihuahuas. <laughs> the, that, that, was, that, 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 that was good. It was, it was it was no, no. Kimlets was good. Uh, my wife loves Kimlets. Um, the um, I'm just establishing the track record here. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah, it was. It was the DSC thing when I came up with my don't 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 call them providers. Call them uh, something really stupid and is. And you went. Are you good at training? Then maybe you should stick with that. Because. <laughs> So I don't get to make up terms, but he does. So guys, you know what's going to happen here. At this point, I've just launched PowerShell. Since it's in the special place in, uh, right now, um, that means it can be dynamically loaded, which means all I'm going to do is I'm going to do get comp info, and I'm going to hit tab. Oh, look, it tab completed. I don't have to import the module manually now. This is a beautiful thing in version 3. I'm totally excited by this because this makes me so happy. And boom, there we go. So this is the simple part to making modules um, in a nice, simple way. But let's do something here. Let's take a list here. Uh, get module uh, list available. And we'll see if we see my 
module in here. What I call it? My tools. And for some reason, bottom, 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 bottom. bottom. Oh, bottom, 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 bottom. Oh, I no, don't see my module. What'd you do? Oh, I did a get module uh, list available. I expected to see a script module in here, but I don't see it for some reason. I don't know what I've done wrong, but I don't see it listed. Let me see if I can get it this way. Get module my tools. Okay, so this is what I want to show. It's a script module. You can see that the module here, my tools, and it'll even show you what commandlets are available in it. So it's a nice way to see it. Now, this is the interesting thing. This is a nice script module, and this is great. But, and I need your help with this, Jeffrey, and I think I have a slide with this. Um, manifests. Yes. Let's talk about what is a manifest and why do we have a manifest? I mean, what's the purpose to a manifest? Okay, so in reality, a module is a directory of something that either has a, a, a PSM1 file or, and or a manifest. Okay. And the manifest tells all the things that are part of that module. And so you can include a, a, a set of modules. You can have sub-modules. By the way, so this is, our modules are unlike some of the other people's modules. We looked at the way other people did it, and we said, yeah, 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 that's really cool. And then we thought about it, and it's like, no, actually, that's not very cool. So, and, and so we, ours are much more sophisticated than <laughs> theirs. <laughs> no, so, so imagine, um, you take a dependency on my module. I'm going to import Jeffrey's module. Now, because it's a, a, an ecosystem, I, do, I look around there and I say, oh, this guy over here, Joe has a cool module, so I'm going to include it in mine, okay, just as like helper stuff to deliver my functions. Now, when you, using the other guy's stuff, the way, the typically way to do it, because it's easy, is when you include me, you right. also include them. Right, and so then, and it's actually kind of hard. You can't really tell whose are mine and whose are theirs. Right. You just get them all. Okay, so then you might take advantage of mine and theirs. But then later, I go and I said, you know, Joe, he's actually not a very good programmer. I'm going to take advantage of Tom's stuff, and so I'm going to use Tom instead of Joe's. And Tom might have a different set of functions, and so I use them. Now you take import me, new version of my stuff, and you break. Right, because, because I was still using. Tom, Dick, or Harry, whoever we had over there. <laughs> the bad guys. The bad guys. Bad programmers, yeah. okay? And so this was what we called an undeclared uh, coupling, okay, that you coupled to there. And so uh, our modules allow us to say, hey, uh, uh, here's my module, and I'm going to include all these other things, and I'm going to be very intentional about the things that you see and the things you don't see. So there you go. Got it. Got and it. so that's what these ma manifests do. They, they do lots of things. That's part of what they do. Uh, they include other things to include. Now, just to be clear, a manifest can be just the script file, or it can be the script file and formatting files, like type files and view files. We're going to talk files. about that in a, yeah. in a few minutes. Um, there are processing that you can do as part of the manifest, which is to say, hey, when you start, do this initialization. Uh, and you can have a ton of data, like a data file. Okay. By the way, so this is interesting. Do you mind? We're going to talk a little bit about version four. Okay. Ooh, four. Ooh, version okay. four. But version this, four. it helps motivate manifests and modules. So here's the way. Version four, we have this cool new feature called desired state configuration. Mm -hmm. Desired state configuration says, I just declare the world I want to be. I push it to a machine, and it makes it so. Good deal, right? Okay, how's that work? Well, it, it works. And so literally when I push it to that machine, a WMI provider grabs that document and starts looking at it and says, okay, what are the resources articulated in here and how do I go make them be that way? And so I take a look at resource number one and I look for WMI provider. If I find it and I say, hey, WMI, make it so. Makes it so. I then take a look at the next one and I say, hey, is there a WMI provider for it? No. Hmm. Okay, well, is there a PowerShell provider for it? Yes. Okay, call it, and now PowerShell provider is a module that has three well-defined functions. Get target resource, set target resource, test target resource. And so it has, I take a look at the resource name and I look for a module of the same name, and if it matches, then I call it, and it makes it so. Yeah? Yeah. Now, I then take a look at the third resource, and I say, do I have a WMI provider? No. Do I have a PowerShell provider? No. What do I do? And the answer is, you can go and you can register a, a, a depot. 
and we'll go to that depot. It's basically a REST API, an OData API, so this could be Linux if you wanted it to be. We call this REST API and we say, hey, do you have the WMI provider for this? Now at this point, it's a PowerShell module, module. that's zipped up, and we'll go and we'll grab that thing and we'll deploy it, and then we call the provider. We call this virtual providers. No, virtual modules. Virtual virtual modules. Yeah, there ah! it is. The page fault in the there module. You go. I like yeah, it. I like this I like virtual it. DSC. Like anyway, it. so we'll bring in the provider and do it. Now here's the thing. My provider is is this module that has a script that has these three functions. But I mentioned that the module can be as large as you want it to be. Right. So imagine I said, in addition, I can out of the box I can do things like on that machine I want IIS and I want these users and these groups, that sort of thing. But now imagine I want to be able to say, I want to have SQL with the following attributes set. Well, the way I can do that is I can put SQL in a module. Like take this, the kit, create a subdirectory, oh, SQL. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Put the repository in there, have a script module that says, oh, when to set it, take this thing and install and it. Install it. Yeah. And then that's my module. So now when I go and I say, you, you, you're just a bare bones machine, and I say, SQL should have the following attributes. It goes as SQL. Hmm, what's that thing? WMI? No. PowerShell provider? No. Hey, you, you got a SQL thing? Yes. What do I have? Bonk. Multi gigabyte thing. It can be a, as big as you want. Bring that thing down, deploy it, call the script. The script says, oh, take this kit, deploy it. So that's some of the power of the modules. And, the, and, and putting a manifest on your modules helps describe them, and also a few other things as well. So Versioning. Versioning. So take a look at the slide here. A couple of things. A manifest has an extension of PSD1. Um, the file name needs to match the folder name because oh, now... D, D, you know, remember, there was PS1. PS1. PowerShell. One. That's easy. Then there was PSM. Which is for modules. Module. D. 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 Wait a minute. Man manifest D. Manifest D. Data. Data. Yeah. PSD files are data files. So data files are a subset of the PowerShell language uh, used for expressing data. And so it, it doesn't give you the full uh, capabilities of it, but it's also a constrained language that's very easy to uh, uh, secure. And, and as a matter of fact, it's not a security boundary. Let me just say that really quickly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Security boundary is a formal thing. It's a security feature. Apparently, there's a and difference between those two. Apparently, there is because people get awfully upset about those. Yeah. So the, in this case, if you're going to use a manifest, the manifest name has to match what the folder name is because you can include so many other things, your PSM ones, your all these other things that don't, their names don't necessarily match, and they may be in different locations. Now, just to let you know that um, if this was uh, uh, manifest, uh, when PowerShell loads, it, it could be looking at a binary module like mytools.dll, or it could be a script module like we're creating in here, PSM1. Um, the commandlet to make a manifest is called new module manifest, and you can specify a ton of stuff for your manifest. As a matter of fact, let me show you. I gave you guys an example of doing a manifest. Now, let me break this down. I didn't want to have to type all this out for you, so I want you to... Oh, you know what's a better way to do this? What's a better way? Well, just to kind of give them a, a feel for other things. Do, um, um, well, you know about uh, new manifest. Right, new, new, new module yeah. manifest? Yeah. So do show command on it. Oh, okay. You want yeah. to do... Uh, let's show see command. So new module manifest. No, 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 oh. no. show command. Show command. Show. Oh, show, show command. command. Okay. Show, okay. show, show command. command. <laughs> Space. It's late in the day. I'm not even yeah. listening to you. What the hell's the matter with me? <laughs> Slash space. Space. New, new. module manifest. Module. Remember, we mentioned that show command is just this awesome tool to explore, and this will point it out. So oh, take a look at yeah. this. This the is path. Cool. Aliases. Yeah, which, is, which is notice the star is required. You have to do a path, and you yeah. can kind of see this with the example that I have up here. You've got to have a path. Um, aliases that you can export out. Yeah. Um, this gives you a nice okay. flavor for all of the things you oh, can set. check this out, CLR version. So you might have a manifest that requires a different version of the CLR. Right. And so you can declare that here. You can specify that. What I like is commandlets to export. So maybe you've got some things that are just helper functions and that stuff, and you can export these. You can give the normal stuff like author name and company name. 
copyright information, which is kind of what I started filling out up here for you as a path. And you can see I'm putting it in the right place called My Tools. I put in the author and company and copyright. Um, this version of this module, and we can go down and do description, uh, .NET Framework version requirements. Now, we're going to show you here formats to process here in just a second. Oh, and then look um, there. Help info URI. URI. Yeah. Remember we mentioned that if you wanted to have formal help That's and right. you wanted to have update help, this is how we do. Remember when you do update help, you say what modules you want to update the help on. So update helps all about modules. And what we do is we find the module, we open it up, we look at the PSD file, we look for this help URI, and if we find it, we downline load it, and if we don't find it, we say, what are you talking what about? What are you talking dude? about? So this is actually really cool. And nested modules. Nested modules, yeah. Tom's a crummy programmer, so I'm not going to so hide I'm not it, gonna... <laughs> show his stuff to you. What PowerShell version is required? There's what processor architecture for this you want. Oh, and then some of them, this one's interesting, PowerShell host name. So we oh, have PowerShell quite a few host hosts yeah. that are uh, like will only work in ISE. Right. Like Actually, let me see. Let me see if I get this right. So let's see. Get command new... Uh, what was it, ISE snippet. Okay, that's in the ISE module. And I bet you if we looked at that manifest, we would see that the, it, it, because these snippets it's, only work, work in ISE. In ISE. And so if you tried to run them somewhere else, actually I have no idea what would happen. Let's, I could embarrass oh, myself here. Let's, yeah. let's see, new or import module, ISE, uh, bigger. It can't be bigger, sorry. Oh, zoom, zoom, it can make it bigger. Oh, and there it goes. <laughs> Where did it go? Come back. Oh, something bad happened. Oh, no. I never should have listened to you. <laughs> what? Sorry. Bad production guys, stay away. <laughs> yeah. Oh, did that work? Oh, I don't know. So apparently it's not correctly. So apparently uh, it's not, yeah. <laughs> no, apparently gonna we're going to let you do it right from the console. No, but that's good, where you can isolate it down to a particular host, like the ISC. Yeah. And in this Switch case... to him. Yeah. In this, <laughs> in this case, required assemblies, uh, a lot of guys uh, bring in DLLs from the .NET or from something else. Um, I know I have a friend that uh, oh, yeah, works uh, with Exchange, and there's uh, some additional Exchange assemblies, DLLs, that um, he wants to make sure get loaded for his stuff to run, so you can do that. Um, we, did, we did just find a bug that I, I checked, and the, the oh, module the module does not have that set up there. You just found a bug. Don't say that. Yeah. Did, did, oh, okay. Oh, did, we'll, we'll put it on connect, and then yeah, and that's what, what you what, do when you find bugs. Yeah, that's what you do. You put it on connect. Um, root module, and in this case, you can see that I've used root module to specify my module, my script file. So let me show you what this looks like. I'm going to run this, and then we're going to open up what this manifest is, so you can see it. So I'm going to select all of this. And I'm going to make my own nice little manifest. It says that it made it. And what we'll do here is, uh, um, uh, what do I want to do here? I want to show you this module manifest. So let me just do this. Um, where did I put this bloody thing? Oh, out at this path. That's where. All the way out there. Let me uh, copy this path here real quick. And let me uh, clear the screen, do a quick DIR. You can see I've got the PSD uh, file in there. And what I want to do is I'm going to actually open this with the ISC. So PS, PS, what, what was I trying to open now? I can't even remember what I was doing. My tools, PSD. And so take a look at this. My tools, this is the actual manifest. You can see what it generated. You can also see that you could go in and create a manifest that you like that's kind of generic that you could then go through and hand modify. So if I wanted to change the module version, I could run that whole manifest thing again, or I could just go in here and change the module version. Um, we do assign a unique GUID to it, and there is a way to create new GUIDs right from the, the, the command line. But as you can see, I can go through this file and add in or make changes to this manifest. In this case, this is making my module more proper now that I have an official manifest. But uh, I want to show you something that a manifest can be useful for other than just putting in my name and company. 
Take a look at something here. I've got, I'm going to call up PowerShell again, and this time I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to do my get comp info, and I want you to take a look at how the screen is. I'm going to do get comp info, and I'm going to say a computer name DC. Notice that PowerShell has put up the properties that I told it to put up and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's done it in a table and it, it's make, you know, you can make your own view. In other words, you can control through a custom view that you assign and use with a manifest what you want the output to look like. Now, I got to be honest with you, this is a little bit advanced and sometimes considered a little esoteric. I mean... I don't need to make a custom view because I'm going to let the admin do a select and property star or, or choose whatever properties they want, which is kind of the proper way to do it. But maybe I do want a default view because there's certain pieces of information. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but here's one of my favorite things. Get service. When you do this, you guys know that there's more information about a service than these three things. Have you ever wondered where that is controlled at or get process. Look at get process. Oh, I love get process. Who decided that these are the things that I want to see and that I want to see them in a table? Who made that decision and where is that decision made? I, I say. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I made got, that decision. Got a so, problem with that? I, I, <laughs> So this part of the recording I'm going to use for every class from now on because when I go, who made this decision? And people are going, somebody at Microsoft. He did. So now, <laughs> so if you don't like it, don't complain is what I'm saying. Yeah. Let me show you. If you where... don't like it, let me give you Bruce Payette's home yeah. phone number. <laughs> let me show you. I'll have you... him tell me. Yeah, really. <laughs> let me show you where the default custom views are, and there's a reason I'm showing it to you this but wait, way. Can you, before you go into custom yeah, yeah, yeah. views, I'm just I was really oh, yeah, bothered yeah, yeah. by that that oh. that bug. It was a bug. It so is what a bug. happened? Okay. Yeah, what happened was that they in ISC that's ISC the module is called ISC. It only works in the ISC, but they had not added. PowerShell host files. So I went and added it. I, I made a copy of this yeah. and I added it. So here's what should happen. So when I run it, I import it, and it tells me, yep, here's all the things I'm doing. But now, okay, by the way, so so let's make sure, let's see. So cat, cat this file. Sorry, it just really bothered me. Okay. So notice I'll say PowerShell host name, PowerShell ISC host. By the way, if you ever wonder, it's dollar sign host, and there's its name. Windows PowerShell okay. ISC host. Yes. Now, here, if I say dollar sign host, it it's is console. that console host. So I went and I fixed that. That I fixed it. So was I there, added there, this. That that code wasn't was there. there. Oh, it wasn't there at all. It wasn't there. Oh. Yeah. And so I just went and I added it. Now what happens is I'll say import module dot slash isc and it and says it look at this way. the name of the current powershell host is console host the module isc requires the host windows which is yeah. exactly what it should do so not only could we go on connect and put the bug in we could put the solution in and it should just magically happen right bing yeah, yeah bing. so by the way this is again one of those things where you declare what you want to have happen, and then PowerShell Engine does the work for you. Exactly. Standard error message that gets localized, et cetera, so you don't have to. Otherwise, you'd have to write the, the code that do, does this, or you have to generate the bad experience. Anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt no, your no, flow, no, but it that really was, just like... No, that was actually really important because, I mean, first of all, it shows a couple things. One, if you run into something that you think is a bug, go out to connect and file it. Yes, please. Two... You know, there can be some bugs on some things that aren't necessarily working this way. And, and you just sat down and figured out and figured out what the issue was. And bing. Yeah, bing. Now we're going to have it fixed. So, so let me just show you. Guys, this view is controlled. It was decided by Jeffrey and whoever. <laughs> let me show you where this view is actually stored. These views and I are, are out where PowerShell is installed. So, again, I'm going to go out to, ooh, don't be moving things. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go out to... Oh, Windows System 32. Uh, I spent a lot of time out here. Windows so the PowerShell. the positive way to say this is ensure the sanctity of the following locations. Ensure the sanctity of the following locations. 
<laughs> so um, I'm going to go into um, uh, .NET types. Notice, yeah. see this PS1 XML? This is where the views are. And I'm going to open this with Notepad. Don't necessarily, if you're playing along at home, don't do this because I want to show you. I originally got into to looking at the views because I wanted to change the view. Mm. I wanted to change what Git service was doing or what Git process was doing. So I was curious. So I started going in and looking at the views. Guys, this is XML, so it's kind of confusing if you're, if you're brand new to this. But let me do this. I want to find, uh, find uh, process. This is the one I always use. Not process module, but process. So let me show you an example. I don't know if you guys remember, but I'll, I'll show you real quick. This is the type of object that is produced when the get process command runs. So if you do get process, pipe to get member, in the first uh, jump start, this was very important to us to know so that we know what object it is. And now down here, we actually have, look, handles. Oh, well, you know, when I do get process, look, there's handles. Um, and, well, now I just lost my notepad. Um, and then uh, notice they specified a width for it, what the alignment was. The next column header, NPMK, they specified the, oh look, NPMK, they specified the width, a right alignment, oh yeah, that's right alignment. This is where the columns are defined. And further down from the columns, these are all the column headers, then what fills the data? And something should look familiar to you. If you were in the first jump start, look how they're filling the data. They're filling it with yeah, we made custom columns just like this. We did it in flight or by hand in the first jump start, but they've just simply written in how they're filling in the data in here. Well, this is totally cool. So I was thinking, go ahead. You, you just exposed a deep architectural flaw that I'm hugely embarrassed by. No, 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 don't say it is so. No, it's true. Yeah, so this was just a mistake, an architectural mistake. I made a mistake. We should never, ever, ever have allowed uh, script blocks in the formatting files. And, and so oh. I encourage you to never do that. Uh, we have not remedied that. I'd love to remedy that. Here is the pr basic problem. Again, we're trying to give you a world where you think, type, get. Okay? So if you take a look at, at the get process, um, in general, what we want to be able to do is to say that all the column headers are things that you can program against. And if you go type get process yeah. pipe to NPM, or type to uh, select a format table NPN, NP, NPM, I think. NPM. Yeah. Nothing. Okay, I think it was an N, but. Even if you, yeah, even even if if you spelled it. it right, it wouldn't have worked. Because <laughs> we calculate it on the fly. And yeah. that's just the wrong way to do it. The right way to do it. And sometimes the reason why we did it, I mean, it was just a mistake, right? Uh, well, fine. It was an architectural mistake. I never should allow that. Um, and because, of, and what it happens is sometimes you have these property names that are really long, or in this case, you want to divide it by a, 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 a 1K or 1 megabyte or 1 gigabyte, uh, and so you want to do that. The correct way to do that is you change the type system and not the formatting. Now, the reason why this is such a deep architectural flaw is that when I go to that machine, we, you, you maybe have seen the implicit remoting. I think we showed that, yeah, the we last, showed that time. last time. When I go and I grab the implicit remoting, I will grab the formatting information as well. Okay, I'll bring that over and I'll run it. I can never allow code from another machine to come over here and, and run. Execute. That's no, no, no. I take responsibility that says when I bring this over, it's safe. That's like Jeffrey Snover. Take the badge out. I, it's safe. Um, and if it isn't, I'll fire someone. No. <laughs> Which we went through in the first jump start, so. <laughs> no, and so it's safe. And so I can never allow that script code to be there because a bad guy might have written a formatting file with evil script code that then reboots the computer or steals your information, so I can never do that. So when I bring that over, we look for it and we throw it away. And so the formatting will be different if you use script files in remoting. So anyway, that, that's a little bit of background. I thought it was worth mentioning. No, definitely. And so I, what I'm about to show you is something that he considers to be a mistake. So <laughs> let me show you. Originally, I went in here because I wanted to change the default views. But guys, don't do that because at the bottom of this file, you're going to notice that this is 
not, not, not digitally signed, and so you're going to break the file if you if you do that. Um, yeah. You, you, yeah, you're going to break the file. So what I do is I usually go to the process section, and I copy the process section and use that as my own template, which is what I did for you in here, just so you can see a custom view, okay? Oh, aren't you nice. So, um, yeah, I thought that was pretty nice. Um, let me go out here and show you. So here, um, uh, with a view, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, I didn't show you. Where's the view? Where did I put the view? Oh, let me show you the view I gave you. It's, it's, it's out here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's what you say. Apparently, I'm, I'm full of crap. No, wait a second. I know the view is out here. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I know the view is here. Let me just do this. Um, uh, what is this? Scripts, uh, module nine, because I wanted to show this guy, uh, show this to you. Um, what view? Oh, no. Ah, oh. I did give you a view. So here's the thing. I called this view that I made called jasontypes.format.ps1xml. Now, hang on before everybody starts yelling at me. I want you to see the view <laughs> and see what it, it, it looks like because I copy the process block section and it's XML. And so I just copied it and then I just created what I wanted as a default view. I just did computer name and I did free space as column headers. And down here I did computer name as the properties and just the free space. Now I'm not modifying free space. I'm not doing it to making it one gig or anything like that. I just wanted you to see an example of a short version. So if you wanted to create something off of this, you could. And so what I need to do is attach this view. Now, to be honest with you, there are commandlets that I could say, um, attach this view, import my module and attach this view. But every single time you opened up PowerShell, you would have to update and reattach this view. One of the beautiful things to a manifest is mm. the manifest will let you do it. So, yes. yeah, let me just show you. Here's um, <clears throat> uh, all of my stuff here. And, oops, uh, a manifest with a view. So what I'm going to do here is this is the same manifest file I've done, only look, formats to process, mm. and I'm going to give it the name of my view, but I haven't shown you something that is very magical here. Yeah, you did a trick there. I saw There's that. a trick. I want to show you. There was a modification that I made in my function. So my view, let me show you. Let me I, My scrolling down capability I just lost. Down here, when I make a new object, Ooh. type name PS object, and I gave it the properties, looky what I did. I did, I inserted my own type name. Does that work? Jason dot inventory opt. What do you mean? Does that work? Yeah, that works. You don't think that works? Well, Jason. We're gonna find out. We're gonna find out. No, I don't think that'll work. You don't think that's gonna work? Let's find out. No. Oh, okay. Um, bet, well, bet let's you do buck. this. Bet, okay, you're on. Okay. You're on. You're on. So now the <laughs> he's pulling out his money. So the first thing I'm gonna have to do is I kind of create this new manifest and I'm gonna have it use the new view that I'm using. So he's he's got money. Oh god, I'm where's in yours? trouble. So where's my oh, wait, 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 wait a minute? Maybe good for it. <laughs> so I'm gonna run this. And I've created a new manifest, and I think what I have forgotten to do is copy my view out. So um, uh, Um, actually, no, it should work right from there because I didn't I didn't give a path to it, but I just exploded have my... Have confidence. Go have confidence. It. Okay. So let's go back to this. Oh, uh, that's a PS1. I'm going to save this PS1 as... Uh, oh, that's what I'm, That's where I'm going to screw up. No. I need to have this as my tools. That's fine. Whatever. Oh, wait a minute. My tools, PSM1. Yeah, you're good. I don't think I'm good because I don't nope. think I have it modified over in, in the uh, PSM oh, my tools. tools. Okay, yeah, fine. I, Change the name. That's not where you screwed up. Keep going. Oh, that's not where I screwed up. Okay, no. so let me let me go. Oh, don't do that. This don't is the there. safest dollar I'm ever going to make in my life. File, uh, open. Uh, that's not what I want to open. I want to open. Hang on. Let me just open and, and yeah. modify this uh, real yeah. quick, guys, so that I can see if I've gotten close and I can earn a buck out of this. Windows. Oh no, that's uh, uh, we did it under users. Uh, student company. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. My documents, Windows, modules, my tools. I need to modify my PSM1. Let me just modify this real quick so that you can see. I'm going to put this guy in. And 
go down here and modify it. Do, 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 do. And save it. And let's check my view. Look at my view. My view here that I have is JSON.inventory object. So that's how I'm identifying it. And lo and behold, we're going to about to find out if this works. Let's open up a new PowerShell console. Get comp info. Oops. Wait a minute. Get comp info. Get comp info. Uh oh. What happened? Uh, my module's suddenly not loading. Well, let me see what I did with my manifest. Hang on, guys. Let's see. Path. Uh, my tools. Ah, oh, I got to copy the view out there. That's why the manifest isn't loading. Um, let me copy my view out there real quick. I'll tell you what, why don't you show them that while I show them something else? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to show you something amazingly cool. Okay, so um, views. Now, when you type get process, yeah, you see the, the view. And what happens is we pick a default view and we show it to you. But it turns out that there is this parameter, format table. By the way, so it's format table. And you could have done format list, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, but format table. I could say, are you already? No, you oh, just no, keep working. I was watching you. Uh, I could say minus view, and I can specify a view. And the question is, well, what are the views? Well, there's a couple ways to find out, but the easiest way to find out is to go something like that, right? And 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 you get an error, and it says uh, that the view blah 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 cannot be found. Specify one of the following table views, and try again. Process priority start time. Ooh. Ooh. So let's try that. So clear system. And here we'll do it for everything. I said priority. Priority. And look here. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Right? It's a different view. Now, notice this is showing an issue. You have to be able to sort things first by priority through through sort priority, CLS, and there you go. Did oh, that wrong? is cool. Anyway, so I did that wrong. Um, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Priority. Or sort it by start time, format table, minus view, start time. And here, oh, we don't have one. And these were all started. Uh, oh, you know what? I rebooted right before I, oh. I, right before the session. So they're all the same <laughs> start time. But uh, it would show you the different time, days that they were started. That's awesome. Yeah. That is actually really cool. Okay. So I think I got my wagon fixed. So let me show okay. everybody here real quick. So my module under my tools, here is the manifest, here is the view, and here is my script module. So I need to make sure that they're all copied out there. And just as a reminder, so I didn't, you know, lose you on this, I'm going to do a, a I'm going to run a new manifest for it, create a new manifest, and I'm adding formats to process, and I'm specifying the name of my view. Now, the view gets tied to my particular function, let me show you, because, looky, json.inventory object, I added that as an object type, and look in my view. My view has type name, json.inventory object. So if I've done this correctly and I win the magic dollar. He hasn't. I'm going to launch PowerShell. By the way, I'm wrong all the time. So <laughs> I, I'm not going to be embarrassed so, if I get this wrong. Let's see if I can dynamically load the uh, command or the module dynamically load uh, comp. OK, I got, I got that. So computer name. And if I did this right, remember, I only had two things in the view, computer Name and free space. Let's see what happens. Oh, God. No, oh, I win the dollar! I win the dollar! I win the dollar! I, I totally win the dollar. What the heck? That makes no sense Would at you all. do me a favor? Would you autograph the I dollar, will. too? Because it would get you a that pen That makes no sense at all. What do you mean that makes no sense? Show me. Because you did it wrong. I did it wrong. Okay. Go to the code. Um, go to well, here, um, here, the module here, code. Okay. Here, let me show you. Here's, okay, here's where sure. you got it wrong. CLS. I, I do not know how that could possibly have worked. Okay, okay, that's so here scaring you go. me. Sign x equals GPS LSASS. Okay, so here's the thing: if you just do get type, get type, 
We tell you the .NET oh. type. Okay, that's very uninteresting. Make that sure you guys switch over, uh, oh. guys, over to his machine because we can't see what he's. There you go. Thanks. Okay, so there you go. So there you go. I'm showing you the .NET type. That right. PowerShell does not work on the .NET type system. It works on the PowerShell type system, which uh, subclasses the .NET type system. We do everything based upon PS type okay. names. Okay, so this is an array. It starts off with object, marshal by ref, component, and then system.diagnostics.process. And there you can put any object. You used PS type names. That almost certainly should not work. So I'm not sure how it is that oh, worked for really? you. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm not certain about that either because that's, that's the way so perhaps that I... there's uh, perhaps there's something tricky with the PS object that I'm not familiar with. But as a general rule, that will not work. You have to say dollar... Oh, by the way, so here's the way this works. So this PS type names, sorry, PS type names, it's just an array of strings. And you can say insert, 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 and zero, and then anything you want. Right, which is pretty much what I what I was just doing, right? Exactly, and then and then that and is the key. And by the way, that's one of the reasons. By the way, so we use this string to be any kind of uh, 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 you know to extend everything. We use it for views. You can add, dynamically add properties to this, etc. So if you've ever done this, get get event event log minus log event. <laughs> blog minus blog name, let's say application minus newest, let's just say uh, uh, th three, pipe to get member. Notice you're going to get three different things. Three different things, right. And why is that? And look here, that's the type. And so that's a little bit odd. So let's just take a look at one of those things. Sorry, let's take a look at one, newest one, dollar sign, oh, home, dollar sign x equals get. So x dot ps type names, and look what we did. Here is the .NET entry, and then we synthesize these things. Right. And I what see, this I means, see. so we tell you it's in the application log and the source, and then we tell the individual ID. And so what that means, somebody the other day asked us, "Hey, uh, could you, uh, uh, you know, how do we parse the strings in there?" And the messages, and the answer is you can dynamically add properties, register them for this log, uh, for this log source, or for this log particular log entry, and then you write the the parsing once, and then just access it. Oh, okay. There you go. So, anyways, guys, on um, on the uh, uh, code sample that I have in here, that uh, where I've set it up as PS object type names, go out to PowerShell. Dot org and you will see a blog post in a couple of days and we'll come up with a better way for you or the reason for this, that kind of thing. And so we'll, we'll give you more information on this as we go out there. Um, but is using it as a manifest example of adding a custom view. You've now seen that you can use manifest for a lot of things and just as a custom view as an example, that's pretty good. Oh, you know what? There, and Jeffrey, they did it again. Did you look at the look at the. You remember at the end of the the first jump start, look at what they're doing. What? They, they, they're, oh. they're trying to remind us. So if you guys were at the first jump start, you got to watch oh, the yeah. end of the first jump start. The production crew back here thinks they know something about PowerShell, so they put this teleprompter up to try to help us understand it. They want us to remind you to do the survey that's below the video yes, and, and make sure you do the survey. You give us the highest. A uh, score that you possibly can, because we need to beat um, Rick Claus, and, and that's what we really need. So do that. <laughs> but you have to see they wrote it on the screen as what did it do tell audience news survey with a kind. Actually, that was better than that the last. Better, yeah, yeah that's that was much good. better than the. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was much better than the garbage you did the first time. <laughs> what? So, so even the production guys yeah, um, awesome. um, have it down. By the way, I found out why uh, I was confused. You did it all sorts of wacky. Let me show you his code. Oh, sure, sure. So here's here's the thing that went that confused the heck out of me. So so this is just the wrong way to do it. Oh, That's okay. there, you That's got okay. a way to do but this, but it works, okay. so you still win the buck. So yeah, and so I, <laughs> he did well, that's PS. All I care about. He did PS object and object, and then he called the PS object. I don't ever tell teach people about that. This oh. is rich stuff. Oh. Instead, what you do is you just go to here and you just say PS type names. 
That's oh, the way. Oh, okay. That's so the best way. Guys, to do screenshot it. this at, at home and and look at this because he's shortened it up and made it the correct way. So oh, that's fine. there won't be a blog post. No, right, multiple the ways answer. to do it. There and, uh, I learned one. It. I never, I never would have thought of doing it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well then. I'm going to start thinking about doing it that way. So uh, <laughs> thank you, sir. That's awesome. You hey, you know on. what? It's, this is funny. Let, let me catch everybody up. But uh, custom views, uh, you've got all of the sample code, everything, questions or comments. You know what? I don't. We've uh, we've run to the to the end of what? Uh, yeah, this is. Can the it end. be? No. This seriously? Is, seriously. This is, this is the, it, yeah, blinky lights, everything. Amazing how 16 and, hours just goes by like a flash. <laughs> <laughs> so, folks, what we did today is, is we took you through getting started with scripting and using that scripting capabilities mm. to start making tools, right? And turning those tools into something that's useful that you can make, solve your business problems with, using some best practices, putting in help, getting in parameters, validation for the parameters, Air handling so that you can do air handling and then bundling all of that into modules and creating a module manifest. Even regardless of how my custom view went off, the you have the whole module manifest kind of thing. So this is where you get started on this, and this is great stuff to practice with. And keep in mind at the very beginning of the show, you have the slides yep. that we gave you some additional resources yep. to go deeper into, Deep. into the tool making. The yep. Don Jones Learn uh, Windows tool making or learn PowerShell tool making in a month of lunches. And also there's uh, a new class that's coming out from Microsoft on the Microsoft uh, Marketplace that does tool making if you want to take a class on it. So this is really cool stuff. And you can get, you know, we've only had one day to go through this. There's a lot more that you can do. But you can also see that as an IT pro, this is something that's easy for you to learn to do, and yeah, you and, should do it. And remember, you know, when we started this saying, hey, each of us really has two jobs. The first job is to get the particular task you have at, at hand done, but the second job, and you really want to pay attention to that second job, is to solve that problem in a way that maximizes your integrated lifetime earnings. Right. And by learning how to do these scripts, by learning how to do tools, you integrate your maximize, you maximize your integrated lifetime earnings. So you definitely want to be doing that. So remember, don't be a tool, be a tool maker. <laughs> Okay, great. Now, do you want, <laughs> and on that note, do you want to send everybody out with the 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 the, uh, the, the, the sign? The symbol, oh the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you, so do, you, you want to give them a little story or no? Oh, sure. Okay. Well, well, yeah, go ahead. Well, this is a we have a, a PowerShell summit. We bring people in. We like the world's best PowerShell people. We bring them in and we just geek out. and We have a blast. And somebody I don't even remember who it was came up with the PowerShell gang tag. That's right. We're a gang. Oh yeah, we, we bad. Oh, yeah, we, yeah. We, so here's the gang sign. Get it? Get it? Sent. Get it. Look at Prompt. it. It's Prompt. the power ship. Prompt. So, so love, to you. baby. Love, baby. Love, love. It's it's a requirement. You have to do it when you go to the summit. It's, yeah. It's it's love. all PowerShell. Represent. Yeah, represent. So guys, I don't even going know what that forward. means. <laughs> <laughs> going forward. Angle bracket. Angle underbar bracket, cursor. Yeah. Type, There's no get, one, but this one, yeah. So, guys, going forward, make sure you practice this stuff. Um, come out to PowerShell.org in the forums and ask questions if you have questions, and you'll get awesome help out there. And once yeah, again, PowerShell. You mentioned PowerShell. Community.org. The PowerShell. PowerShell.org. PowerShell.org. PowerShell.org is is replaced PowerShell Community.org. So uh-huh. Kirk Monroe, all those guys. So come out to PowerShell.org. And ask your questions, and so you can get some continued help, and you move forward with this. This is, is so very important, and you too can make tools. And you know, once again, I want to say it's, it's been a true honor to be able to do this with you. Right so, back at you, dude. This thank is a blast. you very much. This has been great. Thanks a lot, Jeffrey. <laughs> you guys take care and stay in touch with us. We'll be out there trying to help. So you let us know. <laughs>